the classical world is dead. The great empires of the East, the Mauryans and the Han, are no more. Rome has fallen. Egypt and the old Persian Empire left in the ancient dust of the past. But, like the dawn through the night, new civilizations would emerge. From the Aztec to Great Zimbabwe, from the Islamic Golden Age to the Mongol invasions. From the samurai warriors of Japan, to the knights and monarchs of Europe. Welcome to the sequel of our ancient world mega documentary. Welcome to the medieval world. We will start our journey in the Americas. Though much of its rich history has been lost, the Americas have provided complex cultures and a wide variety of civilizations rivaling those of the so-called Old World. The most well-known of these societies developed in Mesoamerica and in the Andean region of South America, but we will take a look at other cultures as well, which thrive nonetheless. Quite impressively, everything these early Americans accomplished was without access to many of the tools available to the Old World, like the wheel and horses, which once existed in the Americas, but died out. Chronology of the Americas is generally divided into five time periods. They are the Paleo-Indian, the Archaic Stage, the Formative Stage, the Classic Period, and the Post-Classic Period. This is a very general chronology, and years differ greatly between different regions, but we will go over each once we get to them. The first era was that of the Paleo-Indians, or Paleo-Americans, which began as the first humans entered the Americas. When Columbus first landed in the Caribbean, and made contact with the indigenous population, many Europeans assumed they had arrived by the same means, from across the Atlantic. Others assumed they were descendants of expert seafarers, like the Phoenicians, or even the lost tribes of Israel. They had no inkling that these natives had been living in the Americas, for not just a few hundred years, but thousands. It wasn't until the 19th century, that newer migration theories developed, some suggesting that small groups of humans crossed over to the Americas from Asia via the Bering Strait, which was a land bridge at the time. Genetic data seems to confirm similarities between natives of the Americas and those of Northern Asia. We still can't pinpoint exactly when the migrations occurred, but they could have taken place as far back as 15 to 20,000 years ago, and evidence seems to keep pushing the date back further. Migrations would continue in waves until the end of the Ice Age, when the waters melted and submerged the land bridge, isolating these Paleo-Americans in a new land. There are many alternate theories about the settling of the Americas, such as early settlers arriving from the South Pacific, or across the Atlantic from Africa. Some even claim they could have been from the fabled Atlantis. Regardless of the precise time, it's clear the Paleo-Americans were living in the Americas at least 12,000 years ago. They spread from the icy north and expanded to the south, eventually reaching the tip of South America. The first Americans were hunter-gatherers, much like their counterparts in the Old World. They took advantage of the large megafauna which inhabited the continent, before their extinction due to climate change and overhunting. Like other Stone Age societies, they lived in small nomadic communities. The shift to agriculture occurred a bit later than in the Old World, during a transition known as the Archaic Period. Maize, or corn, was the main crop, and could have been farmed as early as 9,000 years ago in Mexico, 
making it the first place in the world to domesticate the food. Originally, maize could have been a grass called Tiacinti, that was modified over time by the early agriculturalists. It was thanks to corn, that the first civilization emerged in North America. By 2000 BCE, the pre-classic stage began in Mesoamerica, and by 1600, the emergence of the Olmec civilization. After the Archaic period, chronology starts to differ between the different regions. From around 2000 BCE, Mesoamerican chronology can be split into three parts. The formative, or pre-classic, the classic age, and the post-classic. The pre-classic introduced the development of large villages, reliance on agriculture, and large ceremonial architecture. The period was mainly characterized by the Olmec. The Olmec practiced agriculture in the swampy Mexican lowlands and mud-filled river banks. They are most widely known for their stone carvings and monuments at San Lorenzo and later, La Venta. There, they built their largest earthwork, a 30-foot-tall pyramid, and practiced religious rituals. The Olmec also produced a writing system known as Olmec Hieroglyphics, or Olmec Glyphs, a writing system which has still been undeciphered. It's possible it is a proto-writing system related to the later Mayan system. Olmec society was structured into different classes. The middle class of artisans were responsible for creating the famous Olmec colossal heads, made from basalt boulders. The largest of these was over 11 feet high, or around 3.5 meters. Their appearance has led to a lot of conspiracy theories, which is quite common with these older American cultures. Along with bloodletting, one of their rituals was the Mesoamerican ball game, a ceremonial game played on a ball court with a ball made from solid rubber, weighing up to 9 pounds. The rubber was made from the sap of the rubber tree, giving the civilization the name Olmec, or rubber people. Rubber made the Olmec quite prosperous, as it was traded all over the neighboring regions. Eventually, the Olmec mixed the rubber sap with other ingredients, creating new consistencies that could be used to make other materials, like shoes. Lasting around a millennia, the Olmec would decline and eventually collapse around 400 BCE. At its height, it could have covered most of Mesoamerica, influencing many later cultures. We see these aspects of Olmec tradition in later civilizations of the Classic period, a time of cultural achievement and of prominent Mesoamerican states reaching their height. The Zapotec, or the Cloud People, were centered at Monte Alban in central Mexico, in the highlands near present-day Oaxaca. Though they emerged around 5 or 600 BCE, in the formative period, they reached their height during the early Classic. The Zapotec built their temples and pyramids at Monte Alban, high up on the mountain overlooking the valley. Being so high up, much of the population lived in cliff sides cut into the mountains. It was a theocracy, ruled by a priest class, but the majority of people were farmers or artisans. Though flourishing during the start of the Classic period, they would begin to decline, and Monte Alban was mysteriously abandoned by the end of the period, around 900. Smaller Sarpatec societies continued to live throughout the centuries, and still exist today. Another major city of the Classic period, was Teotihuacan. Situated near present-day Mexico City, it was probably established around 100 BCE, but reached its height around 250 to 500. It is considered the first metropolis in the Americas, reaching a population of over 125 to 200,000, making it the sixth largest urban center in the world at the time. In the heart of the city, temples and palaces adorned the main road, called the Avenue of the Dead, which led to the Pyramid of the Sun a name given to it later. It was the highest pyramid in the Americas, and the third largest in the world. Across from this massive structure, was the Pyramid of the Moon. There is evidence of human sacrifices made in dedication of the pyramids. It is thought the priests used pulque, a type of liquor made from agave extract, during the religious ceremonies. Nearby, were marketplaces where farmers would exchange their goods, like feathers, rubber, and different food products. Obsidian, a type of volcanic glass, was also a prime commodity, 
and the location of the city itself could be attributed to a nearby obsidian mine, used to make special items like religious blades and mirrors, which they exported all over Mesoamerica. From their city planning, evidence seems to show distinct classes. The elite classes lived in dwellings near the central district, near the Avenue of the Dead. Buildings would be decorated with murals depicting religious themes. The laborers and craftsmen lived in apartment complexes in the city, known as neighborhood compounds. They were all built on a rectangular grid, separated by roads. Most of their economy was run by their agriculture. Situated in the fertile valley of Mexico, terrain was swampy and wet, collecting melted ice from the nearby mountains. Because of the fertile ground and ample water source, this valley became one of the best farming regions in Mesoamerica. Teotihuacan eventually went into decline in the 500s. It's possible the volcanic winter of 536 set into motion the end of this metropolis. The city was sacked and burned in the late 500s, possibly by its native population who fled carrying much of the wealth. By 700, the sacred city was abandoned. East of the Valley of Mexico, the most well-known and longest-lasting of the classic civilizations emerged. Residing in Guatemala and the Yucatan, the Mayan civilization existed in some form through most periods of Mesoamerican chronology. During the formative, or pre-classic period, the Maya were farming maize, yams, and manioc in the lowlands and Yucatan Peninsula, slowly growing their population. Early on, they established contact with the flourishing Olmec civilization to their west. Cacao trees, which the Mayans called cacao, were plentiful. They made drinks with the chocolate, and used the beans as a kind of currency. Mayans could also produce a type of beer from this fruit's pulp. The taste of their chocolate was much more bitter, and wouldn't develop into a sweet treat until the Europeans later added milk and sugar. The Mayans expanded as their population grew, and small city-states began to form. By 250, the Classic period began, and the Mayan civilization reached their apex. One of their largest urban centers was Tikal, which could have had up to 100,000 residents. Their society developed into a sophisticated civilization during this period, with a complex political system. At the top of the Mayan hierarchy was the king, called the Ahau. The 13th Ahau of Kapan, which scholars call 18 Rabbit, had a majestic palace built, which used the labor of tens of thousands. Around the rulers, were the other nobles and aristocrats. Many of these could be priests or scribes, but many were painters who worked at the king's court. As society grew outside the palace, a growing number of artisans would emerge, forming a middle class. Most of the Mayan population were farmers. Their houses were generally built of thatch, and labor on the farm was also divided along gender lines. Noble women of course had more freedom than poorer women, and played roles in religious and political life. In the city of Palenque, one of the most powerful Mayan cities, Pakul became king through the lineage of his mother and grandmother. His mother was ruler of the city for years, and ruled alongside her son for 25 of these. King Pakul deified his mother as a goddess, to legitimize his rule, which lasted 68 years, giving him the fifth longest reign of any monarch in world history. The Mayans, like the rest of the Mesoamerican civilizations, were polytheistic. Itzamna was the primary Mayan deity, ruler of heaven, day, and night. They worshipped him as the creator of the universe, and for gifting them the knowledge of maize, medicines, and writing. Other gods were thought to be aspects of this primary deity. The Maya saw the jaguar as strong and powerful, so many of their gods were portrayed as these animals. The jaguar god of terrestrial fire, or jaguar night sun, was a deity connected to war or the underworld. Human sacrifice was performed, mainly on high-status prisoners of war. Decapitation of an enemy ruler was thought to be one of the greatest gifts to the gods. Another was extraction of the heart, which often ended in the lifeless corpse being thrown down the steps of the pyramid. The pyramid was often located near the center of the city and became the religious core. Nearby was the sacred ball court. 
The stone court was rectangular, and with rings set up on nearby walls or inclines. Players had to get a heavy rubber ball through these rings, only using their hips, shoulders, or thighs. This was more than just a game. It was a ritual that needed to be completed in order to maintain the favor of the gods. Its possible sacrifices were then made at the end of the game, sometimes by decapitation or disembowelment. These games originated from the myth of the Maya hero twins, who angered the Maya death gods with their noise, and were then tricked into descending into Shibalba, the underworld. There, they were challenged to the ball game, but lost. One of the hero twins' heads was then chopped off, giving birth to the tradition. While the Olmecs, Zapotecs, and others developed writing systems, none were as sophisticated as the Mayans. The script began during the pre-classic, but would become a sophisticated system of logograms, which represented full words, and phonetic glyphs which represented syllables. Many of the symbols represented dates in their calendar. The Mayan city-states used a class of scribes to write down their records, on either deerskin or tree bark. Because of this, these written records didn't survive the warm climate and ensuing European invasion. Spanish priests were notorious for recklessly burning the records they encountered. As a result, much of Mayan history has been lost to us. All that remains is what was carved in stone. The city of Palenque, set deep in the jungles of Mexico, provided archaeologists with a vast wealth of Mayan carvings. The Temple of Inscriptions was the funerary monument for a Hauper call, which he had built in the mid-600s. In a chamber below rested his tomb, which had a large limestone slab covered in Mayan writing. Deciphering this message helped scholars identify Pakal, their first Mayan historical figure. The inscriptions led to many conspiracy theories, which interpreted many of the symbols as spacecraft, or as having extraterrestrial influence. Curiously enough, the Mayans did have an extreme interest in astronomy. They kept records of the movements of the planets, mainly to help them prepare for certain rituals and traditions. When Venus emerged in a certain position, it was time for customary war. Their long count calendar was used for longer time scales, so it was used more on monuments. The Mayan cycle was set to end in 2012, leading to a popular belief that the world would come to an end in that year. But in reality, the calendar just went to the next Bacton, the 14th. The 15th Bacton will be on March 26, 2407. Just like in Europe, these Mayan city-states were often at war with one another. They had entire rituals set up specifically for wartime and needed prisoners in order to sacrifice to the gods. There is evidence that a general, who we call Fire is Born, marched on the Mayan city of Tikal in 378, with his army of feathered serpent warriors. He was most likely working in the service of Spearthrower Owl, the possible ruler of Teotihuacan at the time. Fire is Born took the city with some help from the natives, and the son of the Teotihuacan ruler, first crocodile, was made king. Tikal would continue to grow to become the foremost Mayan superpower. During the 600s, Tikal and Kalakmul, another major city-state, were in constant conflict. By the end, Tikal garnered more support, winning a decisive battle in 695. The last major series of wars ended in 744, with Tikal subduing Kalak Mul's allies and defeating its rival by the end of the Classic Period. The Classic Period itself ended around 900, with the last century, called the Terminal Classic. This is because of the steep decline of the Mayan cities during this time. In Kapan, work on stone sculptures was halted. Palenque and Tikal soon followed in the mid-800s. We still don't know what caused this decline, if it was constant internal wars, a massive drought caused by climate change, or disease. It's possible it was a mix of factors, but many believe there wasn't a genuine collapse, because though most of the central cities were abandoned, residents fled north to the jungles, continuing an adapted Mayan tradition. They developed newer urban centers, like Chichen Itza and Uxmal. During the post-classic period, from 900 to the early 1500s, the major civilizations of the classic period lost hegemony, 
replaced by the rise of new warlike empires during this last period before colonization. The early post-classic saw the first of the new, more militaristic societies enter Mesoamerica. From the deserts of the north, new peoples would establish themselves in central Mexico, and by the 900s, settle in Tula, filling the power vacuum left by the fall of nearby Teotihuacan. We have no contemporary sources for these people, later called the Toltec, only records from their successors. The Toltec controlled Tula for centuries, forming an empire from the surrounding smaller states. Either a sustained drought, revolts, or internal conflicts sent the Toltecs into a steep decline, and by 1122, Tula was abandoned. Another power vacuum would form in Mexico, but it wasn't long until newer societies moved into the valley. These were the Mexica, and after the pre-classic Olmecs and classic Mayans, these Mexica would become the most prominent Mesoamerican civilization of the post-classic. According to tradition, the Mexica originated on an island called Aztlán, a far-off land to the north. From that name, historians would call this civilization, Aztec. During the 1100s, the radical Aztecs migrated from Aztlán, reaching the Valley of Mexico later in the century. The Aztecs' main culture came from their radical religious views, their primary deity being Huitzilopochtli, god of war. Forging alliances with nearby city-states, the Aztec would become the dominant culture in Mesoamerica by the 1400s. They established their capital at Tenochtitlan, a grand city on an island in Lake Texcoco. This location was chosen, as it fulfilled a prophecy, when they witnessed a grand eagle eating a snake above the lake. From there, they set out to form an empire, and by 1428, they were part of the Triple Alliance, with two close allies. It was quite clear early on, that Tenochtitlan was the main military power in the Union, so most refer to the alliance as the Aztec Empire. The head of Aztec society was an absolute monarch. He claimed descent from the gods, and was to be the intermediary between the heavens and the masses. An interesting facet of the monarchy was that succession wasn't directly passed down to the next of kin. Everyone in the royal family was eligible for the position, and they were chosen by a small group of family officials. After the king was crowned, he was given a council of advisors, headed by a prime minister. Though the Aztecs had control of the region, most city-states were given autonomy, and only needed to pay tribute. This was usually done in the form of crops, materials, or slaves. These were collected by a tax collector. Those who did not pay, were met with the threat of violence. Positions in the government were saved for the nobility, or those who could trace their lineage to the founding Aztec clan. In youth, males of the noble classes were sent to schools at the temples, and were made to do manual labor, and military training, along with religious teachings. Most of the population were commoners, with a large contingent of indentured workers and slaves, landless laborers who worked on the nobles' estates. Slavery wasn't always a permanent label, and remained a fluid status. Regular commoners could become slaves in order to pay off debts, then later regain their freedom. The main organizational unit in Aztec society, was the Ultepetl, or city-state, like Tenochtitlan. City-states were in turn made up of clans with similar work patterns, called Kalpuli, meaning large house. Tenochtitlan could have been made up of around 20 of these. Kalpuli were in turn made up of families and other relatives. The Aztec relied on agriculture and expanded one of their older techniques to better cultivate the wetlands. This technique was called the Chinampa system. They would grow crops on small islands on the wetlands, which both optimized moisture retention and facilitated crop transport. Up to six crops could be cultivated per year from a single chinampa, and it was so efficient that the system is still in use today. Farmers continued cultivating crops in chinampas, and drifting their goods up the canals to sell them in the cities. In these cities, Kalpulis resided in different districts, providing a different type of service. Some were stonecutters, some metalworkers. Kalpulis were made up of smaller family groupings. 
In the city, single families would live in small one or two room homes, with direct access to the busy streets. In more rural areas, farmers lived near their chinampas, and took precautions to prevent flooding. Women had more rights than other classic or post-classic societies, and were able to own and inherit property. Though marriage among the lower classes was monogamous, nobles often engaged in polygyny, the practice of having more than one wife. The Aztec pantheon contained over a hundred gods, many derived from their Mesoamerican counterparts. Ometeotl was the name given to their pair of creator gods. They were all powerful and omniscient, and like in other societies, too far removed from everyday affairs. So other gods, like Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent, became more commonly worshipped. They believed their gods came from the old city of Teotihuacan, and viewed the Toltec as their legendary warrior ancestors, including the feathered serpent. Aztec Emperor Montezuma made several pilgrimages to Teotihuacan to honor this deity before his eventual return. Aztec religion, as much of Mesoamerican religions, was quite fatalistic. Unlike the religions of the Old World, the Aztecs believed the world, or sun, had already ended and been reborn four times in a struggle between good and evil. Though they lived during the fifth sun, this too was destined to be destroyed, and all they could do was delay it. To do this, they engaged in the practice of human sacrifice. They believed that this appeased the sun god, Huitzilopochtli, and granted them extra time. Those sacrificed were brought to the pyramid or shrine, and their hearts were removed, and given as holy offering to the gods. Most of the victims were captives, but slaves and citizens would also be used as sacrifices. Often, they were willing participants, as being offered to the great sun god was seen as one of the greatest honors. It is estimated that over 80,000 were sacrificed at the great temple. Built in the middle of Tenochtitlan, this temple was a grand pyramid, dedicated to the sun god Huitzilopochtli, and the rain god, Tlaloc. The pyramid was covered with bright paintings, sculptures, and other art. Its base was huge, and at the top were shrines dedicated to the sun and rain gods. We don't have many Aztec paintings, but Spanish conquistadors claimed the art was superb, comparing it to Europe's greatest artists. They also made stone and metal works with gold and silver. There isn't any evidence of bronze or iron though, as they relied on obsidian. Stoneworks were mainly representations of the gods, and depicted other religious events. The Stone of the Fifth Sun, or Aztec Sunstone, is their most famous sculpture, weighing over 24,000 kilograms, and was used at the main temple. The Aztec writing system was derived from the earlier Sarpatec system, and originally just used hieroglyphs to represent objects or ideas, but evolved to also include phonetic elements. They were usually written on the bark of fig trees, meaning most of these didn't survive the Spanish invasion, and the massive destruction of Aztec religion and culture that followed. South America would have distinct civilizations of its own. The continent itself is massive, containing both warm and cold climates, wetlands and deserts, mountains and deep lowlands. The Amazon River has the longest water discharge in the world, and is arguably the longest river system, along with the Nile. It runs through the tropical forests, dense with vegetation and wildlife. To the south of that, are plains and prairies which reach west, and touch the Andes Mountains. This mountain range stretches down the western side of South America, from the Isthmus of Panama, to the Strait of Magellan. The area immediately to the west of the mountains, just before the shore, is in a rain shadow, remaining one of the driest regions in the world. Like Mesoamerica, South America has a chronology of its own. The archaic period here was called the pre-ceramic, ending around 1800 BCE, followed by the ceramic period. Ceramic cultures are further subdivided into three time periods called the early, middle, and late horizon, with a few intermediate phases. There's evidence of agriculture in the Amazon basin, from around 6500 BCE, and in central Chile and northern Peru a bit later. 
By the 3000s BCE, settlements were built along the coast of Peru and Ecuador, and mainly relied on fishing. They were called the Norte Chico, or Corral. They developed around the same time as Old Kingdom Egypt. This area of modern-day Peru has often been overlooked, as it is extremely dry and arid, not suitable for any kind of ancient cities. Located between what we call rain shadows, mountains on one side, and the trade winds of the Pacific on the other, rain was a seldom occurrence, so the Norte Chico had to rely on extensive irrigation, and the main rivers of Fortaleza, Patavilca, and Supe, to provide melted mountain snow, as their water supply. Scholars had been in debate, over whether this was a true civilization, but the consensus is that they are the oldest civilization in all the Americas. Beginning as a maritime society, hunting fish and seafood, they truly flourished once adopting agriculture. Their population boomed, and they had one of the most densely populated regions of the world by the second millennium BCE. Their main urban site was at Corral. Unfortunately, the Norte Chico was so ancient, that there is no remaining art, of these mysterious peoples. They were a pre-ceramic society, so no long-lasting pottery, or visual art of any kind remains. All we have are their large mound structures, or earthworks. Emerging around 3700 BCE, the Norte Chico would eventually decline, by around 1800 BCE. It appears as if people dispersed, in order to find more fertile lands, bringing their knowledge of irrigation with them. This initial period lasted for around 900 years before the emergence of the next great Andean culture in around 900 BCE, the Chavin, marking the start of the Early Horizon. The Early Horizon was characterized by the end of the regional isolation and quick spread of the Chavin culture. The Chavin are named after Chavin de Wantar, an archaeological site located over 10,000 feet or 3,000 meters above sea level, centered upon a large stone temple where ceremonies would take place. The temple had an underground network of tunnels and canals, and the corridors were filled with art. Intense rituals were most likely performed in this underground system. Outside the temple complex were stone statues of their gods, along with pyramids. Metalworks of copper and gold were also found, and around 300 BCE, they built a solar observatory just north of Lima. By around 200 BCE, the Chavin dissolved leading into the first intermediate period, known as the Early Intermediate. The culture transitioned into the Nazca in the south, and the Moche, a few centuries later, in the north. The Nazca were known for their Nazca lines, immense designs depressed into the desert soil. Their purpose is still a mystery, which has sparked numerous conspiracy theories. Another labor-intensive project was their construction of Pukios, a series of underground aqueducts, used to transport water for long distances, without fear of any evaporation. The Moche resided to the north, near their main river of the same name, which flowed from the Andes to the Pacific. In their capital city, which could have held upwards of 10,000 residents, were two large pyramids, almost 100 feet tall. The larger one, was called the Temple of the Sun. The Temple of the Moon, built into the side of a mountain, was decorated with murals and paintings depicting gods, battles, and sacrifices. The Moche ceramic figures are quite intricate, and influenced artisans in neighboring river valley villages and cities, meaning Moche influence could have extended down the coast, well beyond their own society. Many artifacts also seem to indicate the Moche were a warrior culture. It can be seen in their pottery, figurines, and paintings, which depict soldiers and ritual sacrifice. Their river valley, though fertile, was extremely dry away from the Moche River, so they had to build complex irrigation systems to get water from the river to the dried lands further out. This is how they thrived for centuries, but evidence indicates that by the early 700s, their irrigation systems were abandoned, and most of the society moved further inland. The early intermediate period ended with the decline of the Nazca and Moche, and the Middle Horizon period began in 600. 
The two main states during this period were the Wari in the north in Peru, and the Tiwanaku, a bit further south in present-day western Bolivia. A couple of centuries before the Moche disappeared, the Wari began to expand from their homeland in the mountain foothills, and established small communities along the coast. When the Moche did eventually dissolve, the Wari had spread northwards, where the Moche had once been, possibly adopting their temples and religion. They would engage in a cold war with the Tiwanaku to the south. Eventually, both would decline by year 1000, because of environmental conditions, leading to the late intermediate period. This is when a new successor state, the Kingdom of Chimor, would emerge, with a capital at Chan Chan, housing 40 to 60,000. It was a large city, with numerous palaces, and surrounded by walls up to 30 feet high. One of the palaces had a maze-like structure built that led to an elaborate central chamber. Like the Moche, the Chimu people relied on irrigation and used an extensive network of canals, going through hills and valleys in order to water the drier areas. By 1470, the Chimu also collapsed, due to floods and earthquakes, which destroyed their irrigation networks, and they were then attacked and destroyed by a new empire. This new empire would become the most famous Andean state, and is the main polity from the final time period, the Late Horizon. From the early 1200s, the Inca had emerged in the Peruvian highlands to the south, establishing the mountainous kingdom of Cusco, at an altitude of 10,000 feet. Their leaders were called Sapa Inca. By 1438, under their king Pachacuti, the Inca began to expand, and forged an empire by conquest. He called the empire Tawantinsuyu, or realm of the four parts, signifying a union of four different regions. Under his successors, Tupac Inca, Topper Inca, and Uwena Inca, they expanded into Ecuador, central Chile, and the edge of the Amazon basin, forming the largest pre-Columbian empire in all the Americas. The empire was quite centralized under Pachacuti. He divided it into different regions and provinces, the capital was run from Cusco, which was divided into four residential areas, that were all rigidly administered. Pachacuti used the empire's citizens, often using entire communities at a time, as forced labor, which helped with the initial success of expansion. Workers were forcibly moved to different regions to work in mines, help expand, or help with construction. The capital went from a city of mud and thatched wood, to a stunning metropolis of majestic stone. Coricancha, located in the city, was the most important temple in the entire Inca Empire. It was dedicated to the sun god Inti, and was covered in plates of gold. Machu Picchu, located just northwest of Cusco, was a massive citadel, thought to be built for Pachacuti. It is often referred to as the lost city of the Incas and is the most familiar piece of Inca art. Their most ambitious and useful achievement, was a network of roads extending at least 25,000 miles from present-day Colombia in the north, to Chile in the south. It was the most extensive and advanced road system in pre-Columbian America. It was based around two main north-south roads. One was near the coast, but the other went up, through the Andes Mountains, with various branches and paths between them. There were rest stops along the routes, and were used to transport goods and soldiers, and were only used by the empire's officials or workers. Runners like Chasky could use this system to relay information up to 140 miles away in one day. Farming was the main mode of food production. To farm on the mountains, the Inca used irrigation systems on andenas, stair-like terraces dug into the sides of the hills. Here, the state used collective labor to produce mainly crops of maize and potatoes. The state also had a say in personal relationships. Marriage was regulated, and a man was required to choose a wife from his immediate kinship group. Women could choose not to marry though, but would have to be chosen as a priestess, taking a vow of chastity. The Inca managed to take control of the Andean region because of their warlike temperament much like how the Aztecs succeeded in Mesoamerica. Because of a policy of male conscription, the Inca army was around 200,000 strong, larger than any other. 
Armies could move across the empire quickly by the efficient road system, which also offered rest stops along the way. Supplies would be carried by Lama, as they didn't have the wheel. Once the Inca conquered a region, they taught them Quechua, their language, and their religion to assimilate them. Though the Inca had no writing system, they did use the quipu, a system of numerical record-keeping that used knotted strings. Though few details remain, the Inca also had a deep culture of entertainment, centered on theater. Olente is a play considered to have been preserved orally in Quechua tradition, and then written down in colonial times. Apart from plays, the Inca also created oral poetry, accompanied by reed instruments. Around the same time as the Inca Empire formed, so did a loose confederation, which came to be known as the most well-organized alliance in South America. The Muisca emerged much earlier, in the late intermediate, but truly flourished in the late horizon after forming the Muisca Confederation. They were situated in Colombia, and would be the most populous and significant society between the Mayan regions of Mesoamerica and the Inca Empire. They excelled in gold works, and the Spanish believed the legendary El Dorado was within this territory. Apart from the large civilizations and empires of the Andean region in Colombia and Peru, there were other smaller cultures living in South America as well. In the Amazon basin, in the rainforests of Amazonia, were many chiefdoms. Locals would call one of these the Cambaba, a reference to their custom of flattening their children's heads, by binding a piece of wood to the forehead. Rounded heads were seen as a sign of being a savage. To the north, was a region called Northern America. The Archaic period lasted here 1,000 years longer than in Mesoamerica, until 1000 BCE, as societies all across the land relied on hunting and gathering. Unlike Mesoamerica, the period after the Archaic isn't divided into pre-classic, classic, and post-classic phases, but is simply known as the post-Archaic. In the East, this began with the Woodland period a transitory stage between the archaic hunter-gatherers and the intensive agriculturalists that will follow. The early woodland period saw the continuation of many archaic traditions, like mound-building and pottery, but this is when it became widespread. It was around this time that the people of the eastern woodlands developed more complex societies. They became sedentary, population would increase steadily, and villages would grow larger. By the middle of the woodland period, the Hopewell tradition was flourishing in the Midwest, and then spread to the Northeast and Southeast. It wasn't a single culture, but a network of existing cultures that traded exotic materials. The Hopewell made large earthworks of elaborate tombs filled with offerings of jewelry and art. By the late woodland period, the Hopewell tradition had dissolved, and culture seems to have declined. Construction of earthworks decreased, as did interregional trade. The woodland cultures seemed to have adopted the bow and arrow during this time, replacing the atlatl and making hunting easier. They also widely adopted the agricultural production of maize, beans, and squash, which were known as the Three Sisters. By the end of the woodland period in 1000, a new culture was forming, based on intensive agriculture, and even larger earthworks. This was the Mississippian culture, and expanded from the Mississippi River Valley. By 1200, the Mississippians reached their height, having spread all over the East and Midwest, building numerous urban centers. The most famous was at Cahokia, in present-day Illinois. With a population of 20,000, it was the largest city in Northern America, and remained that way for 600 years. The burial mound there, called Monk's Mound, was the largest earthwork in all the Americas, and the largest pyramid in North America. Its base was larger than the Great Pyramid of Egypt. Many other smaller mounds were built in the city, which seemed to have centralized political and religious control of much of the culture. For fun, and garnering friendships with neighboring villages, the Mississippians would play a game called Chunky. It was played by rolling disc-shaped stones across the ground and throwing spears at them to land as close to the stone as possible. This game was quite popular, and would even continue after the Mississippian decline. This decline began around 1400, and was marked by increased warfare. 
many populations seemed to have dispersed, and Cahokia, the magnificent Mississippian urban center, was abandoned. It's possible this decline was brought about by the Little Ice Age, a period of lower temperatures, making agriculture less efficient. It wasn't only the Mississippians who declined around this time. Around 750, a community living near the Four Corners, the states of Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona, experienced a population surge and transitioned from their earlier basket maker era. They were known as the ancient Pueblo people, but have been called Anasazi by the Navajo, a derogatory term meaning ancient enemy. Like the Hopewell, the ancient Pueblo became the center of an exchange system in the southwest, creating a system of roads to facilitate trading of ideas and materials. They soon developed their own irrigation systems and built their own urban center at Charco Canyon. This walled city held numerous multi-story houses, called Pueblos, with timber roofs, where multiple families could live. Pueblo Benito, a great house, was built by the Pueblo people over centuries. Great houses were where more elite families would live. Religious ceremonies were held in a kiva, a large, circular underground room. Around 1150, the Pueblo people migrated north to Mesa Verde, in Colorado. This phase came to be known as the Great Pueblo Period, which saw the Pueblo live in intricate cliff dwellings and cave rooms in cliff sides. Each cliff dwelling could hold around 100 people. Mesa Verde appears to have been abandoned though, by 1300, as the Pueblo people moved back south. By 1350, the Great Pueblo Period was over, but their descendants are still thought to survive as the Hopi. The Pueblo decline occurred around the same time as the Mississippian decline in the east. Climate change is the most likely factor. Once the Europeans made contact and introduced the Spanish horse, the Apache and Navajo used these mounted units to dominate this southwestern region. When the Europeans first made contact though, it wasn't even with people from the continent. It was in the Caribbean, with a people called the Taino. The Taino were an Arawak-speaking group, most likely originating near the Orinoco River in Venezuela, before expanding onto the islands. This is where the Taino culture emerged in the 1100s. Over time, benefiting from both the access to agriculture and fishing, population increased, leading to more complex social systems. Leaders of different groups were called caciques, derived from the term, to keep house. They presided over all aspects of the economy and religious affairs. Ball courts were also found, indicating the Taino had contact with the Mesoamerican cultures, most likely the Maya. Eventually, another group from the South American mainland began settling in the Caribbean, displacing the local Taino, and forcing them to head further north. This group was the Carlinago, or Island Caribs. They were more warlike, and reports say they frequently raided the Tainos, capturing their women. It was these two groups, the Taino and Carlinago, who would be the first to meet the seafaring Christopher Columbus, setting into motion the twining of the old world and the new. But that's a story for our next series. During the Classical Age, the time of Rome, the Arabian Peninsula was inhabited by the Bedouins. These were nomadic Arabs who came from the northern regions of the peninsula. Bedouin society was divided into different clans, each headed by a leader, called the Sheikh. He was chosen from a group of elders called the Majlis. Though each clan was unique, they all felt a greater sense of unity. After domesticating the camel, they became wealthy as traders and intermediaries, between the Persian Gulf and Mediterranean. Like most cultures before the rise of monotheistic religions, the early Bedouins were polytheistic, but with one primary god or supreme deity, whom they called Allah. There was no priest class or religious hierarchy in the clans, so everyone in the community partook in the religious practices. They believed lesser spirits lived in the natural world, in trees, mountains, and water. Prior to the rise of Islam, many of these gods were represented as stone figures, and placed at the Kaaba, in Mecca. After the fall of Rome in the west, 
the two major players in the Middle East were the Eastern Roman Empire and Sassanid Persia. Their constant wars created chaos in the Middle East, causing old trade routes to become more dangerous. Because of this, trade routes would start to pass deeper through Arabia, from the Mediterranean to Mecca, then the coast of Yemen, and east to the Indian Ocean. Those Bedouins who lived in these parts of Arabia became quite rich, creating a wealthy urban merchant class, but this also tainted the fairly egalitarian society they once had. It was around this time, in the late 500s, that a man named Mohammed became more prominent. Though he would be one of the most significant figures in world history, there isn't much known about the future prophet, and our only sources are the Quran and the Hadith, testimonials about his life that were written later. Because of this, the story of the first years of the rise of Islam aren't set into stone. It is thought Mohammed was born in Mecca, to one of the merchant families who benefited from the increased trade, but became an orphan at six. Once older, he became a caravan manager, and married his rich employer, Khadija. He was part of the Hashemite clan of the Quraysh tribe, which had historically controlled Mecca. Though he lived as a merchant for years, he became disheartened with the growing gap between the generosity and moral values of the desert Bedouins, and the increasingly greedy nature of those wealthy city merchants. He would begin to leave the city and meditate alone, away from the public. This is where tradition states he met the angel Gabriel, who told him to spread the word of the coming revelation. Mohammed had been familiar with both Jewish and Christian doctrine, so believed that Allah had already imparted his message through Moses and Jesus. But now, it was his turn to receive the final revelations. These revelations were told to scribes who wrote them down in the recitation, or Quran. These would become the holy scriptures of Islam, a word implying submission to the will of their God. Over time, he would garner more followers, who would be called Muslims, and followed the guidelines written in the Quran. After Mohammed returned to Mecca, he began preaching to the citizens there. At first, many considered him insane, as he attacked their long-held beliefs, and many felt threatened, as he placed a light on the corruption among the merchant classes. After years of preaching, he only gathered a handful of followers. Like many countercultural religions throughout history, he and his followers were met with persecution, and seeing that his message would not be received in Mecca, Mohammed fled the city, in what is known as the Hejira, and went to the nearby city of Yathrib, later to be known as Medina, which means the city of the Prophet. His flight from Mecca would mark the start of the Islamic calendar. Once in Medina, Mohammed failed to convert the Jewish population, but did have some success with the Bedouins living on the outskirts of town. Around 622, Muhammad joined together different tribes from different faiths, to create Islam's first Ummah, or community. Around 630, Muhammad had gathered enough followers to return to Mecca. The city was captured, and the inhabitants converted. He later visited the Kaaba, and declared it a sacred shrine to Islam. In Islam, it is considered the house of God, and is the direction of prayer for all Muslims around the world. All the idols and symbolism of the older polytheistic faith were destroyed. Islam was monotheistic, like Judaism and Christianity, and the supreme deity was called Allah, the omnipotent creator God. Also like other religions, emphasis is on the afterlife, but it is one's actions in this world that dictate whether you'll achieve salvation or not. The founder of Islam was not claimed to be divine, like Jesus in Christianity, but a prophet, like Abraham or Moses. Muhammad was to be the most important because he was thought to have brought the final uncorrupted revelation from Allah, written in the holy book, the Quran. The Quran sits at the core of Islam and consists of 114 surahs, or chapters, compiled after the death of Muhammad. It served as a holy book political theory, and a code of laws. Over time, Islam developed a code of ethics, called the Five Pillars of Islam. The Five Pillars are, belief in Allah, and Muhammad as his prophet, prayer five times per day with public prayer on Friday, observance of Ramadan, along with fasting from dawn to sunset, making a pilgrimage to Mecca at least once in a lifetime, and giving zakat, or alms for the poor. 
Those who follow these tenets are guaranteed a place in paradise, which is traditionally envisioned as a beautiful garden, an antithesis to the harsh Arabian deserts all around them. After Mohammed's death, a group of scholars wrote up the law code, known as Sharia, which was a set of rules for daily life. Much of the Sharia was taken from the Hadith, the collection of Mohammed's sayings used to complement his revelations. Like most holy books, there is still a lot of ambiguity around the origins of the Quran and what sources were used, so there remain numerous interpretations of the texts. After Mohammed's death, his followers were without a prophet to lead them, and it's unclear if he named a successor. In 632, most in the community chose Abu Bakr, Mohammed's father-in-law and a rich merchant from Medina as his successor, or caliph. This was the start of the Rashidun Caliphate, which would become the leading power in all West Asia in just a few decades. He was to be the leader of the Islamic community, and also considered an imam, or religious leader. Abu Bakr adopted Mohammed's tactics of quick raids to expand the caliphate's influence. After unifying the Arabs, the Arabian armies were able to focus on foreign civilizations beyond the peninsula. The two most powerful in the region were the Byzantines, or Eastern Roman Empire in the west, and the Sassanid Persian Empire in the east. It took no time at all for the Muslim armies to make progress. From 636 onwards, they defeated the Eastern Roman armies, conquering Roman Syria and Egypt, and beyond into North Africa. Expeditions to the south to conquer Nubia failed. In the east, the Rashidun Caliphate brought the collapse of the entire Sasanian Empire by 650. This rapid expansion, and on such a scale, seemed impossible for desert nomads to accomplish. As always, the story seems to lie more with environment and circumstances, than divine will. We know both the Byzantine Empire and Sassanid Persians had been weakening each other militarily for over a hundred years, and the Persians were embroiled in civil war. Both were also hit by the first recorded plague pandemic in history in the mid-500s. It's also quite possible the richest of the Arab merchants pushed for expansion, not to spread Islam, but to open up trade options and production of their own goods. Still, the Bedouin armies were quite powerful in their own right. Highly mobile units, the Arab cavalry was able to outmaneuver the heavily armored Byzantine and Sassanid horsemen. Add to this, the belief that any Islamic soldier who dies in battle ends up in paradise, and you have an army not just willing, but eager, to fight to the death. Once the Arab armies took control of a region, they put in place a non-military administration, which was usually Arab, but sometimes left to the locals. Conversions, contrary to historical portrayals, were mostly voluntary, but promoted. Those who didn't convert, still had to obey the Islamic laws, and were forced to pay a tax to be exempt from military service. For the locals, daily life wasn't very different than under the Byzantines or Sassanids, and for some, Arab rule was preferable. With much of the Middle East in its hands, the Caliphate's first true challenge came not from without, but from within. Many of Muhammad's followers had disapproved of Abu Bakr being named Caliph, and instead wanted Muhammad's cousin and son-in-law Ali, to be successor. This was largely ignored, and even when Abu Bakr died in 634, title of Caliph passed to Umar, who ruled until 644 when he was assassinated. The Rashidun Caliphate reached its greatest extent under its next caliph, Uthman, who ruled for 12 years but was also assassinated, in 656. Ali was then finally selected as a replacement, and became caliph. Some were convinced Ali was involved in Uthman's assassination, leading to the first fitna, a civil war between Arab factions. This ended when Ali himself was killed in 661. Muawiyah, the governor of Syria, and a rival of Ali, took power, founding a new caliphate. This caliphate was named after the Umayyads, a branch of the Qurayshi clan. They established their capital in Damascus, and continued their expansion campaigns. These expansion campaigns occurred both in the west and the east. The Arab armies continued across North Africa, defeating the native Berbers. The Berbers were the natives living in communities across North Africa. 
In 710, Muslim forces consolidated the Berber armies as their allies, and with their aid, crossed the Strait of Gibraltar and invaded Spain. Their leader was a Berber named Tariq ibn Ziyad, giving us the name Rock of Gibraltar, or Jebel Tariq. Spain at this point was ruled by the Visigoths, as the Visigothic Kingdom. They were part of the Germanic societies who helped bring the end of the Roman Empire back in the 400s. By the 700s, the Visigothic Kingdom was plagued by internal conflicts, so easily fell to the Umayyad armies. Between 721 and 725, the Visigothic Kingdom collapsed, and most of the Iberian Peninsula became a Muslim state. But they didn't end their expansion there. With the Visigoths defeated, their next target was France and the Frankish army. The Franks, like the Visigoths, were another one of the Germanic societies that became inheritors of the old Roman Empire. Seven years later, in 732, after some initial success in the invasion of southern France, the Muslim armies were met by Charles Martel at the Battle of Tours. Martel and the heavily armored Frankish infantry negated the Arab horsemen's mobility through defensive tactics, and the Umayyads retreated. Never would the Umayyads reach further than Spain. Though the Sassanids collapsed, the Byzantine Empire still lived, and would continue to have battles with the Arabs in the east for centuries. Many of these battles would take place on the sea, resulting in a series of naval conflicts. Though the Arab navy was quite weak, being a desert culture, they developed quickly and were able to take on the Greek ships. After their first siege of Constantinople in the mid-600s, the Umayyad army tried again in 717, by both land and sea. This could have been the end for not only the Byzantines, but for the Eastern Roman tradition itself. The Arabs weren't prepared for a secret weapon though. It was a petroleum-based compound, perhaps containing sulfur or quicklime, resulting in a fiery napalm hell for the Arab navy. We call it Greek fire, and it helped give the Byzantines the upper hand, destroying the Arab fleet, and ending the Muslim advance of Europe from the east. Back in the Middle East, the Umayyads expanded further to the east, taking over the old Sassanid territories of Mesopotamia and Persia, and expanding into Central Asia. With the wide variety of people in this empire, many non-Arab converts to Islam still felt neglected, and were overlooked for governmental or other important positions. These frustrations led to revolt. In Mesopotamia, Hussein, the second son of the former Caliph Ali, attempted to undermine the new Umayyad Caliphate, and led a revolt in 680 with his so-called partisans of Ali, or in Arabic, Shi'at Ali, who would come to be known as Shi'ites. Hussein and his partisans were defeated, and Hussein was killed. This caused a separation in Islamic society between Shiites, or the partisans of Ali, and the Sunni, often translated as Orthodox, who supported the current caliphate. There was also strife in North Africa, as many Berbers continued to resist Muslim occupation. The Umayyads reportedly became unjust rulers, showing off their wealth and exploiting their own people. The Umayyads were soon faced with another revolt. This one was headed by Abu al Abbas, a descendant of Muhammad's uncle. This revolt succeeded, and the Umayyads were overthrown in 750, after less than 100 years in power. In its place, al Abbas founded the Abbasid Caliphate, the third of the four major Islamic caliphates. The Abbasids radically changed the Muslim world by integrating all Muslims both Arab and non-Arab into everyday society. Non-Arabs were now allowed to hold civil and military office, and intermarriages also became more common. Over time, this caused Islamic culture to become more influenced by those peoples they had conquered. In 762, the Abbasids built their new capital at Baghdad, to the east of the old Umayyad capital at Damascus. The capital was built there as it lay in a strategic location, near maritime trade routes to the Persian Gulf and caravan routes from the Mediterranean to Central Asia. The cultural mixing, along with the more eastern site of the capital, allowed Persian culture to become more prominent in the Islamic world. Like the older Persian empires, it wasn't soldiers who were most valued, but merchants, tradesmen, and government officials. The early Abbasid period, 
ushered in a new age of cultural exchange and prosperity. This golden age began in the late 700s, under Harun al-Rashid, called Harun the Upright, and continued under his son al-Mamun, who founded an astronomical observatory, and set out to translate the classical works of Greece which they now had in their possession. The economy also prospered, as the Arabs had conquered many of the rich eastern provinces that once belonged to Rome, and also controlled the trade routes connecting Europe to Asia. Baghdad, at the crossroads of three continents, became a wealthy city, not only economically, but culturally and technologically. They learned papermaking from the East, which then passed on into Europe, Egypt, and beyond. Under the Abbasids, the caliphs adopted more of a kingly role, rather than spiritual leader. They became more autocratic and adorned themselves in the finest silks and the most precious of jewels. More centralization of power meant more bureaucracy and more administration. The caliph's advisors were called the Diwan, a council headed by a prime minister, known as a vizier. Once Harun died, another civil war broke out, known as the Fourth Fitna, or Great Abbasid Civil War. Harun's sons, Amin and Al-Mamun's rivalry, ended with the destruction of Baghdad. Palaces were burned, and families turned on each other. Al-Amin was killed just a few years into the conflict, with Al-Mamun being named Caliph, but conflict lasted until the 830s. Its possible financial corruption caused this sudden instability. The Abbasids had been handing out high governmental positions to those they preferred, and this eventually undermined their own authority. Harun al-Rashid's wife, Zubaydah, allegedly spent vast sums of wealth while on pilgrimage to Mecca, while al-Rashid's Hashemite clan received large sums of money from the treasury. The sumptuous lives of those in power seemed to go against the core of Islamic teachings, and even the morals of the Arab culture that preceded it. Alcohol was widely consumed in public, and caliphs enjoyed numerous concubines. The Abbasid integration of non-Arabs wasn't only because they wanted harmony, but because they could not find enough qualified Arabs to fill in the positions in this larger empire. Those of Persian and Turkic descent from Central Asia gained more prominent positions, and their influence soon permeated into the government and army. By the 900s, the caliphate was fragmented, with Morocco having become independent under the Idrisid dynasty, and more importantly, Egypt was lost to the Fatimids, a Shiite dynasty, who established their capital at Cairo. Though fragmented, the Islamic world was still strong as a whole. By the start of the new millennium, the Abbasids continued their decline, sharing the Middle East with dynasties in North Africa and Iran. But danger would soon come, this time from Central Asia. The Central and Eastern Asian steppes had been dominated by different Turkic peoples for centuries. In the West, one of the largest groups were the Oghuz Turks. A breakaway dynasty of the Oghuz Turks, the Seljuks, were fearsome mounted archers, known for hit-and-run tactics, and were originally employed as mercenaries by the Abbasids. Once the Abbasids weakened, the Seljuks were able to take control over the eastern provinces of the Caliphate, establishing the Great Seljuk Empire in 1037. By 1055, a Seljuk leader captured the capital of Baghdad and proclaimed himself Sultan, meaning holder of power. The Abbasids were still the main Islamic Sunni Caliphate, but raw power shifted towards the Seljuks. They didn't set up a capital at Baghdad though, and the Golden City went into temporary decline. The Turks weren't Arab, nor Persian, and though many were Muslim, they were still seen as barbarians, and their arrival in the Middle East was an unwelcome one. An unintended consequence though, was that the Seljuks brought back a sense of stability and a pause to the internal tensions between Sunni and Shiite. One of the groups who especially disliked the Seljuk occupation in the East, were the Shiite Persians, who saw the Seljuks as usurpers, and an insult to Islam. One of the most prominent of these, was a man named Hassan Sabah. He was a Persian, but trained in Fatimid Cairo before forming a military group named the Order of Assassins, or Hashashin. From their mountain base near the Caspian Sea, Sabah and his men raided and covertly killed political and religious leaders. The term, assassinate, might have originated from the tactics used by this group. 
the order would stay active until the 1200s. With their newfound foothold in the Middle East, the Seljuk Turks would begin to pressure the Fatimids in Egypt, and the Byzantine Empire. In 1071, the Turks decisively defeated the Byzantine army at the Battle of Manzikert, capturing the emperor. This greatly decreased Eastern Roman influence in Anatolia, opening the door for Turkification. Feeling threatened, the Byzantines turned to Christian Europe for aid. At the end of the 11th century, Byzantine Emperor Alexius I asked the West for help in protecting his empire against the Turks. In 1096, Christian Europe responded by invading the Islamic Middle East in what would be the first of many Crusades. The Europeans captured the lands east of the Mediterranean, from Antioch to the Sinai, including the holy city of Jerusalem. Local rulers were no match for the heavily armored Christian cavalry, and the Seljuk Turks themselves were dealing with more pressing threats to the east of their territory, so the Europeans had initial success. But in 1169, a man named Yusuf ibn Ayyub became vizier of Egypt, but would be more commonly known as Saladin. By 1171, Saladin overthrew the Fatimids and named himself Sultan, founding the Ayyubid Caliphate and going on to consolidate power in Syria as well. This left the Christian states of the Levant caught in the middle, and vulnerable. In 1187, Saladin's forces invaded the Kingdom of Jerusalem, driving out the crux of the invaders, and leaving just a few Christian strongholds remaining. Saladin was known for his tolerance to the Christian communities living in his new domain, allowing civilian populations to live and continue their religious traditions. Back in Europe, England and France put a pause on their bickering to unite and launch the Third Crusade in the late 1100s, to recapture Jerusalem. Though the Crusaders achieved minor victories, they failed in recapturing the Holy City, and the King's Crusade ended in a stalemate regaining some territory in the Levant and allowing safe travel to religious pilgrims. More crusades would continue throughout the Middle Ages, but in the end, these incursions into the Muslim world never really threatened it, and only served to heighten tensions between Islam and Christianity. The real threat came from the east. From the region of the Gobi Desert, nomadic tribes on horseback galloped out of Central Asia in the early 1200s. These were the Mongols, a pastoralist people who would come to affect most of Eurasia. Unified under their leader, Genghis Khan, the Mongols began a lightning fast expansion. By the mid 1200s, it was his grandson, Hulagu, brother to Kublai Khan, who led the charge into the Middle East. He captured Iran from the Khwarazmians, founding the Ilkhanate, and moved to Mesopotamia, sacking Baghdad in 1258 the capital of the Abbasid Caliphate, ending the Islamic Golden Age. The Abbasids lost their political power and territory, but would remain relevant as a religious authority until the 1500s. The Mongols were not Muslims, like the Seljuks were, so they were not as adapted to their new role as conquerors. They were reportedly brutal to the local population, murdering families and their pets, and to the local infrastructure destroying irrigation systems, and wrecking the local economies. The Mongol invasions would have continued, but they were halted by the Mamluk Sultanate, who controlled Egypt and parts of the Levant. The Mamluks were originally a slave class, but eventually rebelled against Saladin's Ayyubids in Egypt. This battle against the Mongols effectively stopped the advance, keeping the Levant and North Africa out of Mongol hands. It is also significant because it is the first recorded battle with the use of hand cannons, employed by the Mamluks to frighten the Mongols. Over time, the Mongols began to govern more traditionally. They adopted Islamic culture and religion, and rebuilt the cities that had been destroyed. By the 1300s, the Mongol Empire was split up and began to lose power. The Islamic cultural center wouldn't move back to Damascus or Baghdad, but to Cairo under the Mamluks. In Anatolia, a group of Seljuks had founded the Sultanate of Rum back in 1077, after taking the territory from the Byzantines following the Battle of Manzikert. This Sultanate was greatly weakened during the Crusades, and then became a vassal to the Mongols. The last vassal Sultan was murdered in 1308, 
and Anatolia was left under the control of many smaller beyliks or Turkish principalities. One of these, the Ottoman dynasty, would soon become quite prominent at the end of the medieval period. Apart from Cairo in the Middle East, the next largest Islamic cultural center was in Europe. After the Umayyads were overthrown in 750, a member of the dynasty, Abd al-Rahman, fled west, and by 756, established himself in southern Spain. Modern historians call the Muslim-controlled region in Iberia, Al-Andalus. Abd al-Rahman ruled as emir, or commander, from his capital at Cordoba. In 929, Cordoba became a caliphate under one of al-Rahman's descendants. With Muslim control over North Africa, southern Spain, and the many islands throughout the Mediterranean, Al-Andalus became rich through trade, receiving valuable eastern commodities like dates, sugar, and cotton. Al-Andalus flourished in Spain during this time, and reached a high point in the cultural city centers of Córdoba, Seville, and Toledo. Figures from all over the Muslim world flocked to Al-Andalus, disseminating their knowledge of philosophy, and of the sciences, like astronomy, mathematics, and medicine. Eventually, the libraries of Al-Andalus became some of the most magnificent of the medieval world. Though the Cordoba Caliphate was prosperous, it did not last very long. By the beginning of the 11th century, in 1009, the palace at Cordoba was destroyed in a civil war. By 1031, the caliphate had fallen, and dissolved into a number of Muslim taifas, small kingdoms, or principalities. The Christian communities to the north had used this opportunity to focus on a counterattack to retake the peninsula, and re-establish a Christian Europe. In 1085, the King of Castile, King Alfonso VI, captured Toledo, a huge blow to the Muslims. The cultural advancements that had made it into the city, then moved through to the rest of Western Europe and beyond. In Seville, the rulers, called on aid from the Almoravids, a Berber dynasty that had established themselves in Morocco in the 1050s. They were led by their king, a man named Yusuf ibn Tashfin. Yusuf and the Muslim coalition fought back King Alfonso and the Christian allies' advance at the Battle of Sagrajas in 1086, a battle so blood-soaked it was later named as Salaka, meaning, slippery ground, in Arabic. Yusuf then stayed in the region, and extended his Almoravid empire into southern Spain. Culture began to decline, and intellectual achievement lessened. With the Christian kingdoms threatening to the north, the main focus was on survival, not art. In the late 1100s, the Almoravids were overtaken by the Almohads, another Berber dynasty, sparking the Christians to begin a new crusade to eject Muslim rule in Spain for good. Over the next centuries, the Christians would slowly move south, capturing Cordoba in 1236, and Seville in 1248. Soon, all that was left was Granada, which became a tribute state, but then surrendered in 1492, ending the Muslim rule in Spain. Life in the Muslim world kept Islam at the forefront, maintaining a tight bond between state and religion. This wasn't to its detriment though. The years of the Abbasid Empire became a time of unparalleled prosperity compared to that of Europe. To the east, China was flourishing as well, under the Tang and Song dynasties, also considered a golden age period. From there, the Abbasids would import silk and porcelain. From the camel caravans of Africa, would come precious gold, ivory, and slaves. From India, spices and cotton. Within the Islamic world, Egypt remained the breadbasket, mainly providing grain. They also developed systems of banking and credit. Originally a desert society, the Arabs quickly learned how to build ships capable of sailing the Indian Ocean. They used both the Greek astrolabe and Chinese compass to help them navigate the waters, and soon became active in the West Mediterranean as well, becoming the most familiar traders and merchants during this golden age. Under the Abbasids, Baghdad was the most magnificent city, before the shift to Cairo. Basra flourished near the Persian Gulf, as did the former capital of Damascus in Syria, and Marrakesh in Morocco. In these urban areas, Christians, Jews, and Muslims lived separately, in either stone or brick houses. 
the wealthier families lived in larger houses with courtyards, sometimes with domestic animals, like goats and sheep in the stables. The wealthy also often had houses with numerous floors and balconies. Outside the urban centers, would be farmland, where much of the population lived and worked. The agricultural industry boomed as new crops were imported, and new water management techniques were employed, like underground canals. Most farmland was owned by small farmers, but over time, the wealthy began snatching up land as well. The state owned small pieces of land, which were tended by slaves. The most rich locations were around the three main rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates in Mesopotamia, and the Nile in Egypt. The main diet for a wealthy Arab was either poultry, fish, goat, or mutton, alongside fruit and spices. The poor had to rely on millet, with meat on rare occasions. In the desert, they ate boiled grain and a dried compound of flour and water called atria. Merchants eventually traded this in Sicily, and this food would eventually be called pasta. Most historians now agree that it was probably traders from Libya who first brought pasta to Italy. Society in the Islamic world was in theory based on egalitarianism, and the middle classes of merchants and artisans garnered higher levels of respect in society than those of Europe or China, and the nobility wasn't based on heritage or bloodlines, making upward mobility possible. But in practice, the upper classes still did exert their power on those below them. The most stark example would be their usage of slaves. Since Islamic doctrine forbid a Muslim to enslave another Muslim, slaves were mostly brought in from Africa, with numbers ranging from 11 to 15 million. Slaves were also brought in from non-Islamic peoples in Asia, and from Eastern Europe, mostly Slavs. Some slaves became a warrior class, like the Mamluks, and gained significant power for centuries. Though slaves were initially used as plantation labor, most were domestic servants, soldiers, guards, or placed in a harem. Those who worked the fields did so in deplorable conditions, leading to slave revolts. The most famous was the Zanj Rebellion, which is estimated to have killed millions. The African slaves were subdued by the Abbasids, but resulted in significant weakening of the caliphate. Apart from slaves, women also had their place in the social hierarchy. Though women were allowed to own and inherit property, and to be respected, they were to be subservient to men. Men held the power in marriage, and could practice polygyny, taking on more than one wife. It is thought that the Islamic custom of a woman covering herself in public, was a pre-Islamic tradition, dating back to Bedouin culture on the Arabian Peninsula. Being at the nexus of trade between the Chinese, Indians, Africans, and Europeans, the Arab world experienced a golden age that lasted almost 500 years, from the reign of the first Abbasid Caliph, Harun al-Rashid in the late 700s, to the Mongol siege of Baghdad, in 1258. They excelled in many spheres, but the most important of them, were linked to the traditions of the classical age, philosophy and the sciences. During the Middle Ages, most of Europe had little knowledge of the works of the old Greek philosophers, like Aristotle or Plato, but the Abbasid Caliphate preserved these works, and translated them into Arabic. They were kept in the House of Wisdom, or the Great Library of Baghdad. Here, Muslim scholars would preserve and translate these texts, and they eventually would be transcribed into Latin, and shared with Europe. Ironically, many of these texts originally were in European hands. The Academy, founded by Plato back in 387 BCE, was targeted by Eastern Roman Emperor Justinian in the 500s, and many scholars fled east, carrying classical texts with them. Some texts might also have come from the declining library of Alexandria in Egypt. The diffusion of knowledge was made quite easier by one simple but crucial invention that came over from the East. It was either traveling Buddhists or prisoners who brought paper and papermaking techniques to the Muslim world. Alongside it, came block printing, a more recent invention in China. Paper and block printing was much more economical than writing on papyrus, and soon the first paper mills were built by the Abbasids in Baghdad. The texts themselves provided the Arabs with a wealth of knowledge, leading to a more syncretic culture based on religion and the natural world. 
Ibn Sina, known in the West as Avi Sena, was a Muslim physician, astronomer, and philosopher, who was influenced by Aristotle's theories on empirical research and human reason. The focus on more of the natural world, as opposed to Allah, caused some tensions with the religious authority, but his works remained highly influential and spread rapidly. His medical encyclopedia stressed the contagious nature of diseases and how they could be spread through water supplies. The encyclopedia went on to be translated into Latin and studied in medieval European universities. Avicenna is regarded as the father of early modern medicine. Guided by the texts of Galen, the Greek physician, Muslim scholars made great advancements and discoveries in the field of anatomy, and medicine became a distinct scientific field. The fields of chemistry and optics became more studied as well. They excelled at mathematics, and in the 800s, al khwarizmi founded a mathematical discipline called Al-Jaba, or, the reunion of broken parts. This would come to be known as algebra. The simplified Arabic numerals also began to replace the inefficient Roman numerals in Europe. Following in the footsteps of the former masters of Mesopotamia, the Babylonians, the Arabs had an affinity for astronomy, and Baghdad fittingly became a center for this discipline. Muslims created an observatory there to gaze into space. They were well aware the Earth was spherical, and merchant ships and caravans used the astrolabe to track their positions using the positions of these stars. Islamic travelers, like Ibn Battuta, traveled around the Middle East and beyond, writing down their experiences and first-hand descriptions of the social and political life in these regions. There were limits to this golden age though, brought on by a more conservative culture. Many more powerful and religious nobles did not like the implications of some Greek writers like Euclid, Ptolemy, and Archimedes, as their scientifically based writings undermined the faith-based society they were attempting to promote. Block printing also eventually declined, as many Muslims preferred to use the elegant and traditional script when writing, especially for religious works. The religious backlash also occurred in Al-Andalus, in Spain. In the 1100s, Averroes and Maimonides were philosophers who agreed and defended Avicenna's support of the nature of human reason. The Almohads, the Berber dynasty who supplanted the Almoravids, had both men exiled. By the 1200s, European rulers had begun to translate the classical and Hellenistic Greek works from Arabic into Latin, and studied in universities, which would later kickstart new ideas in Western philosophy, leading to a renaissance. Written works didn't always have to be scientific or philosophical. Islamic literature was quite diverse because of how multicultural the empire was. Arabic and Persian literature were the most influential. Before Muhammad, the Arabs composed poetry about the Bedouin experience, life in the harsh Arabian deserts and respect for one of their finest animal cohabitants, the camel. Before Islam, Persia had a rich history of literature. They were not a tribal desert people like the Bedouins, so focused more on their past kings, their Zoroastrian faith, and folk tales. The Book of Lords, written in the 500s, was a compilation of Persian poetry, with all their myths and legends. Once Islam spread, the Quran was held up as the most important literary work, but pre-Islamic themes still showed themselves in the Muslim world. The Shunameh, or the Book of Kings, written in the late 900s by Persian poet Fadawzi, is a history of Persia that begins with the mythical creation of the world, up until the Muslim conquest in the 600s. It is the national epic poem of present-day Iran, Afghanistan, and Tajikistan. Love poems were also popular. The first recorded female poet in Persia, Rabia Borki, shared her experiences with the pain of love and the suffering that can accompany it. The most famous piece of literature to come out of the Islamic Empire was 1001 Nights, or Arabian Nights, an Arabic compilation of folk tales which later became quite popular in Europe. Over time, other stories would be added to the text, like Aladdin's Wonderful Lamp and Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves. The Seven Voyages of Sinbad the Sailor was also eventually added. Two of the most significant texts in Persian literature would be Bustan, or the Orchard, and Gulistan, 
translated as the Rose Garden, both written in the mid-1200s by Sadi of Shiraz, nicknamed the Master of Speech. The texts deal with justice, virtue, with some observational humor mixed in. Rumi was a poet and mystic from the 1200s, living in Persia before emigrating to the Sultanate of Rum once the Mongol invasions began in Central Asia. He embraced a religious doctrine called Sufism, which focuses on Islamic asceticism and is more esoteric in nature. He believed the way towards Allah was through love and would dance and enter trance-like states in order to write his poetry. Today, he is one of the most influential poets in not only Persia, but the entire Islamic world, and has been described as the best-selling poet in the United States. The Muslim world also contributed writings in the field of history. Al-Masudi was a historian and geographer, known as the Herodotus of the Arabs. Meadows of Gold is considered his magnum opus, detailing the world since Adam and Eve, up until the time of the Abbasids. Modern historians have used his history to reveal much about the Caliphate during his time. Islamic art differed between regions, but was mainly a mix of Arab, Persian, and Turkish culture. The most stunning piece of art, and the oldest, was built in the heart of Jerusalem, and is a large shrine which houses a sacred stone, known as the Foundation Stone, or Noble Rock, giving this building its name, Dome of the Rock. This stone was significant for Muslims as it was connected to the creation of the world and Mohammed's night journey. With the Western Wall and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre nearby, it is also a significant location for the other Abrahamic religions. It was built by the Umayyad dynasty in the late 600s. The patterns and mosaics used in it are based on Byzantine styles used in their churches and palaces, including its octagonal base. Inside, is more reminiscent of Persian styles of art. Other elaborate mosques would be built all over, all containing a special wall. In this wall would be a mirab, or small decorated niche, indicating the Qibla, the direction of the sacred mosque in Mecca, towards which Muslims were to pray. Inside, was the Kaaba, considered by Muslims to be the house of God, and where lies the black stone, the sacred relic thought to have come from heaven. In Andalusia, the Great Mosque of Cordoba was commissioned in 785, when Cordoba was the capital of Al-Andalus, but would be expanded over the centuries. The courtyard has several trees, and the mosque became a significant and influential monument for Islamic architecture. It was made into a cathedral during the Reconquista. A more common art form was that of rug weaving. Predating Islam, women would create knotted woolen rugs, which were used to provide warmth to stone structures and warm their families' tents. With the coming of Islam, these rugs were also used as mats, as prayer was to take place five times per day on clean ground. The practice of weaving was quite important, and would be taught to girls as young as four. They learned how to spin and prepare the wool from the sheep, and in a couple of years, would be able to make their first rugs. A few years more, and they would be creating full carpets. Once married, a woman would continue to make rugs for the family, and to sell. Rugs became more detailed with intricate designs, and would become an entire industry headed by professional artisans. As the Muslims discouraged depictions of their prophet and any other religious idols, they instead adorned their buildings with surface decorations based on linear patterns of scrolling and interlacing foliage, or in more simple terms, arabesque. These were dense, semi-abstract natural and geometric patterns, which were quite detailed and complex, often using an initial pattern and repeating it several times to fill up an entire space. While we've discussed the first three major caliphates, the Rashidans, Umayyads, and Abbasids, the fourth would come to prominence later. They would be known as the Ottomans. Africa gives us some of the most important and diverse history of any continent. This isn't surprising, as Africa is the second biggest continent after Asia, and presently has the largest number of countries. To the north, the coast which touches the Mediterranean Sea, is full of mountains. Just to the south of that, is the largest non-polar desert on the planet, the Sahara. 
The Sahara is a very important division in Africa, making history in Sub-Saharan Africa much different than in the North. This region came to be dominated by the civilizations that would form around the Nile River Valley. To the south, the Sub-Saharan is made up of a variety of terrain. In the hump of Africa, grasslands slowly develop as you head south, which then turn into tropical rainforests. This region is home to the Niger River, a very important river valley in African history, home to numerous civilizations. Moving further south, we find the rainforests of the Congo Basin, where flows the mighty Congo River. In the east, Africa touches the Indian Ocean, and terrain is more mountainous, with plateaus and large lakes. We believe the cradle of humankind is located in this region of modern-day Kenya. In the south of Africa, there are dry deserts like in Namibia, but also hills and plateaus. This area is home to some of the most valuable mineral resources in the world. We aren't exactly certain where agriculture first began in Africa, but it was most likely about 7,000 years ago, in the Sahel, the area between the Sahara and the Savannah. The region was more green and fertile than it is today. Though cultivation was easy, the suboptimal soil and scarce rainfall made more intensive farming impossible, so populations remained relatively stable. This wasn't a problem, as they relied mainly on hunting and gathering. It was only after the Sahara became drier, turning into a desert, that some populations migrated south, deeper into the grasslands, spreading their farming techniques, leading to more diverse crops, like tropical fruits, which are only able to grow in wetter climates. Others migrated towards the Nile River, which became a cradle of civilization. This eventually coalesced into ancient Egypt, a region which we had previously discussed in our last mega-documentary. Egypt is usually studied alongside the Mediterranean, or Near East. But perhaps above all else, it was truly, African. This is evidenced by its neighbors, right to the south, in which they would be inextricably linked. In truth, archaeologists of the past, could only work within their own perspectives, influenced by ever-present ideologies. The most influential was the backdrop of biblical stories, many of these involving Egypt. The result was European archaeologists and historians removing Egypt from Africa to place them in the stories of the Near East, often depicting them with European features, along with other regions mentioned in the Bible. The Nubians were regarded as darker-skinned and out of the biblical sphere, so had always taken a backseat to Egypt. Nubia has often been overlooked because of Egypt's dominance in the historical narrative, but the region of Nubia, today Sudan, also developed their civilization around the same Nile River with which the Egyptians prospered. Around 2500 BCE, the Kerma culture would form in Upper Nubia. After growing in size and prominence, they would expand northwards into Lower Nubia on the border of their great rivals. The city of Kerma itself was only home to around 2,000 Nubians, but most others lived rurally in smaller villages. The most stunning Kerma structures were built of mud bricks. These were called defufas. They were either temples or chapels for funerals. They were built promoting air circulation and the bricks kept the interior nice and cool. Egypt often underestimated the Nubians, but this wasn't the Egypt of old. Egypt was in a weakened state during the Second Intermediate Period. The Hyksos had encroached from the north, and now Nubia from the south. After expelling the Hyksos, the Egyptian New Kingdom would launch campaigns into Nubia, which they now referred to as Kush. The Nubian army was said to possess stunningly skilled archers. The Egyptians previously called the region Tasseti, meaning Land of the Bow. By 1500 BCE, Nubia was absorbed, and their capital of Kerma was destroyed. While Western narrative is that Nubia inherited most of their culture from Egypt, there was always a mutual exchange of ideas. This period saw that exchange ramped up tenfold. Elites would intermarry, and ceremonies involving the sun god Amun would take place. 
though Nubia was annexed, they would continue to fight back for centuries. Perhaps one of these rebellions would succeed. But there was no need to find out. The Bronze Age collapse dismantled New Kingdom Egypt, sending the once great Egyptian empire spiraling down. After Egypt finally disintegrated, Nubia had its own chance for glory. The Kingdom of Kush was established in Nubia, around 1070 BCE, with the capital eventually moving to Napta. After Kerma, this marked a second golden age for Nubia. In the 700s BCE, Egypt was still fragmented from the fallout of the Bronze Age collapse, with Libyan invaders making a mockery of Egypt's buildings and customs. A firm believer in the Egyptian religion himself, King Kashta, of Kush, undertook a campaign to invade Egypt and drive off these invaders. While there is no depiction of this man, he succeeded in taking the religious center of Thebes, and was even greeted as a liberator by the locals. He would then set his sights north, to conquer the rest of Egypt. But it was not to be. Kashta died and was buried with his predecessor, Alara. The conquest of Egypt, would then fall to Kashta's son, King Pai. Around 745 BCE, King Pai would invade a divided Egypt, and succeed, completing the conquest and becoming their first pharaoh of the 25th dynasty. I am a king. Divine emanation, living image of a tomb. Who came forth from the womb, adorned as a ruler, of whom those greater than he were afraid. Whose father knew, and whose mother recognized that he would rule. Meriaman Pianki. Ruling from Thebes and Memphis, this dynasty would be known as the Nubian dynasty, encompassing a wider Kushite empire. One of Pai's sons, Taharka, became the most influential pharaoh of this dynasty. Under his rule, Egypt became as prosperous as it had been during its New Kingdom period. Religion was promoted, and art restored and created. Temples and monuments were commissioned as well. Pyramid construction began again, a practice not seen since the Middle Kingdom. Taharka, and others of the dynasty, are sometimes depicted with distinct headdresses. The typical headdress involves a ureus, or cobra, representing rulership. Taharkas possess two cobras, most likely signifying rulership of both Egypt and Nubia. The Kushites also developed their own script, derived from the Egyptian. This was the Meruitic alphabet. The Kushites' success caught the eye of a new and expanding superpower in the Near East. The Neo-Assyrian Empire was lapping up chunks of land in the Middle East, and was on the march towards Egypt. In Judah, King Hezekiah implored the Kush for help to stave off the Assyrians, so the king sent an army. Jerusalem was saved from the siege, and merely became a tribute state of Assyria, instead of fully annexed. Furious, the Neo-Assyrians would then attack Egypt herself, to crush this kingdom of Cush, once and for all. The Nubians fought well, fending off the Assyrians over and over, even after all seemed lost. In 664 BCE though, the Kushites were finally defeated after the sack of Thebes. The Neo-Assyrians, under King Ashurbanipal, had access to vast amounts of iron weapons, which wore down the Nubians, forcing a retreat. The Assyrians withdrew as well, but installed native puppet rulers as Egypt's 26th dynasty. Their civilization would live on though. By the 500s BCE, the capital was moved to Mero, or Merui, further away from Egypt, but more importantly, expanded southwards, to a region with sufficient rainfall, and easy access to iron, and other resources. Here, the Nubians would flourish once again. Their most significant structures were their pyramids. While smaller and differently shaped than their Egyptian counterparts, some would still stand an impressive 30 meters tall, just shy of 100 feet.
Even more impressive, is that just a single burial area in Mero, contains more pyramids than in the entirety of Egypt. Yet, not many have heard of this land of pyramids. The Nubians would live on through the classical period as well, often under female rulers called Kandake. As the kingdom of Kush flourished in Nubia for centuries, a rival would be growing to the southeast, in present-day Ethiopia. By the first century CE, the kingdom of Aksum was founded here, by people claiming to be descendants of the kingdom of Saba, which biblical sources call Sheba, whose queen possesses great wealth in the story. Saba, situated across the Red Sea on the tip of the Arabian Peninsula, became a wealthy trading kingdom as an intermediary between the Mediterranean and India. There still isn't evidence that the founders of Aksum were actual descendants, or whether they just adopted some of their culture. The kingdom of Saba began to decline by the turn of the millennium, and dissolved by the 3rd century. Aksum survived though, relying on their own fortuitous trading location between the Mediterranean and the East. Aksum mainly exported ivory, perfumes, and slaves, and brought in metal works, wine, and olive oil. They would eventually get into an economic war with their Nubian neighbors, over the ivory trade, and in 330, they attacked and conquered the Nubian capital, a final blow to the already declining Nubians. The kingdom of Kush disintegrated into different smaller states, and the kingdom of Aksum, later taking on the name Ethiopia became the region's hegemonic power, so much in fact, that the Iranian philosopher Mani, regarded Aksum as one of the four great powers of the world, along with Sassanid Persia, the Roman Empire, and China. While they had originally practiced the religion of the Kingdom of Saba, they would adopt a new official religion in the mid-300s. Frumentius, was a Christian born in Byzantine Tyre, and grew up in Aksum as a slave. Before the Aksumite king's death, he freed Frumentius, who appealed to the Church of Alexandria to send missionaries to Aksum. He was appointed as bishop, and converted the new king to Christianity, and Frumentius became the founder of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Frumentius and Aksum retained close ties with the Church of Alexandria, just to their north, in Byzantine Egypt. Tradition held that Aksum was the home of the Ark of the Covenant, the sacred chest covered in gold, where lay the two tablets with the Ten Commandments. In this region of Africa, Nubia and Aksum became so prominent because of the trading routes from the Indian Ocean to the Mediterranean. Most of the rest of Africa saw different patterns that shaped their cultural development. In North Africa, during the ancient period, Carthage was a huge hub for commerce and trade. Trading beyond the Sahara was conducted by the Berbers, a people we mentioned last episode. The Berbers were part of the Afroasiatic language family, like the ancient Egyptian, the Cushitic, in the Horn of Africa, and the Semitic languages which came to dominate the Arabian Peninsula and the Levant. These pastoralists transported goods from North Africa to the Sub-Saharan, and vice versa. While salt, gold, copper, and slaves moved north, food and manufactured wares would move south. Once the camel was introduced to the Sahara from the Arabian Peninsula, the trans-Saharan trade truly prospered, as the camels, which could store their own nutritional resources to survive in the desert, were far superior transport units to the donkey which had previously been used. In North Africa, a group possibly descended from Iron Age Berbers, were known to the Romans as the Garamantes, and resided in Libya, forming a small kingdom. Though the earliest records date from the 5th century BCE, they emerged as a regional power in the 100 CE, prospering from the trans-Saharan trading routes. The Garamantes are most known for developing the first urban society in a major desert not centered near a river. They did this using a complex irrigation technique known as the Kanat system, similar to the one used in Persia. The society declined heavily in the 400s, once the deserts got drier, and water became more scarce. In West Africa, agricultural communities would emerge based on the domestication of millet. There is evidence of this as far back as 2000 BCE. These would become urban centers, and flourished because of the variation of environments in Western Africa. 
the desert nomads to the north could produce salts, the farmers on the fertile coast could provide meats and grain, the hunters along the Niger River provided fish, and those in the forests provided meats and furs. The two most prominent urban centers were of the Tishit culture. Dartishit and Wolata, in present-day Mauritania. The Soninke people, a Mande-speaking ethnic group, are thought to be responsible for beginning these centers. By around 300 BCE, these centers would decline and eventually become abandoned. We would see similar pottery in the later Ghana Empire, so the culture did survive. Later, around 300 BCE, Jenny Geno, in Mali, was settled, marked by homes and living quarters built with dried mud. By 250 BCE, Jenny Geno became a huge urban center itself. The bricks were built by mixing mud with straw and letting it ferment for a period of time, making the building materials thick and tough, but also malleable. Once the mud bricks were placed, they would be covered in mud plaster. This kept the insides cool. To the south, in the Joes Plateau of central Nigeria, the Nok culture would emerge, around 1500 BCE. They were known for their lifelike terracotta figures, of humans and animals. By 200 CE however, this culture disappeared, but the Nok is thought to have influenced later figurines of the Yoruba. Central and Southern Africa would start to see new migrants, from the 2nd millennium BCE. Originating in Cameroon, Proto-Bantu speakers, part of the Niger-Congo language family, would branch off, kickstarting a millennia-long migration. The western branch would migrate southwards, following the rivers until reaching Angola. The eastern group would first settle near the Great Lakes region of Africa. Then they traveled southeast, in different phases. These phases were not done within a lifetime, but over thousands of years, and by the end of the first millennium CE, the Bantu occupied all of Central and most of Southern Africa, displacing or assimilating the nomadic and pastoralist tribes along the way. In the East, they would encounter both Cushitic and Nilotic speakers. Cushitic speakers were from the Afroasiatic language family, the same family as the Semitics from the Near East, and the Egyptian language. Nilotic speakers were from the Nilo-Saharan language family, the same family as the Nubian language. As the Bantu speakers of Central Africa spread to the south, they encountered a people who were still able to thrive through hunting and gathering and herding. Relations between the Bantu and these people were relatively peaceful and many would get absorbed into the Bantu society and culture, which relied primarily on agriculture. The two main groups of these indigenous Africans were the Kwekwen and the San, collectively known as the Khoisan. Both shared similar languages, primarily from three language families, and are known for their click consonants. The Kwekwen were primarily nomadic pastoralist herders, maintaining large herds of cattle indigenous to their region. The San were hunter-gatherers who lived in small communities and have been called Bushmen in the past. By the first century, the African East Coast was established as part of a trading network. It was around this time, a sailor from Roman Alexandria, who remains unknown, wrote a detailed account of his voyages down the coast to the Strait of Madagascar. This document was called the Periplus of the Erythrean Sea and provided descriptions of the people and settlements encountered. The Periplus also describes trading opportunities with regions of the Persian Gulf, Arabian Sea, and Indian Ocean. The port of Raptor, which could be located in present-day Tanzania, was described as a trading metropolis, exporting valuable ivory, rhinoceros horns, and tortoise shells, while importing glass, grains, and weapons. Beyond this lay the Strait of Madagascar, which led to the southern tip of Africa, but was known for its bad weather, so the Periplus goes no further. We aren't certain of the beginnings of the East African trade with the Indian Ocean, but the monsoon winds made it fast, easy, and one of the most efficient trading routes in the world. It's possible that around the year 250, Malay traders from Southeast Asia, trading in spices like cinnamon, 
began a settlement on the uninhabited island of Madagascar, with their indigenous laborers from Borneo. Since the region was so isolated, megafauna from the prehistoric period still roamed on the island, but are now extinct. Bantu migrants from the African mainland would eventually make it to the island around year 1000. After years of mixing, the Malagasy people and language would emerge, a blend of Austronesian and East African. After Africa's ancient period, the medieval period would be mixed into the sphere of a new religion, that of Islam. Though Islam, the religion, managed to permeate into sub-Saharan Africa, the armies of Islam never managed to break through, only completing direct control of North Africa. Before Islam, Africa had rich traditions of its own. While there was no unified religion, Africans believed in pantheism, which is a belief in one creator God, who is responsible for creation, but other minor gods lived throughout the world as well. Niyama was a supreme deity of the Akan people of Ghana, who gave birth to more minor gods. One of these sons was the Rainmaker. Another god was responsible for sunshine. The afterlife was viewed by how well a lineage group or clan honors their ancestors. The surviving members of a clan needed to perform the correct rituals to keep their ancestors' souls from disappearing. In return, it was thought the souls could influence their lives both positively and negatively, so best to keep them happy. Once Islam arrived, these beliefs didn't go away, despite being at odds with each other. One common thread was the acceptance of a single supreme deity, but Islam did not accept the worship of lesser deities and spirits, and the existence of a priest class. Furthermore, Islam was more rigid in its gender roles, and there was often separation between men and women in Islamic society, while African society was more lenient with their relationships and friendship circles. In the end, African culture and Islamic culture became syncretized into a unique form of African Islam. But how exactly did Islam first get to Africa? We touched on the rise of Islam last episode. Focusing on Africa, after the newly Islamized Arabs consolidated power in their peninsula, the Rashidans, the first of the major caliphates, went on a lightning-quick campaign of expansion. In 641, they toppled the 200-year Byzantine rule in Egypt. Still more of a desert power than a naval power, the Arabs moved the capital from the coastal city of Alexandria, to Fustat, a more inland city, and safer from maritime attacks. After their initial successes in Egypt, the Arabs continued to expand westwards in North Africa, along the Mediterranean coast. The native Berbers at first fought back against the Arabs, delaying Arab expansion into the region for decades. But by the 700s, the Arabs broke through under their next caliphate, the Umayyads, and conquered all the way to the western coast and the Strait of Gibraltar, leading into their own storied campaigns in Europe. In the east, the Kingdom of Aksum, one of Africa's most prominent civilizations of the ancient period, was in a period of decline by the medieval age. Overuse of their farmland began the problems, but trading routes shifted from the Red Sea region to the Persian Gulf and Arabian ports. In the 800s, Aksum moved their capital inland, away from the shore, to the more mountainous regions. Aksum attempted to stay active in trade by exporting ivory, gold, perfumes, and slaves from the Amharic Plateau to the south, but couldn't regain their former glory, as they were now landlocked and cut off from trading partners by the Arabs to the north. In 960, tradition states that Aksum was destroyed by Yodid, a mysterious warrior queen. The Zagwe dynasty had taken power in Aksum in the mid-1100s. They made the government more centralized and helped spread Christianity throughout Ethiopia. Christian churches and monasteries were built all over in an attempt to spread the faith in rural areas. Though cut off economically, they kept in contact with the Coptic Church in Egypt and the Christian communities in the Middle East. In 1270, the Solomonic dynasty took control, founding the Ethiopian Empire, which would last for centuries, even though it would always be surrounded by hostile forces and be one of the only two African countries to have never been colonized. The coast of East Africa would reach its zenith during the medieval period. 
In the ancient period, this region was already booming with trade beyond the Indian Ocean, as identified in the Periplus. The Arabs had called it the land of Zanj, in reference to the darker skin of the indigenous people who inhabited the area. According to Swahili tradition, in the 7 and 800s, Arabs from the peninsula began to settle along the small islands and ports on the coast. Ivory, rhinoceros horn, and gold were shipped across the Indian Ocean, in return for ironworks, textiles from India, and porcelain from China. These regions became quite rich, quite quickly, and some of their stone palaces can still be seen in present-day Mombasa and Zanzibar. The most impressive city was said to be Kilwa, to the south. It is now in ruins, but Ibn Battuta claimed it was one of the most beautiful cities ever built. The Husuni Kubwa was a large palace with domed roofs, with a beautiful inner courtyard. Indoor plumbing was also common. The cities were generally all independent, but also exerted power over numerous smaller towns. The coastal cities would often act as intermediaries between East Asia and the interior regions of Africa as well, who utilized the ironworks and textiles. Sometimes though, merchants on the coast would use force against the interior Africans in order to gain more products. Mombasa was reported as often being at war with the interior, but still maintained trade relations. By the 1100s, the culture was cosmopolitan, blossoming with a culture mixed from the indigenous Africans and peoples from the Arabian Peninsula and Persia. From this mix, developed a unique Swahili culture, a word from the Arabic, meaning Sahel, or, coast. Intermarriage would occur between immigrants and the native population, leading to a powerful class of people of mixed heritage. Most of these upper classes had converted to Islam by this time. Another consequence, was the appearance of Middle Eastern style buildings and distinctly Arab culture in a society that was still widely African. The Arabic language mixed in with the native Bantu, and created a new distinct language which came to be known as Swahili. Today, it is still the national language of Kenya and Tanzania. On the other side of the continent, West Africa would be home to numerous large commercial empires. The introduction of the camel sparked the development of more efficient trans-Saharan trade routes, leading to the development of the first of the major West African empires in the 3 to 400s, the Ghana Empire. It was founded by the Soninka people, part of the Mande language family. The Ghana Empire wasn't located in present Ghana, but further north, in the grasslands of the upper Niger Valley, between the deserts of the Sahara and the tropical forests to the south. Though the camel made trade easier, the key to the development of Ghana was one of the most precious resources. In the center of the Ghana empire, was one of the richest gold-producing areas in all of Africa. Ghanaian gold was traded with Morocco to the north, and then transported all over the old world. Ghana even became known to the Arabs as, the land of gold. Over time, ivory, ostrich feathers, and slaves, became their prime exports in the Trans-Saharan trade, but the slave trade most likely began much earlier, with North African merchants selling sub-Saharan slaves across the Mediterranean. Though we don't know much about the kings of this empire, we know the capital was at Kumbi Saleh. Kings ruled by divine right, and were aided by an aristocratic class made up of heads of the different clans. They each ruled different areas, where they collected taxes and maintained order. The king was to maintain order in the whole empire, and also acted as a judge in internal disputes. The state religion was traditional African beliefs, but over time Islam would enter the region through the Berber merchants from the north. The Islamization of West Africa began slowly, with individual merchants converting. By the start of the new millennium, the Gao Empire, a newer empire established in the 800s in eastern Mali, was the first in the region to adopt Islam as the state religion. The Ghana Empire adopted Islam in 1050. The empire lasted for almost 1,000 years, but was weakened by constant wars with the Berbers. Once trading routes shifted east, the empire would lose economic hegemony as well. Ghana continued to decline, and was eventually dissolved by the 1200s. New estates would coalesce in West Africa after the decline of Ghana, 
including smaller city-states like in Horsaland in northern Nigeria, and states like Canaan Borneo and Gao, which would develop into the enormous empire of Songhai at the end of the medieval period. But the most powerful successor to Ghana would be the Mali Empire, established in 1230. Extending from the West African coast, all the way inland, it encompassed the former Ghana capital of Kumbi Saleh, as well as the important trading cities of Gao and Jenne, all along the Niger River. They continued the gold trade that made the preceding Ghana empire wealthy, but also relied more on farming, as they had access to more moist farmland. The political rulers were known as Mansa, and also acted as the religious authority. The trading, and most of the rest of commerce, was done in the bigger cities. This was led by the merchants, many of whom had converted to Islam. This was the Mali Empire's official state religion, although the rural regions kept the indigenous African traditions. The empire was one of the wealthiest states in the world during the late medieval period, and it's thought that one of its kings, Mansa Musa, was the wealthiest man to have ever lived. Mansa Musa also strengthened Islam in the empire, building mosques and bringing in scholars for Quranic studies. One of the most interesting cities to develop under Mali was the city of Timbuktu. It was founded earlier around 1100 as a caravan camp for Berber merchants and traders. Under Mansa Musa and the Mali Empire, the city became the biggest cultural center in West Africa. To the south of these West African kingdoms would be the wetter climates, home to a wide variety of states based around the tropical forests. By the modern age, this region would include the Ashanti Empire, primarily located in present-day Ghana. The Kingdom of Dahomey, in present-day Benin, known for their female warriors, and the kingdom's later role in the transatlantic slave trade. The Oyo Empire, the most powerful Yoruba state, known for their cavalry. The Kingdom of Benin, established by the Edo, in southern Nigeria, and the states of Igboland, including the Kingdom of Enri, and its famous bronze artifacts dating to the 9th century. Central and Southern Africa would remain relatively stable throughout the medieval period. While there were no large empires in these regions during the ancient period, there were many non-centralized societies, ruled by local chieftains. During the medieval period, some of these societies began to coalesce into larger states. Heading south from the major West African empires, in the Congo River Valley, two new kingdoms would emerge in these rich fertile lands. The Kingdom of Luba emerged from the preceding Luba culture and had a centralized government, with appointed governors who collected tribute from the village locals. To the west, the Kingdom of Congo would also form near the Congo River. Both would grow quite powerful over time as they were the main polities in the region and expanded to overtake the local pastoralist and small farmers to the south. Still further to the south and east, in the grasslands near the Zambezi River, more Bantu speakers thrived through farming, herding, and trade. The villages here were built surrounded by walls, mainly to protect their animals during the night. This was characterized by the Zimbabwe, a Bantu word meaning, stone house, a society based on a plateau between the Zambezi and Limpopo rivers. It is thought that the ruins of Great Zimbabwe was the capital of this powerful kingdom. Its location was between gold reserves to the west and a river for trading to the east. During the late medieval, Zimbabwe was the most prosperous state in southern Africa and was a major player in trade with the Swahili city-states on the coast. Great Zimbabwe rested on a hill surrounded by its famous stone walls and could have held more than 10,000 residents. Houses of the upper classes were built with stone and cement. The royal palace was also surrounded by large stone walls. Gold and copper ornaments have been found here, along with porcelain imported from as far away as China. Zimbabwe most likely became wealthy through their ownership of cattle and the taxes imposed on the gold passing through their region. It appears that during the 1400s, Great Zimbabwe was abandoned, most likely because of environmental factors or overgrazing. 
African history has been difficult to fathom because many of their language families had no writing systems. So we have had to rely on foreign visitors to Africa to report on it, like Ibn Battuta. Furthermore, the rich oral traditions have been cut short because of the coming imperialism. Still though, modern historians are finding out more about the vast and varied African societies in this second largest continent, and not just the histories of its regions, states, and kingdoms, but deeper information about its societies, cultures, and lifestyles. Africa, unfortunately, is still seen as a monolith, but it was not only a diverse continent, it was arguably the most diverse in history. While we've mentioned many of the major states, it is estimated that the continent was home to over 10,000 distinct societies, each with their own cultures and traditions. Ancient Africa was home to four major language families, like the Niger Congo in the West. This included the Bantu language family, which spread all throughout the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa, and the Mande speakers in the West. The Nilo-Saharan language family included the Nubians and other Sudanic cultures near the Nile. The Afroasiatic language family dominated the Sahara, and included Semitic languages, Berber, Egyptian, and Cushitic. In the very south was the Khoisan, speaking three language families. Many African urban centers began like in the rest of the world, small towns that were walled off, and then small villages ruled by a single clan. These villages grew into larger towns with division of labor and a center of government, with different clans sharing the city, each ruling their own districts. In the West African kingdoms, the major towns and cities were based around the royal districts. Unlike other cultures of the time, the African kings weren't an untouchable divine presence. African kings would often hold council with the local communities in order to hear grievances or hold festivals for foreign visitors. Though the kings were more open and accessible, they were still well guarded by a retinue of armed guards and lived a life of extravagance in large palaces. There was a mutually beneficial relationship between the kings and nobles and the merchant class. The merchants provided the taxes for the king and were granted special favors. In East Africa, there were also kings, but these were more merchants than rulers and presided more over their city-state through wealth than by force. Most Africans lived in smaller rural villages though, away from the splendor of the palaces or the bustling thrill of the urban markets. The rural Africans lived a more simple life, based on their immediate family. This usually included parents and their young children, and sometimes grandparents as well. Houses were mostly just thatched mud huts, inhabited by the whole family. The families were in turn part of larger kinship groups. The kinship groups acted like they did in other societies, and elders were generally the most respected and controlled most aspects of the clan. In African society, women often worked the fields, and mothers were valued for their contribution to the population. Men either went on hunting expeditions, or tended to the cattle. In Islamic communities in Africa, polygyny was practiced, but also occurred in some non-Islamic regions. The main difference between men and women in Africa compared to other contemporary societies was that lineage was matrilinear. It was traced through mothers and daughters, and inheritances were generally given to daughters, or the sons of a man's sister, rather than his own sons. Muslim traveler Ibn Battuta wrote of how women never veil themselves and have male friends outside of their marriages, a controversial practice back home in the Maghreb. After asking his African acquaintance why they give women so much more freedom, he replied that there is nothing suspicious about a man and woman being friends, and that to think otherwise is suspicious in itself, suggesting infidelity would be common in the Muslim world if men and women weren't kept separate. An insulted Ibn Battuta later refused to go back to his friend's home. Though Islamic culture permeated throughout Africa, most Africans still kept their own customs regarding men and women, even in the bastions of Islamic Africa in the Western Kingdoms. When we think of African slavery, our minds often go to the early modern period in the early 1500s, and the massive number of slaves taken from Africa in the transatlantic slave trade. 
while nothing compares to the sheer magnitude and lasting consequences of this chattel slavery. Slavery had been practiced in different forms in most ancient and medieval societies. It most likely developed when one clan or society took over another, and forced them to become workers and servants. By the medieval period, the Berbers in North Africa regularly raided regions of the Sahel and beyond, to bring back captives who were then sold across the Mediterranean world. Men could have been used as slave soldiers, while women as domestic servants for the nobility. In the Western empires and the Swahili coasts, African slaves were used more for manual labor. Sometimes, even little girls would be used in mines in order to reach gold, too hard for larger bodies to reach. Plantations did exist in Africa, usually owned by the king or wealthy landowners. Conditions were harsh and deplorable, and along with slaves who worked the mines, were some of the worst lives of servitude. Those more lucky, like soldiers, could at some point win their freedom. Those who worked in private residences as domestic servants, also had a somewhat easier time than the laborers. It's possible that the majority of the population in North Africa were slaves, while in Sub-Saharan Africa, this number is less than 1 in 10. African culture was primarily based on their art, which was, like most other cultures of the world at the time, created for religious purposes. As far as we can tell, the oldest forms of African art, are their rock paintings. The earliest of these is in the Sahara, in the Tassili Mountains, dating to around 5000 BCE. Later paintings show the two horse chariots widely used before the camel was brought to North Africa. In Southern Africa, the San Rock paintings depict some of their village rituals. Africans also used trees, to create intricate art. After making a sacrifice to the tree spirit, an artist would carve masks, sculptures, or headdresses from the tree itself. The masks and headwear were used by dancers during rituals. In Mali, the Chihuahua mask represented the swift antelope, with their rituals honoring the myth of the creation of farming and agriculture. A bit to the south, in Ife, present-day southern Nigeria, metal workers created copper alloy statues using the lost wax method. These Ife sculptures could have influenced the sculptures in the Kingdom of Benin, which represented different figures, both human and animal. The Benin sculptures are quite complex, and are collectively known as the Benin Bronzes, reaching their peak during the late medieval period under a golden age, under their obas, or kings. It's no surprise that each of Africa's varied regions, practiced varied types of architecture. In ancient Africa, the oldest and longest lasting has been the pyramids. Not just the ones in Egypt, but to the south, in Mero, built by the Nubians of the Kingdom of Kush from 300 BCE. As discussed earlier, these pyramids were distinct from those to the north in Egypt, in that they were smaller, but much more numerous. Later, to the south, the Kingdom of Aksum, built colossal stone pillars up to 100 feet high, just over 30 meters, called stele, to mark the tombs of their kings. Once Christianity was officially adopted in the mid-300s, Aksum focused on building large churches. In West Africa, though stone was used for buildings, they relied more on mud-brick constructions or mixtures of earth and other organic compounds. In the Swahili city-states, architecture was more related to those designs of the Middle East. Most people lived in small mud or thatch houses, while the wealthy lived in large residences built of stone, influenced by the Arab culture. To the south, were the walls of Great Zimbabwe, built with no mortar, by the Shona, part of the Bantu people who migrated throughout the continent. Some of these walls reached 11 meters high. A lesser-known Zimbabwean archaeological site was at Bambusi, where colossal stone walls were also built, although later. African music and dance was also created for religious purposes, to tell stories, or for ceremonies like weddings. Emphasis was on percussion and rhythmic beats. Dances were representations of the spirits coursing through the human form. Some societies, like the Maasai, a Nilotic people, jumped, while others shook, stomped, or sang. Many would join in, and clap their hands. Xylophones, 
like the balafon, were used in West Africa. Bells and flutes were also popular, and they used stringed instruments like the fiddle, harp, and zither. For musical storytelling, West Africans used what we call a talking drum, which went by many names in the various regions. Two drumheads were connected and leather tension cords could be squeezed to manipulate the pitch. Leaders would use voice repetition to incite a reply from listeners, called a call and response. This tradition made its way over to the Americas during the slave trade, and it mostly survives in the present day through gospel music and in American churches in the South. A bard, also called a griot, was a professional storyteller, and necessary to orally pass down a community's history from generation to generation. As expected, bards needed a highly developed memory and were said to possess the knowledge contained in entire libraries. When a griot died, so did the knowledge. They weren't simply storytellers, but entertained crowds by singing and playing instruments, and were even thought to possess supernatural powers, with the ability to both bless and to curse. The Epic of Sunjara is one of the most prolific West African poems, and has been passed down in the oral tradition by bards for over seven centuries. It is set in West Africa, and deals with the exploits of Sunjara, also known as Sundiata, the founder of the Mali Empire. While Mansa Musa became more famous because of his pilgrimage to Mecca, spending extravagant amounts of gold, Sundiata has always been more celebrated by the Mandinka, because of his legendary stories which were told by their bards. The Kuyata line of griots, which began with the founding of the Mali Empire, still exists today. The Indian subcontinent's classical period didn't end after the Mauryas, but it was the start of the Middle Kingdoms of India, a period of 1,500 years which saw the rise and fall of a multitude of kingdoms and dynasties. The first centuries of the next millennium were dominated by a new empire, that of the Kushan. As discussed in our Ancient World video, the Kushan originated as a branch of the Ueji Confederation, but were pushed out of their homeland by the Xiongnu, and fled south. They established themselves in Bactria, and came to control regions of present-day Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, Pakistan, and northern India. Their location was ideal, as it sat on one of the main trading routes on the Silk Road, between Rome and China, the two most powerful entities at the time. Trade between the Romans and Han had grown rapidly during this first century of the Pax Romana. The early Roman Empire was booming, and imported all kinds of items from the east, like indigo, ivory, textiles, and spices. In the second century, Kanishka, under whom the Kushan Empire would reach its zenith, became a patron of Buddhism, and it eventually spread to the merchant classes. They would use their wealth to build stupas and donate to other Buddhist projects. This resulted in magnificent Buddhist monasteries, built with the finest of materials, and adorned with precious stones, quite different from the more humble style based on traditional Buddhist asceticism. The Silk Road also facilitated the diffusion of ideas. From around 150 onwards, Buddhist monks from India used these routes through the Kushan Empire, and into China. The more Buddhism reached China, the more it influenced the new Buddhist converts to make pilgrimage to India. Many of these were monks, coming to the subcontinent to visit the holy sites. With the increased interaction, new exchanges of ideas prompted development in philosophy and the sciences. It's quite possible the Buddhist writings brought back to China could have kick-started their interest in the development of printing. Merchants and missionaries would travel from the Kushan Empire through mountain trails of the Silk Road. They would have resting spots along the way, where they would leave markings honoring the Buddha. One of the most significant would be at Bamyang in Bactria, present-day Afghanistan, where travelers would carve monumental statues of the Buddha into the cliff sides. Both of these were built after the disintegration of the Kushan dynasty, in the five or six hundreds, and have been the target of numerous attacks over the years, until they were ultimately destroyed in early 2001, under orders from the Taliban. Buddhist pilgrims from China were greeted with a very different sort of Buddhism than when it was founded. Those who wrote about the Buddha's life, did so far after his death, but this only made him seem more divine. 
He began to be seen as the son of a deity, and was depicted as a heavenly figure in sculptures. The previous Buddhist tenet that all classes in society were equal, shifted to uphold the status quo, arguing that the upper classes were closer to nirvana because of previous reincarnation cycles. This caused a split in Buddhism around the 1st century BCE, after the fall of the Maurayan Empire. Those who saw Buddhism as a way of life, continued to follow the original teachings of the Buddha, a school which would come to be known as Theravada. This version mostly became popular in Southeast India and in Sri Lanka, and for over 2,000 years, have preserved the Pali Canon, the largest, most complete Buddhist canon. Reformed Buddhist movements would result in a new branch, called Mahayana. Mahayana was the most popular form of Buddhism. The name itself, means, Great Vehicle. This was because Mahayana teachings were less strict than the older Theravada, allowing more people to reach enlightenment. Theravada in practice, was more focused on the individual, with greater emphasis on personal enlightenment, through personal rituals. Both schools believed in the concept of a bodhisattva, a person on the path towards Buddhahood. Though able to achieve nirvana, they were driven by a great compassion, and their spirit would instead remain on earth to help others attain enlightenment, refusing to enter final nirvana until all beings have been liberated. In Mahayana Buddhism, everyone is encouraged to take this path and become a bodhisattva. One of the most famous is Avalokitesvara, a bodhisattva with 108 avatars. In Sanskrit, his name means Lord of Compassion, and in East Asian Mahayana, developed into Guan Yin, who is also associated with compassion. Theravada Buddhism rejected the notion that anyone can be a bodhisattva, and it was reserved for select individuals, like Gautama Buddha himself, and Maitreya, who is prophesied to be the future and final Buddha of this current universe. Theravada Buddhism also views Gautama Buddha as being born as a human, but Mahayana developed the notion that he had been divinely born. Mahayana Buddhism flourished in North India, and spread towards China, and eventually Japan and Korea, mixing with their Confucian and traditional beliefs. Though it would remain strong in East Asia, Buddhism declined rapidly on the Indian subcontinent. During the time of the Middle Kingdoms, Hinduism adopted some reforms, and grew to emphasize one's individual bhakti, or devotion, as a means to improve karma, instead of through the court rituals of the Brahmin class. Hinduism was more accessible to everyone, like Buddhism, but it also fit in with the structure of Indian society, and became the dominant religion in India during the time of the Middle Kingdoms. We don't know why the Kushan Empire fell into decline, but by the late 200s, it had become fragmented, losing its western territory in Bactria, to a branch of the Sassanid Persians, and its eastern territory to a new state that emerged around 319, the Gupta Empire. It was established by Chandragupta I, of the Gupta dynasty, who extended his small Gupta kingdom into a powerful empire through his marriage to a wealthy princess. He went from Maharaja, or Great King, to Maharajad Hiraja, or Great King of Kings. Like the Maurya Empire from the ancient period, Pataliputra was the Gupta capital. Under the second Gupta emperor, Samudra Gupta, the empire expanded greatly, and became the hegemonic power in northern India. The empire would soon extend to the south as well, and could have exerted influence on the Pallava empire in the Deccan plateau. The empire reached its height under its third ruler, Chandragupta II, and so began a golden age for India and Hinduism. Buddhism also flourished, as pilgrims and monks from all over came to India to visit their holy sites. The most famous of these was Fa Xian, a Buddhist monk from China, who reached India by foot in 405, during the empire's golden age. Fa Xian reports on how the empire is such a free and fair society for the locals, and about the high quality of life offered to them. His writings, along with other monks from China, are one of our main sources for this era of Indian history. The Hindu epics of the Ramayana and Mahabharata were also canonized during this period. Shacharanga, the precursor to chess developed in the 500s as well, before moving to Sassanid Persia, and beyond to Europe, and remains the common ancestor of numerous board games in East Asia. 
the economy in the Gupta Empire was regulated by the government. The Guptas came into much wealth, and owned land and mines with precious stones. The private sector also had a large part in commerce, as there were jati, or castes, which took care of certain industries. Copper and gold coins had been used since the ancient period, adopted from the style used in the Middle East, but cowrie shells were still the main item for trade. Even after the Gupta Empire dissolved, most transactions were done by barter. The Golden Age would have lasted longer, but the Guptas went into a steep decline after constant invasions by nomadic raiders from the north. They were collectively called the Huna people, which included the White, Alkan, and Kadara Huns. The empire eventually dissolved, and northern India was left with numerous smaller warring kingdoms. After the fall of the Gupta Empire, the subcontinent was left divided. By the 700s though, the regions in the northwest would come face to face with the new force which emerged from the Arabian Peninsula, that of Islam. We had discussed early Islam's expansion before, but not its effect on the Indian subcontinent. India and the Arabs had always been in contact through the Indian Ocean trade, through merchants, not soldiers. That all changed over a piracy dispute between the Umayyad Caliph and Raja Dahir, ruler of a Brahmin dynasty in the Sindh, present-day southern Pakistan. The Umayyads invaded and conquered Sindh, marking the entrance of Islam into the subcontinent. They then went on to annex more territory to the north. Invasions would continue over the decades, but the Hindu states would successfully repel them. By this time, to the west, Iran was experiencing an intermezzo, a renaissance of Persian culture, most successfully under the Samanid Empire. By 977, Turkic Ghulam slave soldiers, similar to the Mamluks, seized power from the Samanids, establishing the Ghaznavid Empire. Two decades later, Mahmud of Ghazni took power and began a more harsh phase of incursions into Hindu territory. He extended the empire's borders in all directions, annexing the upper Indus valleys in the process. Mahmud died in 1030, with the empire at its largest extent. The main resistance to the Ghazni Empire was a warrior class of disparate clans called the Rajputs. One of these was the Gujara Pratihara dynasty, who helped contain the invading Muslim forces, but were eventually defeated due to internal rifts. The next Persianate dynasty, the Gurids of Eastern Iranian origin, extended control over North India, stretching the empire to Bengal in the east, reaching its largest extent around 1200. The conquests massacred and displaced thousands of Hindu followers, along with Buddhist monks, and was the start of Islamic rule in the Bengal region. When the last Gurid Sultan was assassinated in 1206, their territory on the subcontinent was divided between his former slave generals. One of these, Qutubuddin Ibak, founded the Mamluk dynasty of the new Delhi Sultanate. His successors in the dynasty spent the next decades overtaking the territories inherited by his peers. Once the Mongols began their expansion under Genghis Khan, and ended the powerful Abbasid Caliphate at Baghdad in 1258, they expanded into the Delhi Sultanate's lands. Threatening the capital, they delayed the Delhi forces from their incursions to the south. The Sultanate's second dynasty, the Khalji, fended off the Mongol invasions and pursued their own invasions into South India. If you recall our last Megadoc, the Mauryans had managed to conquer much of India, but never the south. This region was the sphere of the Dravidian kingdoms, Tamilicum, a region ruled by the Tamil kings. The three most prominent were the Chera, Chola, and Pandya, known as the Three Crowned Kings. Their kingdoms controlled South India for well over 1,000 years, and even expanded their influence overseas, but often warred with one another. By the time of the Delhi Sultanate, the Cheras had already declined, and the Cholas had recently been conquered by the Pandyas. They would soon decline after losing the city of Kerala in 1312, and by the 1330s, the Third Delhi Dynasty, the Tughlaqs, brought the Sultanate to its greatest extent, ruling over most of the subcontinent. This was short-lived, and the Vijayanagara Empire, a Hindu state, was established by 1336, based in South India. To add to the Tughlaqs' problems, a vicious warrior and his army, 
crossed over the Indus in 1398, raiding Delhi and massacring the inhabitants. He withdrew not long after, most likely from the deathly stench of the fallen. His atrocities rivaled those of Genghis Khan himself, which is fitting, as he is thought to be related to the famous Mongol. His name was Timur, and his conquests made him the last of the significant nomadic conquerors. Timur, known as Tamerlane in Europe, from Timur the Lame because of his injuries, was a Muslim of Turkic and Mongol descent, and came to control the Shagatai Khanate by 1370, establishing the Timurid Empire with a capital at Samarkand. During the next decades, he campaigned all over Asia, to the lands of the Mongol Golden Horde in the north, into Mesopotamia, conquering Baghdad, raiding the Mamluk Sultanate's territory in the Levant, and then further into Anatolia, defeating the Ottoman Turks. His raid into northern India was because of his disgust for Hinduism, and his hatred of the Muslim Delhi Sultanate, which he viewed as being too tolerant with their Hindu population. Timur finally died in 1405, as the most powerful ruler of the Islamic world, and also one of the most despised. His Timurid empire would live on for another century, despite entering a period of stagnation and decline. The fourth dynasty of the Delhi Sultanate, the Sayids, were vassals of the Timurids during the early 1400s. In 1451, the Afghan Lodi dynasty took power, and became the fifth and final dynasty. The time around the end of the medieval era, near the turn of the next century, would prove to be quite challenging for the subcontinent, as it was greeted by two new players. One came from the north, by land, a group of Indo-Turkic clans known as the Mughals. They were led by Babur of Kabul. The other, came from the west, by sea. They were a group of Portuguese traders under Vasco da Gama. The initial mixing of Islamic and Hindu cultures was far from harmonious. Some rulers were more tolerant, allowing Hindus safe passage, as long as they convert or paid a tax. Other rulers were more ruthless, raising Hindu temples and building mosques and other monuments in their place, using the same materials from those destroyed temples. Over the decades, it is estimated millions of Hindus did convert to Islam. Many of the upper classes did this to remain in good graces with the Delhi Sultanate, while many of the lowest classes, like the Shudras and Dalits, also converted as a means of upward social mobility. On paper, the two religions were quite different from one another. Though Hinduism does believe in a single supreme deity, like Islam, other minor deities were also worshipped. Hinduism was also more hierarchical, with a priest class, which Islam did not have. Also, Muslims had no problems killing cows or consuming beef, while in Hinduism, it was a sacred animal. Despite this, cultural exchange was inevitable. The mix of the northern Indian languages with the Persian, gave rise to Hindustani, sometimes called Hindu-Urdu. The Muslim tradition of purdah, or keeping women separate from everyday public life, became more common among society, especially the upper classes. The lower classes by contrast, needed both men and women working in the fields to be able to get by. The Delhi Sultanate still conducted itself as a foreign occupying force, so the Muslim minority lived separately from the rest of the Hindu population, and most governmental positions were held by Muslims or converts. As a response to the divisions between Hindu and Islam, a new faith would emerge around 1500 in the Punjab in present-day Pakistan. This was known as Sikhism. It was founded by its first guru, Guru Nanak, who taught that asceticism and monastic rituals aren't enough, and that one must also participate in the world. Though Sikhism is similar to Hinduism in many ways, it is a different religion entirely. They were monotheistic as well, but also rejected the notion of divine incarnation and did not participate in pilgrimages. Originating in the Northwest, where the majority of Muslim and Hindu conflict would take place, they found great success with the locals, and both Muslims and Hindus converted. During the early modern period, they became more militant and protected many Hindus and non-Muslims from persecution. Today, it is the fifth largest religion on earth, and the predominant religion in the Punjab. 
Before the Delhi Sultanate though, daily life during the Middle Kingdom's period was similar to life during the previous periods. The rulers and maharajas lived in large palaces with hundreds of servants at their beck and call, and vast personal armies of tens of thousands. But for those who lived in the cramped urban districts, life was much different. The Buddhist missionary from China, Xian Zhang, noticed the houses were similar to those in China, but walls were made from a mixture of lime, mud, and cow dung. Cow dung was seen as a cleansing gift by the motherly and divine cow. It didn't smell bad, but did manage to equalize temperatures during the summer and winter months, as well as keeping the floor warm, and also served as a mosquito repellent. Since the ancient period, the subcontinent had been at the center of the spice trade, a series of maritime trading routes which rivaled and even surpassed the Silk Road. The spice trade sustained India during times of division. When internal trade was minimal, they always had their external sea routes. This helped them become the world's top economy for centuries. Trade was conducted mainly by those Hindus of higher caste. They were later joined by Muslim traders, and Parsis, Persians who migrated to India after the Arab conquest, and kept the Zoroastrian faith. Jains also became wealthy merchants, as they were forbidden from any form of killing, so were not able to work in agriculture and became traders instead. The subcontinent wasn't only known for its booming economy. During the Gupta Empire, the Guptas led India to a golden age that lasted over 100 years and included advancements in both science and culture. The famous astronomer and mathematician, Aryabhata, discussed all kinds of scientific topics, and his work was said to influence Muslim scholars, like Al-Khwarizmi, during the Islamic Golden Age, which we discussed a couple of episodes back. In the field of astronomy, he primarily worked on solar and lunar eclipses, discovered that the movement of the stars is due to Earth's rotation on its own axis, and attributed the moon and other planets' luminosity to reflected sunlight. The concept of zero was also developed here, before being spread to the West. Nalanda, the monastic university, is regarded as the first residential university and was one of the greatest centers of learning in the world. It was founded by the Guptas in the 400s, but ransacked and destroyed during the Turkic invasions around 1200. During India's Iron Age, during the early years of Buddhism, beautiful Buddhist cave temples and monasteries were built, some of which we've mentioned in our last Megadoc, but during the long-lasting Middle Kingdom's period, architecture reached new heights. The Ajanta Caves are 28 to 30 rock-cut Buddhist cave monuments built in the western portion of the Deccan Plateau. While the first phase of their construction was during the ancient period, the second phase mostly took place in just 20 years and they remain some of the finest living examples of ancient Indian art. The caves included sculptures and paintings of the Buddha and Bodhisattvas, as well as pillars and friezes. Some of the caves were carved to become monasteries with Buddhist shrines, and apartment complexes where monks could live. Some paintings from Ajanta depict the Buddha, revealing his different incarnations. The paintings are so well preserved that they give us clues to the daily life of people in India at the time. The Ellora Caves, built during the medieval period, are located nearby, and also include Hindu and Jain temples. One of the caves features the largest single monolithic excavation in history, the Kailasha Temple, a monument dedicated to Shiva. On the eastern shore, the Kingdom of Pallava built several monuments of their own. The collection of monuments found in Mahabalipuram was a collection of 40 Hindu monuments and temples, including the sculpture of the descent of the Ganges, a giant open-air rock relief, depicting the story of the sacred river Ganges' descent to the earth from heaven. The Shaw Temple, another part of the collection at Mahabalipuram, was built near a port city overlooking the Bay of Bengal. It isn't rock-cut, but a free-standing structural creation made of granite. Still on the eastern coast, the Konark Sun Temple, built by the Eastern Ganga dynasty in 1250, boasts one of the best examples of temple art. Twelve pairs of wheels, each nearly 12 feet, or 3.7 meters high, represent the 12 months of the Hindu calendar. Though the temple stands at 100 feet or 30 meters high, the taller curved tower, 
with a peak called a shikara, which rose to 200 feet, or 61 meters, no longer stands over the sanctuary, but some artists have depicted its appearance. To the northwest of the Sun Temple, in central India, lies the Kajaraho group of monuments. This group of Hindu and Jain temples was built by the Chandela dynasty from around 885 to 1000. 85 temples were scattered about Kajaraho, but only 25 remain standing today. The erotic art sculptures depict the pinnacle of passion and desire. The temples were some of the most impressive of the Nagara style, which was popular in the north. In the southern regions, another kind of architecture evolved, called Dravidian. These didn't have the same kinds of tower or shikara, but a pyramid-like structure called a vimana. Around the temples would be large gate towers, acting as entranceways, called gapuras, which would be richly decorated, and would often rise even above the heights of the vimana. Literature also continued during the Middle Kingdom's period and reached its peak. Writing continued to be religious in nature, but more secular texts also developed. Religious poets wrote devotional poetry to deities like Rama or Vishnu. In the 1100s, Akka Mahadevi expressed her devotion to her supreme god, Shiva, through a mystical and physical union. She was highly influential in Kannada literature, part of the Dravidian language family. The mysterious poet Amaru is thought of as one of the best lyrical poets in Sanskrit literature. His Amaru Sataka, written in the 6 or 700s, deals with Sringara, dealing with the emotions of attraction, courtship, and desire between lovers. One of the most famous Indian Sanskrit poets was Kalidasa. He didn't just live during India's golden age of the Guptas, he is part of the reason it was a golden age at all. The Cloud Messenger remains one of the most popular Sanskrit poems. Kalidasa is also known for his dramas, the most famous of which was Shakuntala, which dramatizes a similar story in the Mahabharata. In the story, the king, Dushyanta, meets Shakuntala while on a deer hunt, and falls in love. He takes her hand in marriage and gives her a special signet ring before returning to his kingdom. After ignoring Devasa, a mean-spirited sage, he curses Shakuntala, by erasing the king's memories of her. The only way to return the king's memory, is to present him with the ring. Pregnant with the king's child, she later travels to meet him, but loses the ring crossing a river. With the help of the deity Indra and a fisherman, the pair are eventually reunited, after their son Bharata is born. Vatsyayana was an Indian philosopher of the Brahmin caste, and also lived during the Gupta period. He is credited for composing the Kama Sutra, the Hindu text on sexuality and eroticism. Dandin, writing in the 6 to 700s, was a writer of prose romances. Dashakumra Sharita is a narrative story about ten young men, either princes or sons of ministers, telling the story of their adventures. Their tales tell of demigods, gamblers, prostitutes, ghosts, magic, and of course, beautiful women. Though some of the text has been lost, it is still regarded as groundbreaking for its time. Just to the east of the subcontinent is a region we have barely spoken, that of Southeast Asia. Located between the Hindu kingdoms to the west and the Chinese empires to the north, the region became influenced by both cultures. Geographically, Southeast Asia is comprised of two regions. First is the mainland, located here. Then the region settled by the Malay, including the long, drooping Malay Peninsula, and the 25,000 islands of the Malay Archipelago, mostly present-day Indonesia and the Philippines. The first humans to arrive here could have been as early as 60 to 65,000 years ago, migrating out of Africa. Some of them ended up on the Paleo continent called Sahul, a landmass including Australia, Papua New Guinea, Tasmania, and the Aru Islands. They were only able to arrive here because of the Ice Age, which gathered the waters into its solid form, lowering sea levels, and making travel between the landmasses easier. Once the sea levels rose again, migrations and movements became more difficult. Those who remained became the first peoples of Oceania, the two main groups being the indigenous Australians, and those on New Guinea, who would be called Papiwin. 
Evidence suggests that anywhere between 10,000 to as late as 4,000 BCE, another group, migrated from mainland southern China to the island of Taiwan. There, the Austronesian language family would develop. Over time, because of increasing population, they would undertake a massive migration out of Taiwan. There are numerous theories for how the Austronesians expanded, but the prevailing one is that from 3000 BCE onward, they used different sailing boats, along with outrigger canoes and catamarans, to disperse across the Indo-Pacific Islands, and even eventually reached Madagascar off the coast of Africa, which we discussed last episode. Some landed on New Guinea and mixed with the Papuan peoples on the shores. These seafarers were known as Malayo-Polynesians, and their language family became quite diverse, and would come to include languages like Malay, Indonesian, and Tagalog, and groups of oceanic languages, like Polynesian and Micronesian. This Polynesian branch made it to Fiji, Samoa, and the Cook Islands by the first millennium. It took centuries more to reach Tahiti, Hawaii, and the remote Easter Island. In the early to mid-1300s, some would travel southward and reach New Zealand, making this landmass one of the last to be settled by humans. Not all Malayo-Polynesians left for the southern islands. Some would migrate further south and onto the mainland. The two most prominent would be the Malay, who came to settle on the Malay Peninsula, and those who would be called the Cham, who would settle in southern Vietnam and flourish as the Sahuin culture. Along with the Austronesians, mainland Southeast Asia would be dominated by three other major language families. The Austroasiatic language family developed here, and most notably contains the Vietnamese and Khmer, or Cambodian. The Mon people, related to the Khmer, migrated from southern China around 3000 to 2000 BCE, and were some of the first people to establish themselves around the rivers in Southeast Asia bringing the practice of rice cultivation with them. The Irrawaddy, Salween, Mekong, and Red Rivers made these regions quite wet and fertile, and many states would grow based on agriculture. The north to south mountain ranges also made each area quite isolated from the other, leading to quicker differentiation of culture. While Southeast Asia became culturally influenced by India, no Indian states or kingdoms claimed direct control over it. Their influence had spread through merchants in the 300s BCE, and later through Hindu and Buddhist missionaries. Art, architecture, and political institutions throughout Southeast Asia began to resemble Indian styles. China took a slightly different path. In 111 BCE, the Han Dynasty conquered northern Vietnam and controlled it directly. It would stay this way for over 1,000 years. We will discuss Vietnam in a later episode, that will focus on the East Asian states influenced by China. Soon after, to the south, the Cham, the Malayo-Polynesians who migrated back to the mainland, formed their own independent group of states, collectively called Champa, in 192. With no major rivers in their territory, they relied more on commerce, acting as intermediaries between the Indian Ocean and East Asian trade. Those to the west had access to the fertile river valleys and did thrive through agriculture. The region was called Funan by the Chinese and by the first century had already had signs of Indian influence. In the five and six hundreds, it was replaced with the Austroasiatic Mon and Khmer kingdoms. The Mon states were collectively known as Dvaravati, located mostly in present-day Myanmar and central Thailand. They would be instrumental in the spread of Theravada Buddhism in Southeast Asia. The Khmer states of Chenla, a more agricultural confederation of Khmer states, lay to the east in Cambodia, and were mainly Hindu. By 802, Javayaman II would proclaim himself universal ruler and establish an empire here, the Khmer, or Angkorian Empire. This was the most powerful state to form in Southeast Asia at the time, and at its height was larger than the contemporary Byzantine Empire. It continued generating wealth through rice cultivation, like in the former Chenla states, and its longest-lasting capital city, Angkor, was home to the largest religious monument in the world, the temple complex of Angkor Wat. After the city was sacked by the Champa, Javayaman VII repelled them and conquered Champa in the east, 
making them tributaries, before building his new capital, Anchor Tom, in the late 1100s. Under this king, the Khmer achieved their golden era, with Jayavarman building hospitals, temples, and rest houses, and offering free services for his subjects to keep them physically and spiritually healthy. But in 1431, Anchor Tom was destroyed by yet another migrating people, forcing the Cambodians to flee and establish Phnom Penh as the new capital. The sack of Anchor Tom was headed by a group originating in southern China. They were the Thai people, part of the Kradai language family, who migrated into the region earlier. They set up their Buddhist Ayutthaya Kingdom, or Kingdom of Siam, in 1351, which laid the foundation of present-day Thailand. In the early modern period, the Ayutthaya would build a commemorative Buddhist temple, called Wat Chai Watan Aram, filled with hidden entranceways, where the king would perform religious ceremonies. Prior to all this, in the 6 to 800s, the fourth of the major Southeast Asian mainlanders came to settle in the westernmost region, present-day Myanmar, and would be known as the Burma, a Burmese-speaking people. Burmese was part of the Sino-Tibetan language family, the same as the Chinese languages, although a different branch called Tibeto-Burman. They migrated from the Tibetan highlands and settled around the Irrawaddy and Salween rivers, thriving through agriculture. In 849, they founded the first Burmese state in the region, the Kingdom of Pagan. By the mid-1050s, the king established the Pagan Empire after consolidating more land occupied by the Mon and absorbing them. The Pagan were a Theravada Buddhist state and were also influential in its spread in Southeast Asia. Though Pagan was a powerful empire, it was weakened in the late medieval period by the Mongols and the neighboring Thai occupied some of their most important eastern lands. In the Malay Peninsula, and Southeast Asian archipelago where the Malayo-Polynesian spread, states would grow more through commerce, than agriculture. One of the major trading societies here would be the Srivijaya. Founded prior to 671 on the island of Sumatra, it began as mostly a land-based trading empire, before conquering the Malay Peninsula, and entering a golden era becoming a powerful maritime empire. The Srivijaya became wealthy quickly by quelling piracy and controlling the Strait of Malacca, the small passageway which offered the most convenient route from East Asia to the Indian Ocean. The capital of Palembang became a major port city where seafaring visitors could wait for the right season to sail. In 1025, the Chola Emperor, Rajendra I, launched an invasion of his rivals in Srivijaya from southern India. Though they did not conquer the empire, their sacking and plunder caused enough chaos that the empire never again reached its former heights, and Srivijaya was finally conquered by a neighbor in 1288. Trading routes shifted to the Strait of Sunda, which led directly to the Indian Ocean. This led to the founding of the most powerful Southeast Asian maritime empire, the Majapahit. This Hindu empire was founded on the island of Java and came to encompass most of Indonesia, but also Singapore, the Malay Peninsula, part of Thailand, and parts of Southwest Philippines. This was mostly accomplished under its Hindu king, Hayam Wuruk, during the empire's peak. All of these states, from mainland Southeast Asia, to the Malay archipelago, became influenced by India, as evidenced by most adopting either Buddhism or Hinduism. But more than religion, the most important piece of Indian culture they would adopt, was a writing system. Though there was a wide variety of languages in this region, none had proper writing systems until merchants and missionaries brought over the South Indic script, descended from the Brahmi script of ancient India. It eventually was adapted for use in the local languages. By the late medieval, the Malay would instead adopt the Jawi alphabet, descended from the Arabic. The Wayang Kulit, meaning shadow play, was a popular form of entertainment on the island of Java, and most likely adapted from plays in India. It is a kind of shadow puppet play, and would use leather puppets on rods to tell a dramatic tale, usually about good versus evil. These would be accompanied by a gamelan orchestra. Because of the wide range of cultures and environments, daily life in Southeast Asia was quite varied. As with most societies, there was a hierarchy, although not as rigid as in India. 
Because of the wet environment, most of the population worked farming rice and paying taxes to the ruler or landlord. Among them lived local artisans and merchants. At the top rested the kings and nobles, who lived separately from their subjects, having adopted the notion of divine kingship from India. Rulers controlled all aspects of both political and economic life. Before road systems were built, goods were delivered up smaller rivers to port cities and then shipped out to various regions. Life for women in Southeast Asia was fairly egalitarian, which was quite rare in the rest of the old world. Literacy rates for women might have been higher than men, and they worked in the fields beside their male counterparts. They had more financial independence as well, and became merchants and traders themselves, much to the pleasure of those foreign traders looking for a mate. There were even reports that women served as the king's bodyguards in Anchor. A lot of women's status in society came from the tradition of the male's family passing wealth to the females after a marriage, as opposed to the dowry system prevalent in India and China. Though Buddhism and Hinduism came to dominate the region, Southeast Asians had their own traditional beliefs. Like many other cultures around the world, they initially believed in animism, believing that souls and spirits existed in objects or phenomena in the natural world. Mountains were considered especially holy, as a place where spirits go after death. Once Hinduism and Buddhism entered the southeast, local rulers would adopt them as a means of legitimacy, but most integrated them with their native beliefs. Theravada Buddhism flourished under the Mon peoples, but would decline after the Hindu Khmer Empire became the mainland hegemon. In Khmer Anka, rulers adopted Vaishnavism, a Hindu denomination that viewed Vishnu as the supreme deity. They would commission the building of temples, which would initially help the kingdom to prosper. These temples would become wildly influential and amass vast sums of wealth, none of which was taxed back to the king. It is estimated Anka could have had 300,000 priests at its height. Around the year 1000, a Buddhist revival would begin with the Burmese Pagan Empire. From there, it spread to many other regions of mainland Southeast Asia, and eventually the Khmer Empire would become Buddhist as well. The appeal of Theravada was that anyone could work their own path to Nirvana, instead of through an intermediary in the priest class, and over time, the masses preferred this to the state-sponsored religions. By the end of the medieval period, Hinduism became more rare in Southeast Asia, with most states either adopting Buddhism or Islam, a newer religion brought in through merchants. Indian architectural styles also made their way to the region, and can be seen in the religious buildings of the Southeast. In the 800s, on the island of Java, a king of the Shalendra dynasty commissioned the building of various Buddhist monuments, the most significant being the colossal temple of Boro Buddha. It is composed of nine stacked platforms, and decorated with over 2,500 relief panels depicting Siddhartha Gautama's life. It also originally contained 504 Buddha statues. It is the largest Buddhist temple in the world, and is still popular for pilgrimages, while remaining the most visited tourist attraction in Indonesia. Rivaling Boro Buddha, are the temples of the Khmer in Cambodia. Angkor Wat, built in the 1100s, was originally a Hindu temple, based on the sacred five-peaked mountain of Mount Meru, also recognized in Buddhism and Jainism. In the old Khmer capital city of Angkor Thom, the last of their magnificent temples was built. At the center of the city was the Baying, a magnificent Buddhist temple built in the late 1100s by Jayavarman VII, the first Khmer king devoted to the faith. The bairn is covered in mysterious smiling faces, thought to be either the bodhisattva of compassion, searching for those in need, or the face of the king himself. Soon after this was built, Theravada Buddhism became more prominent in the region, and brought in a newer kind of architecture involving a stupa and spire. The most prominent of these was the Shwedagon Pagoda, built in the 1300s. The gilded edifice is the most sacred pagoda in Myanmar, and is believed to contain the relics, including a staff, robe, and strands of hair, of the last four Buddhas of our current universe. When we last left China, it had been in a fragmented state after the fall of the Han dynasty in the early 200s, a period called the Three Kingdoms. 
During this early part of the medieval period, six different native Chinese dynasties ruled in the south, from around the fall of the empire to 589. With the Han Empire collapsed, nomadic societies took advantage and invaded from the north, setting up their own dynasties. The Chinese middle class and intellectuals were profoundly affected by the collapse of the empire. Confucianism was supposed to keep society strong and maintain order. How could it have failed? More and more, Confucianism wasn't seen as pragmatic in this new world, so many would find solace in more esoteric or spiritual beliefs, like Taoism. Many intellectuals, like the Seven Sages of the Bamboo Grove, a group of scholars, writers, and musicians, preferred Taoism, while being at odds with the state Confucianism of the ruling class. Though Taoism was a spiritual philosophy, it still couldn't fulfill the majority of the population. Though there is an afterlife in Taoism, emphasis is placed on living your current life to the fullest. But this wasn't possible in this time of turmoil. People needed another belief system. And they got it, in the form of Buddhism. Buddhism came to China through missionaries and merchants, traveling the Silk Road. We had gone over the origins and spread of Buddhism in an earlier chapter. It had reached China by the time of the Han Empire's decline. A perfect time, as people were looking for something new. Buddhist ideals, especially of the Mahayana school, spread among all classes, as it complemented Taoism. It was at first criticized, as being foreign, but was over time added to Chinese culture. Monks like Farshian were instrumental in its spread. After almost 400 years of fragmentation, China was finally reunified in 581, under Yang Jian, founder of the Sui dynasty. He ascended to the throne on March 5, as Emperor Wen, ruling from his capital at Chang'an. As Confucianism was less popular, Emperor Wen, promoted Taoism and Buddhism, erecting temples in the capital, and employing Buddhist monks in political positions. He also began the construction of a massive project. This was the building of a great canal, which linked the capital to the Yellow River. His son, Emperor Yang, completed the project, stretching the canal to the Yangtze in the south, uniting both of China's major rivers. This significantly increased the speed of crop shipments between both regions, giving the south more access to grains, and the north more access to rice. The canal was also used as a means of quick communication, and Emperor Yang used it as an imperial waterway, where he held elaborate processions to show off the splendor of the empire, and to keep watch over his people and his land. Like the Qin Empire, the Sui dynasty was more successful in unification, than at moral administration. The massive building projects were brutal for the conscripted manual laborers, and the high taxes left the emperor viewed in a negative light. Civil war broke out around 613, but the last straw was a failed invasion of Gugurio, an early Korean state which we will discuss next episode. Upon the emperor's return, he was assassinated by one of his advisors and another one of his generals took advantage of the turmoil and seized power. This was Li Yuan, and he would go on to found the next dynasty, the Tang. Unlike the short-lived Sui, which lasted for a mere 37 years, the Tang dynasty would survive for almost 300. Like the Han dynasty, this was also considered a golden age. Li Yuan took the name Emperor Gaozu, but only ruled until 626, when his son, Emperor Taizong took power. Under Taizong, China swelled in size and power. The western regions were pacified and given the name of Xinjiang, roughly meaning, New Frontier. The Chinese also extended their power into Tibet and the areas south of the Yangtze. China became without doubt the most powerful entity of East Asia. Commercial routes were formed to the southeastern states, while Chinese culture permeated into Korea and Japan. What made the Tang so successful was that it wasn't simply a strong military power. It invested in infrastructure, public works, and experienced a boom in arts and culture. Much of this was influenced by Buddhism. 
monasteries became more common and the capital city of Chang'an was restored and even surpassed its former glory under the Han. It was a bustling cosmopolitan city of around 2 million, with marketplaces filled with items from all over the world. Palaces, temples, and monasteries filled the streets, giving the capital a splendor not seen in other cities of the time. Like the Han though, internal political machinations undermined the empire, leading to a weakening of the Tang. Around the midpoint of the empire, during the mid-700s, the empire was thriving under Emperor Xuanzong. Near the end of his 44-year reign though, he was embroiled in matters with his favorite concubine Yang Guifei, and politician Li Linfu. At their urging, the emperor appointed a foreign general to head a garrison in a large area north of the Yellow River. In 755, this general, Orn Lushan, instigated rebellion, capturing Luoyang in the east, and founding a new dynasty, the Yang. Chang'an also fell, but the rebellion was put down in 763. Though the Tang was restored, Emperor Xuanzong had died of natural causes, and the Tang was forever weakened. As the empire declined over the next 150 years, all signs pointed to a loss of the Mandate of Heaven. The Tang faced natural disasters, like floods, droughts, and earthquakes, and external threats from nomadic peoples like the Khitan. The Khitan emerged around the 300s, in Mongolia and the Russian Far East, having descended from proto-Mongolic tribes, and would go on to create an empire of their own in the north, called the Khitan Empire, or Great Liao, which would last for 200 years, and encompass a large territory. The more direct end to the empire though, came from within. Rebellions by military generals and warlords increased, and in 907, a regional military governor usurped the throne, ending the Tang, and leading to another period of fragmentation, known as the Five Dynasties and Ten Kingdoms. This only lasted for a few decades, before a new dynasty took power in 960, the Song. It was founded by Emperor Taiju, who had overthrown the last of the Five Dynasties, and then went on to conquer the other kingdoms, unifying China again. The Song failed to reconquer the lands of the nomadic groups to the north though, and as pressure continued over the decades, the Song capital had to be moved south, to Linon, now Hangzhou, south of the Yangtze River. This was known as the Southern Song. Though they weren't noted for their military prowess, the Southern Song built a significant navy, and their rule became a period of economic and cultural prosperity. Back in the north, a new dynasty would overthrow the Khitan Empire, and drive them to the western regions. This was the Jin Dynasty, or Great Jin, a Jurchen state that formed in 1115, after a rebellion. The Jurchen would later be known as Manchu. In an attempt to reconquer their northern territories, the Song made an alliance with a new unified tribe of adept warriors from the inhospitable Gobi Desert and rugged steppe. These were, the Mongols. In 1234, the Mongols conquered the Jin, establishing themselves as rulers of northern China. But then, they turned their attention south, to the Song. Warfare broke out, which would last for decades. The new Great Khan of the Mongols, Kublai Khan, founded the Yuan dynasty in 1271, and in 1279, the Song made their last stand at the Battle of Yaman. The naval battle saw the Song outnumber the Mongol navy by 10 to 1, but they were still dealt a decisive defeat. The last Song emperor, Bing, who just turned 7, was watching the battle on a cliffside with his entourage, including statesman Lu Xiaofu. Once Lu saw that all was lost, he refused to be taken captive. He ordered his wife to commit suicide, and later wrapped young Emperor Bing in his arms and leapt off the cliff that had been their vantage point. And so ended the Song dynasty, as the Yuan dynasty claimed China. Politics during this time was driven by the Emperor, who sat at the top of the hierarchy. Under him, was the Grand Chancellor, who oversaw what was termed, the three departments and six ministries. The three departments were the Chancellery, Secretariat, and Department of State Affairs. Under this department, were the six ministries of personnel, revenue, rights, war, works, and justice. 
officials for these ministries were chosen based on civil service examinations. It became the main route to a government job. There were three levels to examinations, with most people taking just the first one and working as a civil servant at the local level. Those who made it to the third level took their exam at the imperial palace and could claim positions in the imperial bureaucracy. By the time of the song, training academies were set up to help the poor in studying for these exams. Despite this, those who excelled the most at the examinations were the landed gentry. They were non-aristocratic landowners, many of who became an intellectual class called the literati, or scholar officials. With their rise to prominence through the examination system, they became the new elite class in China for centuries. Chinese regions were divided into subdivisions, starting with the area command, governed by an area commander. Below that was the prefecture, looked over by the prefect, and below that, the district, governed by a district magistrate. His job, along with his small retinue, was to maintain law and order, and collect taxes. Districts could hold as many as 100,000 people. Under the district is the village, but this was not part of the governmental system. Villages took care of themselves, appointed their own council of elders, and helped collect taxes to send to the district magistrate. The vast majority of Chinese people had no direct relationship with the government and simply relied on their own village councils. China's economy grew considerably during its golden age. Under Grand Chancellor Wang Anshi, there was increased currency circulation, the breaking up of monopolies, and early forms of governmental regulation and social welfare. The reforms succeeded, thanks to new developments, like improvements in the chain pump for irrigation, and the introduction of a new kind of rice from Southeast Asia, able to produce two crops annually. As economic output had shifted southwards anyway, rice took over to become China's main crop. As in the ancient period, merchants in China weren't regarded highly in society, and the Tang government had restrictions on commerce and trade. Despite this, there was a boom in manufacturing. Cotton entered China from India, bolstering the textile industry. Gunpowder was also invented during this time, by mixing sulfur, saltpeter, and herbs. Use of the blast furnace to make steel also became widespread. By the time of the Song, the state eased trade and commerce regulations, and promoted private merchants. This led to the rise of a more complex economy, and the introduction of banking, the abacus for monetary calculations, and paper currency. This currency wasn't backed by anything tangible though, and was prone to inflation. International trade was conducted over land and sea since ancient times, but experienced a sharp decline after the fall of both the Han and Roman empires. The Tang expanded trade again over the Silk Road, and was successful, as much of the Middle East was unified under the Arab Caliphates, which sprang up in the 600s onwards. It was during the Tang that the Silk Road reached its height, and along with it, the empire. The capital flourished, importing exotic products from the Arabian empires, like the Abbasids, and lands around the Indian Ocean. Trade was conducted by either the Turkic Uyghurs, or the Sogdians, an Iranian civilization from Central Asia. The Silk Road wasn't a single path or highway that linked the east to the west. It was a series of different routes that remained fluid. One of the first routes to be used were mountain passes full of jade crystals that flowed through Bactria. It was this route that the first Buddhist missionaries voyaged from India to China. After this, the best route would be to the north of the Tian Shan, or Heavenly Mountains, as climates were mild, and animals in the party could graze. The only problem were the rogues and bandits along the way. So traders preferred a more southern path, just along the fringes of the Taklamakan Desert. In the east, the end of the Silk Road was the Tang capital, Chang'an, most likely the richest city in the world at this time. Because of the natural disasters, nomadic invasions, and political struggles of the late Tang, Chang'an went into decline, along with the empire, and the Song never used it as the capital. 
During the Song, the Chinese also became more involved in sea trade. Indian Ocean trade had been dominated by those from the Indian subcontinent and the Middle East, but new technological innovations, like the compass and sternpost rudder, made the Chinese some of the foremost maritime traders in the world. Chinese ships traded the main exports of porcelain, silk, and tea, while importing cotton, stones, and exotic materials from the rest of Asia and beyond. A major port city developed, called Canton, home to over 100,000 merchants. An imperial commissioner was sent from the capital to regulate the trade here. The social structure of China also changed dramatically during the Chinese medieval period. Urban centers became more prominent and filled with artisans, merchants, and officials. In the countryside, instead of simply landed aristocracy and rural peasants, there were now also the landed gentry class and free farmers. The older aristocracy and elite classes declined as the civil service examinations attempted to level the playing field. Along with the devastating consequences of the Orne Lushan Rebellion, the aristocratic classes never recovered. The landed gentry ended up taking most of the official government positions, and replaced the aristocratic class as the political and economic elite. The upper classes in China were able to achieve a high standard of living, as China's golden age brought with it a cosmopolitan culture, through products and innovations from the Silk Road and maritime routes. A version of chess came in from India, along with foods the ancient Chinese could have never dreamed. Tea became part of the national culture, and was promoted by Buddhist monks as a way to focus the mind. The life of the average person though, was much less interesting. Most lived in small villages, and tended to their farms. Perhaps a short journey to another village for certain market products every now and then, but most lived a simple life. Families tended to be numerous, with three or more generations living together. Smaller family homes were made with dried mud or stone, and larger ones usually had courtyards. The head of the family was usually the oldest male, as in the ancient period. If his wife could not give him a son, he was allowed to take on a second wife. Wealthier men were able to have their wife, but also keep concubines in other rooms of the large house. If you recall the Confucian system from the ancient world, each family followed the concept of filial piety, which are moral norms, values, and respect for one's parents. Fathers could even choose their children's marriage partners. Women in general were lower on the social hierarchy because they were not as useful for intensive farm labor and were not permitted to take the civil service examinations. Because of this, female babies were sometimes killed or sold off to wealthier families. These girls often became concubines, domestic servants, or prostitutes when older. Though the Tang saw more women involved in politics, progress stopped under the Song, as they brought in a more strict view of Confucianism. Systems of dowry changed, from a man's family paying a woman's for the right of marriage, to the woman's family paying the man's family to take the bride. Many women were also subject to a very painful and debilitating practice. This was known as foot binding, and was a painful process involving breaking and then compressing a girl's foot until it is around half its size, using bandages. Feet that went through the process were called lotus feet, and these women had to wear special lotus shoes. Mothers would want their daughters to become bound, in order to get a better husband. A man would choose a footbound wife because it represents both discipline, as the process was long and painful, and submissiveness. It became common in northern China, but was less common in the fertile south, as women were more needed to help with cultivation. It was still practiced by the gentry class. In the urban centers, women were more prominent, where they were servers or owners of restaurants, textile outlets, and other small shops. Some would even take a liking to politics. In fact, the only recognized female of any dynasty to rule China was from this period. Her name was Wu Jiao, but would be known as Wu Zetian. She was a concubine to the Tang Emperor Taijung, and after his death, married his ninth son, Emperor Gaojun, in 655. 
She remained the de facto ruler until 690, when she seized the throne directly, and founded the Wu Zhou dynasty, ruling as empress until 705, before she was finally deposed in a coup. Her 40-year rule helped cement the Tang dynasty as a golden period, and she remains the only female sovereign in Chinese history. With the demise of the Song in 1279, the Yuan, under the Mongols, became the next imperial dynasty of China. We went over the fall of the Song, but what about the rise of the Mongols? During the mid-1100s, the Mongols were groups of various clans living in what is now Mongolia. They weren't unified, but shared their practices of nomadism and pastoralism. By the turn of the century, populations were increasing, their pastures, overgrazed, perhaps sped up by changing climate. The Mongol clans were in a state of distress, but a man came to save them and set them on a path to glory. His name was Temujin, son of Yasuke, chieftain of one of the Mongol clans. When Yasuke was killed, his family, including Temujin, was left abandoned in the cold wilderness. Once he grew older, he began to accrue more power. His goal now, to unite the Mongols and lead them, to greener pastures. When simple alliances failed, Temujin resorted to a more simple strategy. Temujin and his Mongol armies forcefully unified the clans, and he became sole ruler of the Mongols. In 1206, at a council of all the Mongol and Turkic chieftains, called the Kurultai, Temujin was named the great leader, the universal ruler, Genghis Khan. He ruled his people like a centralized state, by collecting taxes, and mandating conscription in the army. Though his army reached 240,000 at one point, it was usually only between 120 and 150,000 soldiers. Their expert mobility and tactical movements often made their armies look triple the size. With the Mongol horde by his side, Genghis then expanded towards the east, towards the societies that occupied the north of China. First was the Western Shah, which was made a vassal by 1211. They were an empire founded 200 years earlier, by a possible Tibeto-Burman people, called the Tangut. Next, he attacked the Jurchens of the Jin dynasty and the Karakitai, those Kitans who had fled west from the Jurchen. The army then invaded the Khwarezmian Empire in Iran. During his conquests in the east, the Mongol army noticed the enemy wielding a special weapon that could shoot flames and projectiles. This was the Fire Lance, which developed from the Tang and Song dynasties. A glimpse of a future era dominated by gunpowder. A Mongol expedition was also sent to the northwest, to subdue Europe. Alas, we'll never know if such an invasion could have succeeded, as in 1227, Genghis Khan died during a siege of the Western Shah, which had rebelled. Under his successors, invasions would continue in Asia, and would succeed in sacking Baghdad in 1258, capital of the Abbasid Caliphate. We've gone over this in our video about the Arab empires. Genghis Khan's successors as Kagan, or Emperor, were Ogaday, Guyuk, Monk, and then Kublai Khan, who attempted a full conquest of China. In 1271, Kublai Khan established the Yuan dynasty, and by 1279, defeated the last of the Southern Song. And with that, Kublai Khan became the first non-native to rule over all of China. The Mongols were pastoralists, migrating with their herds annually, in search of pastures and water. They lived in portable, felt-covered tents, called yurts, and relied on the milk and meat from their herds. How could this group of nomads administer one of the most advanced civilizations on Earth? When Genghis still lived, the fierce Khan had stopped his people from becoming sedentary, or living in permanent cities. But after his death, his successors became more adapted to the ways of their conquered territories. You can win the battle from the backs of a horde of horses, but to administer, is a different story entirely. Karakoram, which began as a village of Yurts in the center of Mongolia, became the empire's capital. The Yuan dynasty was just one of four different Khanates that emerged when the Mongol Empire became divided after the death of Monk Khan. The other three were the Golden Horde from the northwest, the Kipchaks and Cumans. 
the Shagatai Khanate, operated in Central Asia, around the same areas as the former Karakatai. The Ilkhanate, which we've mentioned in our Arab Empire's video, was based in Iran, and occupied territories in Western Asia, and parts of Anatolia. Back in China, Kublai Khan established himself as ruler of China, and moved the former Song capital from Kaifeng, further north, to Kanbalik. Today, this location is in Beijing. From China, the Yuan set their sights on further expansion. To the south, was Vietnam, a region that had been previously controlled by China, but regained independence after the Tang Empire's decline. They also launched campaigns onto the islands of Java and Sumatra, in Southeast Asia, and to Japan in the east. All of these campaigns of conquest failed. Dai Viet and Champa, pushed back the invasion, only becoming tributaries, and off the coast of Japan, the Mongol fleets were devastated by divine winds, called Kamikaze, and the invasion failed. The Mongol armies didn't seem all that invincible after all. In China, the Mongols quickly realized they needed to learn how to administer a vast, and more crucially, sedentary state. The easiest way to do this was by using the previous Chinese dynasty's governmental structure. What was new, was that the Mongols considered themselves a separate class, and as such, were governed by separate laws. The Chinese living in the north were accustomed to foreign rule, and the southern regions maintained their economic prosperity as the Mongols kept the Southern Song's economic policies. The empire brought stability along the Silk Road, and trade increased. The Grand Canal was also expanded, to head north from the Yellow River, to the capital. The capital grew to become a breathtaking city. The Italian merchant and explorer, Marco Polo, lived in the city for a while, while it was ruled by Kublai Khan. But over time, the Mongol way of life became a burden. Their failed expansionist campaigns, internal corruption, and low tax revenues led to financial ruin, and a prolonged decline. The final straw came in the 1340s, when a series of natural disasters led to a period of uprisings called the Red Turban Rebellions, beginning in 1351. By the late 1360s, the Yuan was defeated, and one of the leaders of the rebellion, Zhu Yuan Zhong, founded the new Ming Dynasty, and with it, a new period of prosperity. Though the Yuan Dynasty didn't keep power for long, it was a miracle they kept control for as long as they did. Though it wasn't even a century, the impact of the Mongols was felt for much longer. The Mongol conquests brought a general stabilizing force to Eurasia, promoting easy communication and commerce along the Silk Road. This was known as the Pax Mongolica, similar to the relative peace brought by the Pax Romana, during the Classical period. Still, it is unwise to forget the atrocities that came alongside conquest. It is estimated 11% of the world's population was wiped out at the hands of the Mongol hordes, around 40 to 60 million. As they were laying waste to Eastern Europe, launching dead bodies over city walls, some of these could have been infected with a deadly disease. This was the bubonic plague, the Black Death that decimated 75 to 200 million, one-third to one-half of Europe's population. A prevalent theory, is that diseased fleas living on black rats, were spread from Genoese trading ships escaping the siege, and reached ports all over the Mediterranean. Europe and parts of the Middle East were reeling, but in the East, the Ming led China out of the medieval period, and into a modern age. Under this native dynasty, they expanded and reinforced their older fortifications, to create a most awesome wonder of the world. This, was the Great Wall of China. During the early Ming, the emperor continued to rule through state Confucianism, and kept the institutions from the previous golden eras. Modified agrarian policies from the Han, governmental structure from the Tang, and the new manufacturing workshops from the Song. The Yongle Emperor, the third ruler of the Ming, reigned from 1402 to 1424. He moved the imperial capital from Nanjing in the south, to Beijing in the north, commissioning the construction of his palace complex, the Forbidden City. Just three years into his reign, he commissioned a voyage through the Strait of Malacca, and into the Indian Ocean. 
This was a treasure fleet, led by the eunuch Zheng He. These treasure ships were reportedly enormous, thought to hold hundreds of sailors on each floor. This voyage was made up of 62 of these ships, with a total of almost 28,000 men. Along with these ships, were a number of other companion vessels. Though China had always been a participant on the Silk Road, they were opening themselves to become the main participants in the Indian Ocean trade as well. Later expeditions reached as far as Arabia and the eastern coast of Africa. The purpose of the voyages can only be speculated, but it was most certainly done as a means of showcasing Chinese power for economic gain. The ships were heavily militarized, and would bring back foreign ambassadors who would declare their states as tributaries. Another purpose, was the emperor's curiosity for foreign products. After the fifth voyage, ambassadors brought in exotic animals like ostriches, zebras, and giraffes to the Ming court, a most magnificent scene in the east. While the voyages brought untold profits to Zheng He's associates, this didn't go over well with the other conservative elites, as the central state seemed to take control over what had previously been a maritime economy run by private interests. Some suggested the government go back to internal affairs and focus on domestic policy. Under Yongle Emperor's successors, Hongzhi Emperor and Xuanda Emperor, the expeditions were slowed down and suspended. Emphasis again moved from the international trade-filled maritime south, towards the north, around the Yellow River, the birthplace of Chinese civilization. Though Nanjing remained a southern capital, the imperial capital was to stay in Beijing almost consistently for centuries. A stone's throw from the Great Wall, the emperor was able to keep watch on China's most dangerous border. China would then turn inwards, and remain in isolation for hundreds of years, leaving the keys of the incoming age of discovery, to the west. By the time the Sui reunified China, Confucianism had to compete with both Buddhism and Taoism. We had discussed earlier, that these more esoteric belief systems became popular during times of upheaval, during times when it was believed Confucianism failed the natural order. Christianity had also been introduced around this time, by merchants from Syria, and Chang'an was even home to a church by the 500s. From the time Buddhism was introduced, it began to take a different shape than it had in India and Southeast Asia. It became Sinicized, becoming influenced by Chinese culture and Taoist beliefs, and split into a number of different branches. One of these was called Chan Buddhism, a school of Mahayana, and stress training the mind through meditation, as a path to enlightenment. In Japan, this was called Zen Buddhism. It became popular with intellectuals and ascetics. For the more common folk, Pulan Buddhism became popular. Instead of strict regimens, it was based only on devotion, and instead of enlightenment, the goal was to be reborn in a pure land, or Buddha field, a celestial realm where one can meet a Buddha, and train their spirit for eventual enlightenment. A more political sect of Pulan Buddhism branched off, called the White Lotus. They became a sort of secret society, responsible for uprisings and rebellions throughout Chinese history, and were instrumental in the Red Turban rebellions against the Yuan Empire. More esoteric and mystical branches of Buddhism flourished as well, like Tantrism. This path to enlightenment had more to do with mandalas, ritual poses, and yogic influences from India and Tibet. Because of Buddhism's popularity, it threatened Taoism and Confucianism, two of China's native ideologies. Buddhism was seen as foreign, but above all, corrupted. During the Tang period, as the aristocratic classes were losing power, Buddhist monasteries were amassing large amounts of wealth, and were tax-exempt. Resentment among the elite grew, and eventually there were periods of Buddhist persecution by the state. At its heart, Buddhism's teachings went against the Confucian system that had been in place and maintained order. A rigid structure of social hierarchies, filial piety, and work ethic, was undermined by the more intangible values of the Buddhist schools. While the state had supported the faith at different periods, it was to take a backseat to Confucianism. 
Confucianism was reinvigorated, and it brought back the emperor's legitimacy as the intermediary between heaven and earth, like in the ancient period. But it came back in a different form. During the Tang, Confucian scholars began to add metaphysical elements into their ideology. By the Song period, this belief system became known as Neo-Confucianism. This turned Confucianism more into a philosophy than a set of guidelines. It adopted metaphysical elements from Taoism and Buddhism, but still stressed a pragmatic participation in society, not monastic living. Zhu Xi integrated the Taoist concept of the Tao, or Wei, and the metaphysical aspects of Buddhism, with Confucianism, to create this new syncretic philosophy, adapted from earlier Tang scholars Han Yu and Liao. The ideology became so prominent that Neo-Confucianism would supplant its older version in government, and became the core of questions in the civil service examinations. But during the mid-Ming period, in the late medieval, Wang Yangming, a politician and philosopher, began to criticize Zhu Xi's teaching. He instead believed that knowledge came from within, and that one must rely on one's own intuition and insight to gain understanding and achieve moral perfection. This was called the school of the mind, as its basis was that the mind and universe are linked. Despite garnering many followers, the school of the mind never achieved official status because of its lack of emphasis on participation in family and governmental life. During China's medieval period, culture reached its highest point. It was a time of technological advancement and artistic achievement. While paper had been created during the Han, woodblock printing occurred during the Tang. It emerged in the 600s by engraving text into a block of wood. This wood was then inked and pressed onto paper. These papers were usually quite long and then folded together to form a sort of book. According to the British Library, the earliest printed book from here that we know of is a Buddhist text from 868, called the Diamond Sutra. Printed on it is a disclaimer that the book is for free and public distribution, making this not only the first printed book, but the first book explicitly in the public domain. Printing was meant to make the transmission of books cheaper, but they still remain too expensive for a lot of the population. After the Han, dynasties would write their own official dynastic histories of their predecessors, and encyclopedias became more prominent as a source of quick and easy information. Beyond history and information, this period was the height of Chinese literature, especially poetry. These poems were generally about the natural world, its beauty, and humankind's place in it all, through the laughter and sadness that attaches itself to everyone's life. Interestingly enough, the concept of romantic love seems not to have been as important as it was in Western or South Asian sources. Because of the nature of Chinese characters, poems tended to be quite short. With this brevity came mysteriousness. Li Bai is a famous poet from the Tang period, flourishing during the golden age of Chinese poetry. He was a Taoist and is known for his short poems about his life, the places he had visited, his friends, and carefree descriptions of nature. Some of his most well-known poems are Drinking Alone by the Moonlight and Waking from Drunkenness on a Spring Day. His younger friend, Du Fu, was a Confucian scholar official and was more grounded in his writings. His poems dealt with history and ethics. In the West, he came to be compared to Virgil or Shakespeare. The Onlushan Rebellion began while both Li Bai and Du Fu lived, but when the unrest ended, only Du Fu remained. Du Fu was the first diabetic mentioned in Chinese records and perished later in 770. Nightlife during the Song was quite exciting. While the Tang has often issued curfews, the Song allowed entertainment throughout the night. Musicians would play, wrestlers and acrobats would perform shows, and shadow plays and storytelling would excite the crowds. Perhaps the most influential novel to come out of China was written during the Yuan period. The Romance of the Three Kingdoms, first printed in 1321, tells the story, part historical, part romanticized fiction, 
of the fall of the Han and the aftermath during the period of the Three Kingdoms. It follows hundreds of characters, including peasants and feudal lords, until the year 280, when China was temporarily reunified during the Six Dynasties period. The novel is one of the four Chinese classics, along with Water Margin, Journey to the West, and The Plum in the Golden Vase. More visual art styles also flourished. Though beautiful and sophisticated painting styles were widespread during the Han period, these were mainly tomb paintings, and there are only a few examples. By the time of the Song and Yuan, paintings were more common and reached even higher levels of complexity. Like both philosophy and literature, Chinese art was inspired by Buddhism and Taoist elements, an example of this being the famous caves in western China near the Dunhuang Oasis. The caves contain stunning displays of Buddhist art, spanning 1,000 years of China's medieval period. They were first dug out in 366, as a palace for Buddhists to stop and meditate, and merchants who wished to rest and pray for safe travel. Once Islam came to dominate Central Asia by the time of the Yuan, the Silk Road went into decline, and by the time of the early Ming, it declined in favor of maritime routes. The caves and oasis became depopulated, and slowly abandoned. As Taoism was more ingrained in Chinese society though, it became an even greater influence in Chinese art. Chinese artists would often travel to the mountainside or forests in search of the Tao, either writing poetry or painting the majestic scenes they witnessed and became part of. Shan Shui is a traditional style of Chinese painting and means mountain water, symbolizing the hard and the soft, the balance which is found in nature, the yin and yang. Many Chinese painters were also writers, so these paintings frequently also have a small poem included. Chinese paintings often seem inherently different to contemporary Western ones, because of their focus on balance. Humans in nature are not the main focus, and are seen as small and even insignificant. They are a part of nature, not a master of it. Chinese paintings were often displayed on silk or a paper scroll. They could be up to 20 feet, or 6 meters long. To fully appreciate the art piece, you would start at the bottom, watching either a small village or a serene lake, and then scroll upwards to view the low hills, then majestic mountains, and heavenly skies. During the late Tang and early Song, paintings began to lose color, as artists preferred the contrast of black ink on white silk or paper. This style conveyed the art of calligraphy and brush strokes better. Some literati artists, adept at a multitude of different art styles, painted in a more secular fashion. Their paintings had no deeper meaning, no attempts to convey the Tao, just mere artistic expression. Another notable area of art, was porcelain. Porcelain was created in a kiln, baked from a clay mineral. These ceramics became popular during the Tang period, and flourished during the Song. Some of the most famous ceramics are Celadon pottery, notably from the Longxuan kiln. These were glazed with a jade color, and have also been called greenware. The most famous Chinese pottery by far though, is the blue and white pottery, often associated with Ming vases. This style actually originated during the Yuan. The pottery was decorated underneath the glaze with a blue pigment, often cobalt oxide, as it was able to withstand the high temperatures while baking. The style was imitated by Islamic cultures, Japan, and Europe, like this Delftware. The Ming's artistry would continue with the dynasty, into the early modern world. Japan, took a different path to China, because of its geography. The biggest difference, was that Japan consisted of islands, and lay to the Far East, at the very end, or very beginning, of the world. It is made up of four different islands. Hokkaido is the furthest north, while Hanshu is in the center and is the largest. Shikoku and Kyushu are smaller and lie to the south. It might not seem large, but this, is Japan superimposed over the eastern United States. 
Japan's climate is mostly temperate, and fertile plains to the east influence the development of cities. Some of the most populous are Tokyo, Kyoto, and Osaka. Fertile areas are so valuable here, as most of the islands are mountainous, and like China, only a small percentage is able to be used for farming. The mountains here are also volcanic, which increase soil fertility, but the tectonic plates make Japan prone to earthquakes and tsunamis. Because of Japan's relative isolation, they never felt threatened by the introduction of other cultures, because it was never forced, always voluntary. The Chinese never had this luxury, as they had to fend off invaders from the north for millennia, and had a meshing of cultures, whether they liked it or not. This distinctiveness of their culture, goes back to their origin myth. An ancient chronicle recorded in the 700s, tells of the formation of Japan, by the marriage of the god Izanagi, and the goddess Izanami. Izanami then gives birth to the sun goddess Amaterasu. One of Amaterasu's descendants, then falls to earth, and creates the Japanese civilization. Though emperors throughout Japanese history were never worshipped as gods themselves, they were believed to have descended from the sun goddess. The more historical story of the origins of the Japanese civilization are of course more mundane, but still fascinating nonetheless. The islands of Japan had been occupied for thousands of years after early human migrations, while the sea levels were low enough to walk over. Over time, by the late prehistoric period, a culture called the German emerged. This name comes from the cord-marked patterns on their pottery. Their main survival strategies were hunting, gathering, and fishing. They might also have developed small-scale agriculture. The German period lasted from around 14,000 BCE to around 300 BCE, the last period being called the Final German. It was around this point, that migrants from the Korean peninsula began arriving in Japan. These new arrivals introduced wet rice crops to Japan and the Jomon, although some historians claim the Jomon had already had the knowledge. This mix of people and knowledge led to a new period, called the Yayoi period, starting in 300 BCE. The Yayoi primarily lived on Kyushu at first, but slowly migrated northwards, onto Honshu, mixing with or driving out the Jomon, and those indigenous Japanese who would be known as the Ainu, who still live on the northern island of Hokkaido in the present day. Sources claim, that by the turn of the century, the Yayoi were led off their island in the south, by a divine warrior, Jimu, who would become the first Japanese emperor. There is no basis for the existence of an emperor Jimu, but the story might be based on real events and a real chieftain. Having settled on the Yamato Plain, Japan slowly shifted from a hunter-gatherer society, to an agrarian and militarized one. Once settled, the Yayoi set up a tribal social structure, based on clans, called Uji. The Uji were each ruled by a chieftain, who provided protection in exchange for an annual percentage of the harvest. There was a small aristocratic class, but the majority of the population were rice farmers, or small-scale artisans. At this point, Japan was still very decentralized, but those of the Yamato Plain had chosen chieftains who claimed to be descended from the Sun Goddess. Still, there was nothing like the centralized government seen in other ancient societies like China, or Egypt. By the late Yayoi period, Chinese sources tell of massive civil wars in Japan, which they called the Land of Wa. A precursor to the Yamato state, could have been ruled by a mysterious magical queen. Well, at least according to Chinese sources. Records from the 200s, tell of a kingdom called Yamatai Koku, ruled by a queen Himiko. It was said that she used her knowledge of spirit magic to seize the throne. She is not mentioned in any contemporaneous Japanese sources though, and remains semi-mythical. The rise of the Japanese state, began with the Yamato period, beginning around 300, consisting of the Kofun and Asuka periods. The Kofun is the earliest recorded period of Japanese history. The Yamato were just one of a number of Yayoi clans in Japan, but began dominating these other chieftains, and expanded to hold sway over most of the archipelago. 
The name of this period, Kofun, comes from the Japanese term for the megalithic tombs that were built. Many of these had distinctive keyhole-shaped mounds. The largest of these is the Daisen Ryo Kofun, thought to have been built for Emperor Nin Toku, the 16th Emperor of Japan. It is part of the Mozu tombs, in the Osaka prefecture. The later part of the Yamato period, the Asuka, saw more influence from the mainland, specifically China. This included the influence of Buddhism. It was first introduced in 538, from the Korean kingdom of Pekje, marking the start of a classical era. The period's name comes from Asuka, the capital city at the time. The Yamato state was still decentralized, and powerful clans often vied for influence over the emperor. Two of these powerful clans were the Mononobi and Soga clans. The Mononobi were Shinto, a religion we will touch on later in this video, while the Soga were devout Buddhists. Once the emperor died in 587, conflict erupted between these two clans. Prince Shotoku, of the Soga, led the pro-Soga army at the Battle of Mount Shigi, defeating the rival clan. The prince attributed his victory to Bishamontan, the Buddhist deity of war, and went on to build Buddhist temples throughout Japan. After the battle, the Soga clan became the influential force behind the next few emperors. Prince Shotoku, became regent, serving under Empress Suiko, and in the 600s, attempted to centralize the government, based on a model like that of China. Perhaps a unified Japan was finally a possibility. He established the 12 rank and cap system in government, in which officials wore silk caps with a colored feather denoting their rank, and the 17 article constitution, which, unlike modern constitutions, was targeted towards keeping court and government officials in line with Buddhist and Confucian morals and values. Prince Shotoku's main objective was to keep the government and nobility in check, while allowing the state to become more centralized through the emperor. Once Shotoku died, members of the Soga clan had begun to assert themselves more in imperial affairs, and so, a young courtier, a junior member of the Soga clan, and the young son of the empress, conspired in secret to assassinate the clan heads of the Soga. Though the attempt nearly failed, one of the heads was killed during a court ceremony, and once his father heard of his son's death, committed suicide by self-immolation, ending the influence of the Soga clan, for good. The assassination was known as the Ishii Incident. In 645, the new emperor, Kotaku, brought in an era of great reforms, called the Taika Reforms. The goals were to centralize more power, and keep control in the hands of the emperor and his court. Land was nationalized, and taxes regulated, civil service examinations adopted, and the absolute authority of the emperor was established. Envoys were sent to China, in order to improve the Japanese centralized structure. After the death of Prince Shotoku, and the decline in the influence of the Mononobi and Soga, a new clan began to come to prominence. This was the Fujiwara, who had been involved in plotting the Ishii incident, and married into positions of prominence. By 710, a new capital was built at Nara, beginning the next period of classical Japan. The city was modeled in the same style as the Tang capital of Chang'an. The biggest difference between the Japanese and Chinese rulers, was that the Japanese emperor was always considered as being descended from the sun goddess, but in China, he who ruled, only needed the mandate of heaven. Another major distinction, were the civil service examinations. Japan adopted these as well, but unlike China, which was a system theoretically based on merit, in Japan, only those of noble birth could take the exams. The Nara period also gives us the two oldest books written in Japan. The Kojiki and Nihon Shoki are the oldest most complete works, chronicling the fantastical and semi-mythical history of ancient Japan. The Nara period didn't even last 100 years, and by 794, the emperor moved the capital to nearby Heian location of present-day Kyoto, marking the final era in the Japanese classical age. The move was made to have a fresh start away from corruption and Buddhist influences. No Buddhist temples were allowed in the central part of the city. 
Japan was to stop the envoys to China and develop a flourishing culture of its own, apart from Chinese influence. While we mentioned the first known printed book last episode, Japan produced one of the first novels around year 1000, by Lady Murasaki. Living in the cultural fluorescence of the Heian period, she took to the Chinese classics, despite women traditionally being excluded from this learning. Women also seem to appear quite frequently with men in scroll paintings, giving the appearance of a more egalitarian society compared to other medieval cultures. By this time, the Fujiwara clan had amassed even more power, and a senior member of the clan was the de facto head of government. The move away from the China model brought with it a return to decentralization. Taxes imposed on rice fields failed, and powerful rural families held onto their own tax-exempt private properties, called shown. As the Heian government lost more power, local lords became the driving forces in society. To protect their properties, they began hiring private soldiers, and a new warrior class would emerge. The Samurai The Samurai were expected to have impartial loyalty for their lord. This was similar to the knight class in the European Middle Ages, a period we'll get to next episode, so be sure to subscribe. Instead of a bulky lance and shield though, the Samurai's favorite weapon was the sword. Though they had the choice of many sizes, the katana is the most well-known of these. Bows and arrows were also common. They lived their life by the way of the warrior, called Bushido. Japan became embroiled in destructive civil war, while in the distance, the tears of the kingdom, slowly mixed with the puddles of blood of the dead classical era. This was now the age of samurai. The Japanese feudal age was here. By 1185, Minamoto no Yuritomo, a powerful aristocrat from a warrior clan, defeated his rivals, and set up a power center on the Kamakura Peninsula, to the south of modern-day Tokyo. He created what was called a bakufu, or tent government, referring to the tents where his soldiers camped. The emperor declared Minamoto no Yuritomo the first shogun, a term denoting a general or military dictator. This new political system was called the shogunate system, in which the emperor ruled in name only, but it was the shogun who held true power. Through marriage to Minamoto no Yuritomo, the Hojo clan became regents of the Bakufu after his death. Though they were newly founded, they had a link to the past, as an offshoot of one of the major clans of the Heian period. The system worked well, as the shogunate also dealt with keeping smaller lords in check but they would soon come to face a menace that was unfamiliar. This was a threat that overran most of Asia, and conquered all of China. The Mongols were at the door. Check out our previous episode to see how the Mongols rose to prominence. In 1266, Kublai Khan, new emperor of the Mongols, commanded tribute from Japan, but they refused. The Mongols invaded in both 1274 and 1281 but the Japanese mobilized their entire military to fend them off. The first attempt saw the Mongols attack with up to 900 ships, but the gods acted as Wind Waker, and a monstrous typhoon destroyed the Mongol fleet. In the second attempt, the Mongols returned with even more men, some estimates as high as 140,000, the largest naval invasion in history at the time, but stayed afloat for months, searching for a place to land. And once again, the winds awoke from slumber. These divine winds, called Kamikaze, destroyed half the Mongol ships, and those who made it onto land, found the Japanese ready to take their weary souls. It was a decisive victory that ended the Mongol expansion in the east, and left Japan free of foreign invaders for centuries. Though the Kamakura shogunate defended Japan, the mobilization efforts put a financial strain on them and their phantom hourglass reached its end. Emperor Go-Daigo launched a rebellion, hoping to eliminate the Kamakura and restore centralized power to the imperial court. In the Genko War, a coalition of powerful clans overthrew the Kamakura, and after centuries, imperial power was finally restored. This was called the Kenmu Restoration. 
but it wasn't to last. Ashikaga Takorji, who was instrumental in the Kamakura's demise, wanted to be appointed new shogun, but the emperor refused. So Ashikaga rebelled, forcing the emperor to flee and set up another imperial court in the south, while a new emperor appointed Ashikaga shogun. The Ashikaga set up their own shogunate at the Muromachi district in Kyoto, but didn't hold much power at first. There was now a southern and northern court, each with an emperor, and landed aristocracy had amassed unprecedented power. Nobles were now called daimyo, meaning great names, and controlled large tracts of land, all tax exempt. The lands that had been nationalized, all reverted to become private. With the increased decentralization, the samurai became more important, and power fell to the clans with the best warriors. By the end of the medieval period, in the mid-1400s, a massive civil war broke out, brought on by controversy during a succession struggle in the Ashikaga shogunate. This conflict was known as the Onin War, or upheaval of Onin. For ten long years, this war between clans raged. By the end, in 1477, Kyoto lay almost entirely destroyed, the shogunate's power greatly diminished. With the military government's strength completely depleted, it was replaced by the breath of the wild, as the daimyo seized control over vast amounts of territory. This brought in a period of warring states, called Sengoku, similar to the period of decentralized warring states during the Zhou period in ancient China. During the upheaval, groups of peasant warriors from Iga province and nearby Koga district banded together to form an Iki, an alliance or confederacy of defense. There, on the plains nestled by secluded mountains, they trained in secret, refining an older technique which came to be known as ninjutsu. This style was based not on brute strength, but on subversion and spying. Soon, they would become paid agents of daimyo, called shinobi, and were used as mercenaries, primarily to spy. Terms differed for each region, but today we collectively call these, ninja. They obtained peak physical performance, which made it look like their feats were supernatural. The climbing of the wall, the sudden disappearances, and high endurance, made them seem magical. The blinding powder used in their escape, was called metsubishi, which was kept in an eggshell. A misconception, is that they were mainly expert assassins, and while they did administer poison and lurk in the shadows, their primary role was the gathering of information. Despite this, they trained extensively in the use of special weaponry like blow guns, kusarigama, and of course, the katana. Japan would remain locked in war for decades, and it wasn't until the next century, that Japan would start to become unified. Daily life in Japan remains somewhat a mystery, but one of the first descriptions comes from China, depicting it as an agrarian society based on the cultivation of wet rice. The rest of the Japanese peasants lived fairly normal lives, and changed very little. Most were farmers, but few of these owned the land they worked. Land was either the property of their local lords, or during times of more centralization, the state. Buddhist monasteries also came to control large swaths of land. Some peasants rose to become local officials, who organized the village labor and collected taxes for the lord or state. In exchange, these peasants would be tax-exempt. Most peasants gave these officials their grain as a tax, but sometimes they were unable to pay. Those who couldn't pay were dropped to the lowest rank, called genin, or low person. These, were landless laborers, and had to become household servants. Even below genin, were the eta, a class of hereditary slaves. They were considered untouchable, and lived in separate villages, working the jobs that were associated with defilement, like executioners, undertakers, and slaughterhouse workers. It's possible they could have been descended from a slave class, criminal class, or mountain folk. The Ata still exist in the present day, although the name is considered derogatory. Most of the Japanese population lived in small villages, usually in small houses of wood or mud, and their diet was mainly made up of rice, 
but also wild grasses, fish, and birds. While polygyny, the taking of more than one wife was common, with nobles having four or five wives, and even commoners with two or three, women were still regarded highly in Japanese society. Women were guaranteed inheritance rights, and wives could file for divorce and remarry under certain conditions. Japan also had numerous female emperors, both legendary and historical. Once Buddhism came to Japan, hierarchies became more highlighted, as women were not permitted to become monks unless their husbands died, nor to visit the holy sites. Some even interpreted the Buddhist doctrine as viewing women as inherently sinful, while others kept a more egalitarian view. It took time, but by the feudal period, women were eventually given the same rights as men to participate in Buddhist practices. Religion in Japan began with animist beliefs and the worship of spirits in the natural world. These spirits were called kami and were thought to live all around them, in tall trees, the rapid rivers, and majestic mountains. This belief system became known as Shinto, meaning the sacred way or way of the gods, and is still practiced in the present day. Though we don't have records of the origins of this religion, we know the kami was worshipped at least as far back as the Yayoi period. There is little importance placed on moral values or ethical standards, and more so stresses the importance and beauty of nature. Kami are worshipped both in private, at kamadana, household shrines, and in public, at more general jinja shrines. Over time, the early Japanese incorporated the beliefs into an official state doctrine, and a national shrine was built at Issei, where the emperor would go to pay tribute to the sun goddess, from whom he is descended. As in other societies, animist beliefs began to become incorporated with the religions that entered from other regions. In the case of the Japanese, it was Buddhism. By the Asuka period, in the 500s, Buddhism had entered Japan from the mainland, spreading among the nobility. By the 700s, it had spread to the majority of the population. Since Buddhism and the Shinto beliefs weren't mutually exclusive, the two were integrated, to create a mixed religion called Shinbutsu Shugo, meaning syncretism of Kami and Buddhas. It remained Japan's only organized religion until the late modern period. The two most popular Buddhist schools in Japan were of the Mahayana branch. The Pure Land sect, which we discussed in our last episode, was popular among the general population, because it only stressed devotion, and that devotion alone leads to enlightenment. The aristocracy instead followed Zen Buddhism. It emphasized self-restraint, meditation, and was less concerned with doctrine and sutras. Zen Buddhism became popular with the samurai class during the feudal age. For practitioners of Zen, enlightenment could be achieved through satori, a sudden inexpressible feeling of inner understanding, for example while listening to distant bamboo sticks or watching a beautiful event in nature. But many claimed enlightenment was only achieved through a rigorous regimen of zazen, meaning seated Zen. This is a long and arduous process of constant meditation, the complete cleansing of one's mind. While Japanese culture was initially influenced from the mainland, it never lost its own native elements. The early Japanese had no writing system of their own, but adopted the Chinese pictographic system early on. As the Japanese spoken language wasn't at all related to the Chinese family, that is, the Sino-Tibetan, they had to incorporate the Chinese characters in order to create a hybrid system, called kanji, which used borrowed Chinese characters with Japanese pronunciation. By the 800s, this writing style evolved to include hiragana and katakana. Early Japanese writers and members of the imperial court, at first preferred to write their poetry and essays in classical Chinese, but by the Heian period and beyond, Chinese influence waned, and Japanese culture came into its own. By the feudal period, Japanese court officials also lost their influence, and written works, like poetry, came from non-public officials. These intellectuals attempted to mimic the feelings of Zen in their poetry, describing natural scenes, and setting relaxing or somber moods. The most popular form of poetry among the aristocracy was Kanshi, the word means Han poetry, 
and remained popular during the end of the classical era. By the feudal age, a new type of poetry became highly regarded. It was short, and formed with exactly 17 syllables total, divided into lines of 5, 7, and 5. This was eventually called a haiku. Haikus generally have a kigo, a phrase that references the season, and a kireji, a specific category of word used in traditional poetry. They do not have to end after 17 syllables, and can be linked with other haikus by other poets, a collaborative work called a renga. Poetry was also used as a means of communication. Upper-class women were usually separated from males early on, and took to writing poetry. They were only allowed to talk to men from behind screens, so this poetry was often their only means of courtship. By the feudal and more militarized Kamakura period, literature evolved and focused on more warlike subjects. Instead of refined or courtly heroes, novels instead were about more common people, dealing with the battles around them, or the adventures of warriors, the highs and lows of the symphony of war. A type of theater also developed, taking elements from native traditions and others brought in from China. It has its origins in the early feudal period, but became a distinctive form of theater by the 1300s. These were dance-based dramatic plays called No, and were based on traditional Japanese literature, and usually involved supernatural elements. Masks were regularly used to depict deities, demons, and women, as they were not permitted to be performers until modern times. It is the oldest major theater art still performed today. Classical Japanese architecture was influenced by both Buddhism and Chinese styles from the Tang. During the Heian period, as Japan distanced itself from China, it developed its own culture, called Kokufu. One of its architectural styles was called Shindanzukuri. It featured a wide open structure, with sudare, traditional blinds or screens, and shitomi, lattice folding doors, which are hinged horizontally. By the Muromachi period, a newer architecture developed, influenced by Zen Buddhism, called Shonzukuri. Shoin means drawing room, or study. This style replaced the hinged doors with sliding panels, called fusuma. Flooring material was made up of tatami, a kind of mat. These rooms were meant to be empty, with no ornaments, just hidden shelves. Guests would be invited for tea ceremonies here, as part of a Zen ritual. Outdoors, gardens were modeled after the Chinese, and emphasized streams or ponds. The Kinkakuji, or Golden Pavilion in Kyoto, demonstrates a perfect union of traditional building architecture, the surrounding gardens, and flow of water. As tea ceremonies were an indoor expression of Zen, it was expressed outdoors with the art of arranging flowers, and bonsai, the art of growing and maintaining miniature trees. As we discussed last episode, scroll paintings, called hand scrolls, were popular in China. In Japan, they were given their own style. Initially, nature was the dominant theme, but during the Warring States period, art became more narrative, telling stories of warriors or priests, full of detailed expression. Japanese sculpture also tended to depict their generals and deities, like the Guardian Kings, in more warlike fashion. Japan became a shining example of how a mix of cultures can be used as an asset. But they weren't the only ones. China was ancient, China was big, and it touched many. Just to the west of Japan, was the second East Asian region in China's sphere. We now travel to, Korea. The Korean Peninsula, like China and Japan, was mountainous, and only around 20% was available for farming. Farming itself, was probably not introduced until around 2000 BCE, although hunting and gathering were still the preferred method of survival. Though not all academics agree, Korean scholars claim that the first major kingdom in Korea was the ancient Joseon, or Gojoseon. It was reportedly founded in 2333 BCE, by Tangun, the grandson of heaven, and son of a bear. Like Emperor Jimmu of Japan, it's possible the story of Tangun could have been based on a more historical chieftain or warrior. 
He is credited with bringing in the Bronze Age, and the beginnings of centralization and development. Archaeological evidence for the formation of Gojosun seems to point to a more recent time frame, around 700 BCE onwards, as an Iron Age society based around town alliances near the Taidong and Liao River basins. Further rulers and dynasties of Gojosun remain debated, but less disputed are the events around 108 BCE, when the northern regions came under the influence of the Han Dynasty, which put an end to the Gojosun Kingdom. This began a period of decentralization and warring states, similar to that of China. The Han had established four commanderies in the region, but three of these fell to Korean resistance. The Han fell in 220, as we had discussed in our Ancient World video, and the last commandery was destroyed by 313. In time, three main kingdoms emerged as hegemonic powers on the peninsula. Gaguryeo was in the north, Baekje in the southwest, and Shila in the southeast. This was the Three Kingdoms period in Korea. Though they were each founded earlier, they reached their peak during the 3 to 600s. Gaguryeo in the north, with its capital at Pyongyang, became the first to adopt Buddhism by the 300s. It prospered under Kwangeto the Great. Shila, nestled to the southeast, was not as immersed in the Chinese sphere, but as they were threatened by the massive Gaguryeo, they allied themselves, first with Pekche, an alliance that was broken, and then with Tang China. At the hands of the Tang and Shila alliance, Pekche and Gaguryeo were defeated by 668, but then, conflict erupted between the Chinese and Korean allies. By 676, the war ended, and the Tang kept much of the former Gaguryeo territory north of the peninsula, but Shila had expelled the Chinese, and took control of Korea up to the Taidong River. Needing to govern this newly unified state, the Shila adopted many of the systems of centralized government based on the Chinese. Buddhism, which came to Korea in the 300s, reaching Shila by the 500s, flourished once again and became the state religion. At the capital of Kyongju, art and architecture began to resemble the Chinese model as well, and written Chinese became the official written language. The aristocracy though, were wary of the civil service examinations and prevented their adoption, along with other reforms to help the lower classes. Not long after Shila was unified, another entity emerged to the north, in much of the former Gaguryeo territory, marking the northern and southern period. This was to be called the Balhae Kingdom. It was a multi-ethnic kingdom, mostly situated north of the peninsula, and composed of former Gaguryeo peoples, and the Moha. These were a Tunguzic people, native to Siberia and Northeast Asia, and some could have been ancestors to the Jurchen, and later Manchu. There remains controversy over the kingdom, as Korean scholars consider it predominantly Korean, like Shila to the south while China believes it was predominantly Moha, but under Tang rule. Russian scholars claim it was a Moha state, but independent of Korea and China. Whichever the case, Balhae was conquered in 926, by the Liao Empire of the Khitan. Shila, had difficulties of its own, as regional conflicts broke out in the former Pekche and Gaguryeo territories, leading to another period of disunity called the Later Three Kingdoms, beginning in 889. Shila had been in decline long prior to this, as policies that only favored the king led to resentment among the aristocracy, the landowners, and peasants. Shila began to lose territory and became the weakest of the Three Kingdoms. One of these kingdoms, later Gaguryeo, managed to defeat its rivals by 936, and even absorbed parts of the Balhae to the north. The new kingdom was named Goryeo, after its predecessor, and it was to be the first true unification of the entire Korean peninsula, and the start of stable dynastic rule for centuries. It not only unified the Gaguryeo, Pekche and Shila, but also the ruling classes of the Balhae in the north. It was from this kingdom, that the modern name of Korea was born. The Goryeo state implemented the civil service examinations in 958, although it did little to change the makeup of the governmental bureaucracy. Agriculture remained the main industry, and while all lands were owned by the king, they were run by local nobles. 
Like in other medieval societies, the farms were worked by the peasant classes. Below peasants on the social ladder were chornmen or vulgar commoners. These were made up of nobi, slaves which were used to serve the yangban or aristocracy and the bekjong or untouchables. These were those who worked professions that were deemed unclean, such as butchers, shaman, magicians, and prostitutes. The Goryeo era was considered a golden age for Buddhism. Pure Land and Zen Buddhism both became popular and came to control large tracts of land. The Goryeo Tripitaka, the sacred collection of Buddhist scripture, was carved into woodblock in the 1200s. It is the oldest intact version of Buddhist canon in Hanja script, the Korean writing system that uses Chinese characters. Though relatively small, Goryeo was often entangled in conflict with both the Kitan and Jurchen tribes to their west. But by the mid-1200s, it was the Mongols who successfully achieved victory in Korea, after years of attempts. Though the Goryeo were reduced to a tributary state to the Yuan for 80 years, they were noted for putting up more resistance than most of the other regions the Mongols had conquered, and remained semi-autonomous. The invasions brought untold destruction to Goryeo. The Huangnyangsa, an enormous Buddhist temple built 600 years earlier, was destroyed, along with the first version of the Goryeo Tripitaka. As the Mongol leader, Kublai Khan, set his sights on Japan next, he forced peasants and artisans to build the invasion fleet. Though the state of Goryeo continued to exist, unlike the Southern Song in China, the ruling class was forced into marriages with the Mongol leaders and their families. Once the Yuan began to decline in the mid-1300s, Goryeo fought to fend off the Red Turban rebellions which had originated in China, and pirates called the Wuko, vicious seafarers from Japan. Korea attempted to expand further and even proposed the ambitious act of invading Ming China. But in 1392, the general Yi Sung-ye overthrew the Goryeo dynasty in a coup. He founded a new state, called Joseon, and moved the capital to Hansung, present-day Seoul. Confucianism was adopted as the state ideology, resulting in the loss of power and wealth for Buddhist temples. Among the Sunbi, or scholar class, Neo-Confucianism became prominent. This class only grew, as this was a golden age for Korean academics and sciences. There were advances in printing, astronomy, military technology, medicine, and agriculture. One of the oldest surviving world maps from East Asia comes from here, called the Karnido. It depicts an early representation of the old world. The most notable ruler during the Joseon was Sejong the Great, who is responsible for creating Hangul, the Korean alphabet. He is regarded as one of the greatest rulers in Korean history. And as we leave the Chosun, which will continue to exist for another 500 years, we head to a land to the south, another region which had its own struggles with China. This is Vietnam. We've touched on southern Vietnam and the rest of Southeast Asia in an earlier episode. Today, we will focus on the north, as it was less involved with Indian culture, and more in the Chinese sphere of influence. This region had been occupied since the Paleolithic, and by around 1000 BCE, the first complex culture appeared, called the Dongsong, or Lark Viet. They appear to have been expert bronze casters, creating the Dongsong drums which are found widely throughout the region. Like Korea and Japan, Vietnam also has a semi-legendary early kingdom from which it claims descent. It was called the Hung Bang Dynasty, said to have been founded from 2879 BCE, but like Go Joseon, there is no evidence for such an early date. It's more likely the creation of the Vietnamese state wasn't so early, or so large. It could have developed around 700 BCE or later, in northern Vietnam, from the Lac Viet, a conglomeration of Kradai and Austroasiatic tribes. The kingdom itself was called Van Lang, and was the first historical Vietnamese state. Further north, the Aviet were a confederation of Bioa tribes, but in 258 BCE, Tuk Phan invaded the Lark Viet and created a newer and larger kingdom, called a Lark, consolidating the Lark Viet and Aviet tribes. 
The Baiyua were a conglomeration of many different tribes living all over southern China and the Red River Delta at this time. They were composed of Austroasiatics, Kra Dai, Hmong, and others. The Chinese just used this name to group them all as non Han. The Qin Dynasty of China conducted expansion campaigns to the south to subdue the Yua, but after the Qin fell, a Chinese general named Zhao Tuo declared independence in 204 BCE, creating the Kingdom of Nan Yua. But once the Han Empire emerged, they embarked on expansion campaigns of their own, first making Nan Yua a tribute state, and then fully conquering and annexing it in 111 BCE. This would become the first of four periods of northern domination in Vietnamese history. Rule under the Chinese was oppressive, and wheels of rebellion soon started to turn. An armed civil uprising began in 40 CE, led by Trung Trac and her sister, Trung Ni. The Trung sisters were initially successful and ruled China for three years before the Han armies regrouped and suppressed the rebellion. The Trung sisters were either killed or committed suicide. This led to the second and third period of northern domination, separated by the short-lived empire of Van Xian. Apart from this, Vietnam was continuously under the Chinese heel for 1,000 years. Because of the strong sense of nationality among the Vietnamese, the Chinese were forced to rule more directly. Aristocrats began to intermarry, and a new class of Sino-Vietnamese emerged. Chinese culture was slowly brought in, through the arts, literature, writing system, and Confucianism, as China tried to assimilate the Vietnamese population. Despite the cultural integration, the Vietnamese longed for sovereignty, and once the powerful Tang dynasty of China collapsed in the early 900s, the Vietnamese became more autonomous. After a period of civil war, Vietnam became fully independent, and established their own kingdom in 968 called Dai Viet. The name Dai Viet means Great Viet and reflects the ambition of the new dynasty to consolidate and expand the territory of Vietnam. As China had ruled over the region for such a long time, it was only natural that the rulers of Dai Viet integrate some of the Chinese model in their administration. As they were a river valley society, they needed stricter and more centralized government. Dai Viet succeeded more than Japan in their centralized governmental model. The king remained powerful, and the aristocratic classes held less power. Religion was initially based on earlier Vietnamese folk religion, called Duo Long. Over time though, with the influence of the Chinese, Buddhism, Confucianism and Taoism became more popular. Art and architecture was also greatly influenced by China. Some of the early historic constructions of the Dai Viet, like the One Pillar Pagoda, were based on Chinese styles. As in Japan and Korea, Vietnam wasn't bound by the traditions of its northern neighbor, and derived their own style. Though they used Chinese characters, they would adapt them to create a writing system for their own language, called Chu Nong. Similarly to China, those aiming for governmental positions could be from any class, just as long as they were male and would write the civil service examinations. The test was based on Confucian classics, as well as traditional Vietnamese stories. The life of the average Vietnamese peasant was different to that of Japan. Large private farms or properties were rare, as a means to keep the landed nobles in check. Most farmers owned their own small piece of land, or rented from another small farmer. Family life was also similar to China, but despite the Confucian hierarchies, women were more valued. They were able to initiate divorces and had the same property rights as men. Though Chinese domination subverted this to some extent, women were always viewed as more equal to men from a labor and legal standpoint compared to China. The ancient Vietnamese society was most likely matrilineal, and as the old adage goes, when the enemy is at the gate, the woman goes out fighting. Over the next many centuries, Dai Viet was engaged in numerous wars and conflicts, mostly from the north. On numerous occasions, the Mongols attempted to conquer both Dai Viet and Champa to the south, but the Vietnamese use of scorched earth was the perfect counter to the Mongolian armies. 
The decisive battle was fought on water, with General Tran Hung Dao predicting the enemy's movement and setting up booba traps for the Yuan ships. After losing the battle, Kublai Khan gave up his invasion of Southeast Asia. And it fittingly ended on the same river from where the Vietnamese gained independence from China over three centuries earlier. The Vietnamese came under the fourth and final period of northern domination in 1407, this time under the Ming. But unlike the previous eras, which lasted 1,000 years, Vietnam was free by 1427, just 20 years later. As population increased over the years, Dai Viet would have to expand southwards, to the territory of Champa. Champa was a state set up in 192, and was more in the Indian sphere of influence than the Chinese. Check out our previous video to see more of the Southeast Asian states. By 1471, Dai Viet went on to conquer Champa in the Cham Vietnamese War, unifying most of the coastline which makes up the present-day country of Vietnam. With their freedom from Chinese rule, came an even greater sense of unity, which would carry Dai Viet well into the early modern age, and beyond. Over in Europe, the sun sets on the Western Roman Empire. The last vestige of the Western Empire emerges as a rump state in northern Gaul, ruled by Roman general Syagrius. But this is a new age, and Europe is to be inherited by those Rome once regarded as barbarian. You don't need to watch our ancient world mega documentary, or our video on Rome, but we pick up where those left off. The Germanic peoples, which had been migrating deeper into Europe, began to set up their own kingdoms on the corpse of a fallen empire. Just a few decades after the last Western Roman emperor was deposed, these Germanic societies now ruled through their own kings, and over time, with a healthy dose of Roman culture shining through. To no surprise, this was especially the case, in Italy, where Germanic and Roman traditions fused more than anywhere else. Odoacer has deposed the last Roman emperor, and takes for himself a new title, King of Italy. But Odoacer's kingdom was not even 20 years old, when the Eastern Goths struck. The Ostrogoths set up their own Ostrogothic kingdom in Italy in 493, after killing Odoacer, and became inheritors of the city of Rome. Their first and greatest king, Theodoric, retained the old Roman system of laws for his Roman subjects, but his fellow Ostrogoths lived by their own rules and customs. In the 500s, the kingdom was conquered by the Eastern Roman Empire. We'll get to the Byzantine Empire in our next video, the last of our medieval world series, so be sure to subscribe. Another Germanic people moved into the region and conquered northern Italy by 568. They were the Lombards, or Langobards, and set up their own Lombard kingdom, which would endure for over 200 years. To the west, was another branch of the Goths. These were the Visigoths, or Western Goths. After sacking Rome back in 410, they ended up taking over Spain, establishing their Visigothic kingdom in 418. Like their eastern brethren in Italy, the Visigoths kept Roman institutions, but had separate laws for their own. Nestled between these European kingdoms, was perhaps the most powerful of them all. In the late 400s, Clovis I, was crowned king of the Franks, another Germanic society. He was the first of the Germanic kings to convert to Catholicism, or Chalcedonian Christianity, as opposed to the Arian sect, which believed the body of Jesus was human and not of God. Arianism was seen as heretical by the church, as it opposed the official stance that Jesus and God are of the same substance. While Clovis was initially interested in Arianism, adopting Catholicism gave him the support of the Church. By the early 500s, Clovis had defeated the Kingdom of Soissons in Gaul, conquered the Alemanni, and defeated the Visigoths at the Battle of Vouillé. The Kingdom of the Franks, or Francia, was the center of Europe. When Clovis died, Frankish custom was to divide the land between heirs. Over the decades, the Merovingian dynasty expanded to take over more of Western Europe, leaving Francia divided into different regions. The four major ones were Austrasia, the old Frankish homelands, Neustria, 
consisting of the former Gallo-Roman land, Aquitaine, a part of the Visigothic Kingdom, and Burgundy, former territory of the Burgundians, another Germanic society that had once been allied to the Franks. As time went on, society changed significantly from the time of the Romans. Germanic people intermarried with Romans from the former empire, but it was the Germanic social structure that dominated. Males were the heads of the household, and women would be responsible for domestic affairs, including some farm labor. Most women lived to only around 30 or 40. Under the old Roman law system, which is still similar to our own, crimes were treated as an affront against society as a collective, and were handled by the state. In Germanic law, crimes were more individualistic. If a crime was committed against someone, it could turn into a blood feud between families, often with gruesome and vengeful results, like chopping off hands or gouging out eyes. As this wasn't a sustainable system for the expanded Frankish territories, a newer alternative was adopted, called the Wehrgeld, which means, man price. In this system, the criminal simply had to repay the family which they had wronged. This sum of money could vary wildly, depending on if the victim's family was of noble birth. The most controversial aspect of Germanic law was the ordeal. This was a means of determining guilt or innocence. Usually, the suspect was placed in a situation that was either painful, unpleasant, or dangerous, and was based on the judgment of God. It was thought the gods would not allow an innocent person to be harmed, so if they were harmed or killed, then they must have been guilty. During the 300s, the Christian church had developed a deep bureaucracy of its own, and would come to dominate Europe heading into the early Middle Ages. Though it started small and had gone through periods of persecution, its adoption by the Roman Empire allowed it to thrive and develop into a system of both religious and political power. During the late Roman period, the empire was divided into different ecclesiastical districts, each called a diocese, with bishops as heads of the local Christian communities. They were collectively under the direction of an archbishop, who had jurisdiction over the larger ecclesiastical province. Catholic doctrine stated Peter was the most prominent and influential of the apostles, and that he was delegated by Jesus to rule over the entire church. Peter became the first bishop of Rome, and from then on, they would be known as popes, from the Greek word, papas, meaning father. By the early Middle Ages, the church had found a powerful ally in the Frankish kingdom, and worked to convert even more pagans. This was ironically done, through a movement of those who wished to be left alone. These were, the monks. The word monk is derived from the Latin word monicus, which means one who lives alone. Their goal was a life apart from the world, apart from family, to dedicate themselves to worship. This was a difficult life, so small communities soon grew, a movement called monasticism. Benedict of Nursia, an Italian monk, founded many of these communities near Rome and in the mountains of central Italy in 529. He later became known as Saint Benedict, and his order of monks became the Benedictine Order. Benedict created a set of rules for the monks, emphasizing not just prayer, but physical activity. It was a communal lifestyle, which allowed monks time alone to read and pray, but they would also gather to pray together several times a day, as well as eat and work. They also promoted bathing together as a therapeutic activity, and are thought to have played a role in the development of spas. They lived in a monastery, and these were headed by an abbot. He had authority over all the monks, and they were to be subservient to him. He could delegate work to his monks, as they needed to farm their own land for food. They were entirely self-sufficient, and did not need to travel to neighboring cities. They were to live by a vow of poverty, so there was really no need to leave their enclaves. Monastic life became the apex of Christian living in the early Middle Ages. Monasteries became places of aid in their communities. Travelers could rest their weary legs here, the sick could get help, and youngsters could get educated. Perhaps even more importantly, monks were responsible for preserving and copying many of the texts from the ancient world in the West, 
allowing these monasteries to become the new centers of knowledge. Soon, women would also form their own communities like the monks, becoming nuns. These were called convents. The head of a convent was called the abbess. They were usually from richer backgrounds, and were instrumental in the Christianization of Europe. Hilda of Whitby, founded the monastery at Whitby in the mid-600s, and was renowned for her wisdom, and conversion of Anglo-Saxon England. The spread of Christianity here was also due to the efforts of St. Augustine of Canterbury, a probable Italian monk who became the apostle to the English in the late 500s. St. Patrick was a Romano-British who conducted missions to Ireland, and St. Boniface, an Anglo-Saxon, helped to spread Christianity to the Germanic tribes on the continent. The church became a powerful political and cultural force, and monasteries played a key role in preserving and transmitting knowledge, including works of literature and philosophy. Back in the Frankish kingdom, the kings began losing control in the 600s and 700s, and power reverted to the local mayors. In 751, with the consent of the Roman church, the Merovingian dynasty was overthrown by Pepin the Short, who became the new Frankish king. He was the son of Charles Martel, the famous hammer that struck down and halted the Umayyad invasions at the Battle of Tours. With Pepin, the throne was now in the hands of a new dynasty, the Carolingians. One of Pepin's sons was a charismatic and deeply pious Christian who, like his grandfather, was named Charles. Because of his above-average height, he was known as Charles Magnus or Charlemagne. Though he only learned to read in his adulthood and never fully knew how to write, he was still a highly intelligent leader and military strategist. In a series of ambitious campaigns, he expanded the Frankish kingdom throughout continental Europe. One of these campaigns was into northern Italy, conquering the Lombards, and to the northeast, leading to the Saxon Wars, a 33-year struggle with the German pagans. Charlemagne destroyed their sacred immensal pillar, and in 782, ordered the killing of 4,500 Saxon nobles, in what has been called the Massacre of Verdun. He later forced the Saxons and their leader, Vidicund, to surrender and convert. Vidicund, whose name means Child of the Woods, later became a symbol of Saxon independence. In 800, on Christmas Day, the church named Charlemagne Emperor of the Romans and ruler of the Carolingian Empire. His empire was the first in Europe since the Romans, and it would be another 1,000 years before the continent saw another as large. Charlemagne administered his immense empire through counts, who acted as his representatives. To keep the counts in check, two envoys of the king, called a Mrs. Dominicus, were sent to the districts to make sure the counts acted in Charlemagne's best interest. They even had the power to depose the counts if they abused their positions. His empire was a fusion of Germanic, Christian, and Roman traditions bringing about a period of cultural and intellectual revival called the Carolingian Renaissance. After uniting much of the continent, he was later dubbed the Father of Europe, or Pater Europe. In 814, Charlemagne died, but what was to become of his empire? It went to Louis the Pious, his only surviving son with his second wife. Louis remained sole ruler of the Franks, extending the Carolingian Renaissance until he was deposed in the 830s. Civil war broke out between his sons, and by 843, the Treaty of Verdun divided the Frankish Empire into three kingdoms. It was the first of numerous partitions until 880. The easternmost of the kingdoms was called East Francia, under Louis the German. The westernmost kingdom was West Francia, under Charles II, or Charles the Bald, who might have been quite hairy. In between, was Middle Francia, a corridor containing what would become the Low Countries, the Rhineland, and reached south to northern Italy. Because the kingdoms were still rivals, Middle Francia often came under attack from its neighbors. But there were foreign foes as well. The 8 and 900s brought with it more invasions. From the east, most likely from Western Asia, or the steppes of Eastern Europe, a tribe came to settle on the Carpathian Basin, and sent waves of invasions into Western Europe. 
These were the Magyars, or Hungarians, a people with a mysterious past. Consensus is that they are non-Indo-European, with a language related to the Finnish, or Estonian, and originally migrated from the Ural Mountains during the Bronze Age. Their invasions into Western Europe came to an end at the Battle of Lechfeld in 955. The Magyars then converted to Christianity and established the Kingdom of Hungary in the year 1000. Britain saw waves of invasions itself. By the ancient period, the islands of Britain and Ireland had been inhabited by Celtic tribes. Separated from their continental cousins, they would be given the name Insular Celts. There were three main groups. The Britons occupied the majority of Britain, the Picts, or Caledonians, were in the north, the mountainous Scottish terrain, and the Gaels lived on Ireland and the Isle of Man. After the Romans came and went, they left behind a large group of Romanized Britons, or Romano-British. Raids from the north were common, by both the Picts, and a Gaelic group the Romans called the Scotti, who crossed over from Ireland. To further complicate matters, Germanic tribes from northern Germany and Denmark also arrived on the shores. They were the Angles, Saxons, and Jutes. The Saxons had been raiding Britain since Roman times, and the Romans even named their favorite attack shore after them. It's possible the Angles and Saxons were recruited as mercenaries, but it's more certain the expansion that came next was by force. One of the main defenders of the Britons against the Anglo-Saxons was Ambrosius Aurelianus, who could have been the inspiration for the story of King Arthur. Despite fighting valiantly, the Romano-British were displaced as the Anglo-Saxons set up their own kingdoms. Even worse invasions came from the east. These North Germanic people would savagely seek plunder and brutal warfare for the sake of an adventure. These were Norsemen, from the coldest reaches of Europe, in Scandinavia. They were more commonly known as, Vikings. Their dragon-headed ships allowed the Vikings to remain highly mobile on the seas, and their slim build was perfect to navigate inland on the tight European rivers. These long ships were built to be narrow raiding ships, carrying around 50 men each. In 793, Britain was shattered by a new invasion which would mark the start of the Viking Age. The holy island of Lindisfarne, in the Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Northumbria, was attacked. The abbey was destroyed, the monks slaughtered, the valuables, taken. These Vikings were known to show little mercy for the towns and villages they invaded. Churches would be burned, and the disjointed village armies easily defeated before larger armies could get there. Some Vikings even settled on the outer reaches of Scotland and Ireland, and mixed to create a new Norse Gael identity. Scottish clans like Clan MacDougall, Clan MacDonald, and Clan MacLeod have Norse Gaelic roots. After Lindisfarne, Danish Vikings who had been raiding France and Germany formed a great army and turned their attention on the English. By 878, most of the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms had fallen or surrendered. Only Wessex held out under Alfred the Great. He made an agreement with the invaders to divide the English lands between the Anglo-Saxon and Viking, a region that came to be known as Danelaw, as the Danish law was different than the Wessex or Mercian law. But in the end, the Anglo-Saxons reconquered most of the island from them. By the mid-900s, the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms were unified into a larger state, the Kingdom of the Angles, or England. Ethelstan of Wessex is generally regarded as the first true king of England. The Britons who were displaced moved either off the island or remained in the west, in Wales and Cornwall. In the north, the Picts had mysteriously vanished, most likely having merged with the Scottish. By the start of the High Middle Ages, the three main cultural divisions in Britain were the Anglo-Saxon English, the Britonic Welsh, and Gaelic Scottish. Back on the continent, the mid to late 800s saw West Francia besieged by Vikings, all the way to Paris, and the invaders were only appeased with what was called the Danegeld. In other words, payments to go away. In 911, 
Charles the Simple gave Rollo, the leader of the Viking raiders, a piece of land at the mouth of the Seine River, as well as his daughter's hand in marriage, in exchange for Rollo's conversion to Christianity. Rollo accepted, and reflecting his Norse origins, this territory would come to be known as Normandy, one of the most important duchies in Western Europe. Rollo and his band even held off other invaders from traveling down the Seine, and Paris remained safe. As the political powers in Europe at the time were so decentralized, they couldn't be expected, nor were they able, to protect the commoners. People would have to seek out their own protection, in the form of local lords. Once under their protection, you became their vassal, and pledged your service. With a weak central government, the lords and noblemen created their own personal, private armies in exchange for land. Frankish armies had usually just been foot soldiers, protected with mail and armed with a sword. But by the 700s, the Franks relied more on horsemen, after the adoption of the stirrup from the nomadic equestrians of the Asian steppes. Horsemen usually began as projectile units, throwing spears, but breeding larger horses led to a new class of fully armored fighter. These could be heavy armored cavalry, or as they are known to us, the fearsome knights. This was a word derived from boy, or servant. They could use the sword, but employed the deadly long lance, which could also be used as a kind of battering ram. Knights dominated European warfare for centuries, and were the highest class of fighter. Though they came to be depicted as heroes, there was little that separated them from the violent warlords in other parts of the world. Because trade and commerce were at a low point during the early Middle Ages, economy was mainly produced in the fields. These lands, known as fiefs, were owned by lords. It was held by his vassals in exchange for their military service, and these vassals held legal authority over the lands. This feudal system kept order during the tumultuous invasions and disintegration of the Carolingian Empire. There was even a further process that developed, called subinfeudation, in which a knight or vassal, acting as a lord themselves, recruited their own vassals for military service, granting them a smaller piece of land. Vassals didn't have to spend their whole time fighting for their lords. They were only mandated to serve a short time, around 40 days a year. They were also responsible for court appearances whenever summoned, and as aid in legal cases, as well as financial payments for weddings, or ransom. Apart from land, the lord was responsible for gathering the army to defend his vassal, and protect him legally if needed. Lords would live on their own landed estates, with plenty of farmland that was worked by peasants. This was called a manor. Many peasants, with no land of their own, became serfs, able to live on the manor, but needed to provide labor, and pay rent. Over half the population in Western Europe became serfs during this time, but the practice would later spread to Eastern Europe. Serfs were bound to their land, and could not leave without permission of the lord. They were also not allowed to marry outside the manor without permission. Legally, their rights were at the discretion of the lord as well, as lords could set up their own courts. The part of the manor that was used by the lord himself, was called the domain, or domain, and this piece of land could be between one-third and half of the entire manor. The early Middle Ages was a time of decentralization, but by year 1000, Europe emerged into a new great civilization, ushering in a new age. The High Middle Ages. New food surpluses, and the development of urban centers, brought an economic surge. Having recovered from the earlier invasions, centralized power started to return, in the form of medieval monarchs. The church continued to be a presence in everyday life as well. Warmer weather conditions increased food production, and populations doubled. More widespread use of iron in farming devices and building materials further advanced agricultural practices. The karuka was a heavy plow used in northern Europe, made of iron, and able to turn heavy soils. It could have required from four to eight oxen to function, 
and was likely introduced to the British Isles during the Viking invasions of England. Watermills and windmills also became more widespread, using nature's powerful currents to grind grain into flour. The usage of water and wind became the best methods of harnessing power, and would remain this way until the invention of the steam engine. During the early Middle Ages, farmers relied on a two-field system, where they would work one field, and let the other lie fallow, to regain its nutrients. During the High Middle Ages, a three-field system became common, where one field produced grains for one season, and the second had different grains for a different season. This reduced the unused field to just one-third instead of half. While not working the fields, the peasant classes lived simple lives in small cottages made of wood and clay, and thatched roofs of straw. Most only had a single room, but some oh-so-lucky peasants had an extra room, for cooking and eating. Men would be mainly responsible for the farming labor, but women would be required to participate during harvest season. Their main duties were smaller-scale gardening, religious training for their children, and spinning and weaving clothes for the family. Though serfs only had to work a few days a week for their lords, and were given numerous holidays per year, they spent their off time laboring for their own sustenance. Bread was their staple food, and contained wheat, rye, barley, millet, and oats, making it a high-calorie and quite nutritious food. If the family had other animals, they could supplement their bread with eggs, chicken, or cow's milk. While peasants remained near the bottom of the social hierarchy, at the other end, were the nobles, lords, and their vassals. Kings, dukes, counts, barons, viscounts, and religious organizations, controlled politics and society through their wealth and land holdings. By the middle of the High Middle Ages, a code emerged among knights and nobility, an ethical ideal promoted by the church. Knights were bound to act in a moral and civilized manner, protecting the church and peasants, and treating prisoners and women with respect, especially noblewomen. While the early Middle Ages saw a decline in trade and commerce, there was a resurgence in the High Middle Ages. There was always trade between the still prominent Byzantine Empire, and cities on the Italian peninsula. Venice, a city that emerged in the 700s, would become one of the foremost trading cities in Europe by the High Middle Ages, based upon their fleets of trading ships. These medieval merchants set up trading posts abroad, and specialized in trade in the Mediterranean and Black Sea. Once the Mongols spread throughout Asia in the 1200s, they brought a period of stability known as the Pax Mongolica, giving merchants safe passage through the empire. This was when two Venetian brothers, Maffio and Niccolo Polo, traveled through the Mongol Empire. Respectively, they were the uncle and father of explorer Marco Polo. The Italian cities would trade primarily along the Mediterranean, but northern Europe was resurgent as well. Flanders, along the coast of present-day Belgium, traded in woolen cloth and became a trading center in the north. It saw merchants from England, France, the German lands, and Scandinavia gather to buy and sell their wares. Brugge and Ghent became the main centers here. By the 1100s, the two trading hubs in Flanders and Italy had regular exchange with each other, linking northern and southern Europe's economies. Nobles in Champagne in northern France held annual fairs, where the merchants from northern Europe could meet and exchange their furs, woolen cloth, and tin, with the southern European merchants' wares from Italy, mainly silks and spices from Asia. As trade increased, gold and silver became more in demand, and eventually, banks were established to manage exchange, and trading companies emerged to manage the sale of goods. This brought about a commercial revolution, as new private businesses, incentivized by profit, were set up for insurance, commercial contracts, and bookkeeping. Commerce and industry became governed by these private entities. As smaller decentralized towns and villages dominated the early Middle Ages, the explosion of trade and increased population of the High Middle Ages led to a revival of urban centers and large cities. Cities below the Alps, closer to the former Imperial Roman core, were less affected, but decreased size nonetheless. 
merchants began to settle in these towns, along with artisans and other manufacturers who could sell their products through the nearby traders. Soon, the old Roman cities were bustling once more. Further north of the Alps, with fewer large cities, merchants had to set up shop near a protected space, usually a castle, but sometimes monasteries. Castles were where local lords resided, and emerged during the period of decentralization after the breakup of the Carolingian Empire, as a means to fortify the lord's position. Cities would slowly grow around these defensive castles. It is from here, that many cities get their suffix berg, as the word means fortification or fortress in Old German. Before castles emerged in England, the Anglo-Saxons relied on fortified settlements called burrs, often on the sites of old Roman hillforts. As these cities grew, the fortifications grew as well, and city walls expanded. The relationship between the lord and the merchant classes that made up the town, was very different than the relationship between the lord and serf on a manor. Those who lived in these burgs were called burghers, a word which would eventually turn into bourgeoisie. These people needed to be able to come and go as they pleased and needed their own unique laws. They paid the lord for the ability to live on his land and sell their properties, and the freedom from any military obligations. Some of these cities were even granted the right to govern themselves. But sometimes, they took the right, by force. In northern Italy, bishops acted as lords, and had their own vassals. But if the bishop became corrupt, or too authoritative, the townsfolk would swear an oath of allegiance to each other, and form an association called the commune, and self-administer. This succeeded, as the bishop's noble vassals took the side of the cityfolk and overthrew the bishops. They were able to become independent and create their own independent city-states. North of the Alps, communes weren't as successful, as the noble vassals were less prone to go against their lords, and any form of rebellion was suppressed. Even in the rare cases that the cities, called free cities, did succeed, they would never truly become independent, like the cities of Italy. This made these cities quite different from one another. They had varying degrees of autonomy, and different forms of government and council. Males were regarded as citizens, and could be elected to city council as city officials. The free cities never rivaled the size or populations of the busy urban centers of the ancient world, with the average trading city at only around 5,000 people. Bigger cities, like London, could have had around 30,000, and on the continent, Brugge and Ghent, the trading hubs of the north, had around 40,000. In Italy, urban centers were much larger, with trading hubs of Naples, Venice, Genoa, and Milan, all around 100,000 inhabitants. Though populations were so small in European medieval towns, life was noisy and cramped. Because the town was surrounded by protective walls, space inside needed to be filled, as wall expansion was quite expensive. This became a fire hazard, as most buildings were still made of wood. The cities were generally made of both artisans, who created a wide variety of products from cloth, metalworks, and much more, and the merchants who would sell these wares. The merchants and artisans each had their own areas in a city. The merchant section was where you would find the taverns, to drink to your merriment, and the inns, to rest thy tired legs. The artisan section was usually divided into areas with different crafts. Those performing the same crafts would band together to create a guild, and eventually guilds became widespread among the artisan class. The tight spaces and lack of sanitation system left these cities awfully dirty though. Animal and human waste could be found in between buildings, or in the streets. Nearby rivers were also polluted because of other industries, so townsfolk had to use wells instead. Thankfully, some cities had public baths. Paris, with a population of around 200,000, had dozens of public baths, open to both men and women, as long as you don't have leprosy. Women in these cities had their own roles. Apart from the domestic duties of preparing food and raising the children, they were also given the task of managing the family finances, and helping their husbands with their craft. 
Sometimes, these women would even have side hustles, like making ale. If their husbands died, they could easily continue with his work, as they had worked alongside him prior, and it gave them more independence. Despite some similarities across this new European culture, each region took different paths during the High Middle Ages, as strong monarchs across the continent attempted to establish more centralized kingdoms. The first place we'll travel to is Britain. After being unified in the early 900s, England would endure under the Anglo-Saxons, minus a brief period as part of the North Sea Empire, a personal union with Denmark and Norway, under Canute the Great. After the Anglo-Saxons regained the throne, Edward the Confessor, last king of the House of Wessex, died without an heir in 1066. The Wheaton, the Anglo-Saxon king's council, proclaimed Harold Godwin's son the new king, but he was opposed by two claimants to the throne. His own brother Tostig, who invited the Norwegian Harold Hardrada, were both defeated at the Battle of Stamford Bridge, on September 25th. But by September 28th, a new contender landed on the southern shore. Sailing from France, they were headed by yet another who claimed to be the righteous inheritor to the throne. This was William, Duke of Normandy, and direct descendant of Rollo. He brought with him an army of mounted knights, archers, and infantry. King Harold, weary from Stamford Bridge, had to march south quickly, mustering troops along the way, and met William at the Battle of Hastings, just two weeks later, on October 14. The Normans couldn't break Harold's lines, composed mainly of foot soldiers, so baited the enemy army by pretending to retreat. The ruse worked, and William gained the upper hand. Harold was killed in the battle, and his army defeated not long afterwards. He was to be the last Anglo-Saxon king. William, henceforth known as William the Conqueror, was crowned King of England on Christmas Day, and the royal residence was moved from Winchester to London. This marked the beginnings of the integration of Norman and Anglo-Saxon culture, with elements of Celtic, Gallo-Roman, and Germanic traditions. William's first order of business was to centralize the government. English nobles had to swear loyalty to the Norman king. Taxation and the royal court systems from the Anglo-Saxon period were strengthened. The Norman conquest brought with it further complications. Though William was the new king of England, he was still the Duke of Normandy and a vassal to the king of France. As France had a weaker government at this time, this made William more powerful than his own lord, and further meshed the affairs of England and France. After a civil war that dragged on from 1138 to 1153, another royal house from France, the Plantagenets, assumed the throne under King Henry II. These kings came from Anjou and would be known as the Angevin kings. Henry strengthened his authority by strengthening the royal courts. Local courts would be denied certain cases, which were instead placed under the king's authority. As the number of royal courts increased throughout the kingdom, this brought with it a standard of law, or common law. His holdings were vast, and at different points, held power over Wales and Ireland. On the continent, as the Count of Anjou and Duke of Normandy, he held those areas of France as well, along with Aquitaine through marriage. Collectively, this formed a dynastic union called the Angevin Empire, a nightmare for the French king, which resulted in 100 years of rivalry between the French Capetian royal house and the Plantagenets. Back in England, Henry had much more trouble exerting power over the church. An argument erupted between Henry and his friend Thomas Becket, whom he had just appointed Archbishop of Canterbury, the highest cleric in the Church of England. The controversy, known as the Becket Dispute, was mostly over whether royal courts had jurisdiction over clerics. This dragged on for years, with both sides appealing the Pope. In response to Becket excommunicating bishops who supported him, King Henry reportedly yelled out, Will no one rid me of this turbulent priest? This prompted four knights to travel from Normandy to Canterbury and murder Thomas Becket, just four days later. As the power of the monarch grew, resentment was brewing among the nobility. 
During the reign of King John, a group of barons forced the king to sign the Magna Carta Libertatum, or the Great Charter of Freedoms. This check on royal power, promised the protection of church rights, protection from illegal imprisonment, access to swift justice, and, most importantly, limitations on taxation and other feudal payments to the crown. Though it was a failure in the end, it set up the framework of rights between the monarch and his subjects, with legal recognition that the monarch's powers were absolutely not absolute. This trend would continue further into the High Middle Ages, with Edward I, son of Henry III, the longest reigning monarch in English history until the 20th century. Meetings in the king's court often occurred between his royal advisers and the barons, but in 1295, Edward invited representatives, two knights, and two town residents, called burgesses, from every county and town to a grand council. These parliaments discussed laws, taxes, and other political and judicial matters. And so, England was on the path to a more representative government. Edward's reign remains controversial though, as his edict expelled the Jews from England, and he led an invasion into Scotland, claiming sovereignty over it. This led to the First Scottish War of Independence, which saw the likes of William Wallace and Robert the Bruce become national Scottish heroes. On the continent, the forging of France would continue. After the Carolingian Empire had been divided up, it was West Francia that would become the main territory of what would become France. In 987, the last of the Carolingian dynasty perished without an heir, and the Western Franks chose a new king. He was Hugh Capet. The new kingdom of France would be ruled by this Capetian dynasty, the House of Capet and its cadet branches, the houses of Valois and Bourbon, uninterrupted until the monarchy was abolished during the French Revolution. But to start off, the Capetian kings had very little power. Though they were the lords of their vassals, including the kings of England through their holdings in western France, early Capetian kings only controlled Paris and a small territory around the city, collectively called Ile de France. A turning point came, during the reign of Philip II, who was given the epithet of Philip Augustus, because of his centralization and expansion campaigns. He declared war on the House of Plantagenet, and started taking back their French holdings on the continent. With his new domain, he collected more revenue, and hired more officials, strengthening his kingdom. Later French kings, like Louis IX, halted further English attempts to restore the Angevin Empire. A treaty was signed, where the English king relinquished his claims to most of his French territories, and remained a vassal to the French king for those lands he still held. The treaty was the start of a growing resentment and rivalry between the English and French, that would culminate in the late Middle Ages. Under Philip IV, called Philip the Fair, the monarchy was further reinforced. Philip did have a parliamentary process himself, although it was virtually powerless. It was a precursor to the Estates General, wherein he brought in representatives from the clergy, or First Estate, the nobles, the Second Estate, and townsfolk, the Third Estate. He transformed France from a feudal state into a centralized nation-state, the largest and richest in all of Europe. To the west, the early Middle Ages saw most of the Iberian Peninsula under the control of a number of different Muslim states, a region later called Al-Andalus by historians. But the Christian kingdoms to the north fought back. They began as a single kingdom called Asturias, and later the Kingdom of Leon. Other kingdoms coalesced, like Castile, Navarre, Aragon, and Portugal. In 1085, King Alfonso VI captured Toledo, and the balances of power started to sway. Cordoba fell later, to the King of Castile, and by 1249, only the Muslim holding of Granada remained. In 1492, the Emir of Granada, Mohammed XII, surrendered to Isabella of Castile, completing the Reconquest, or Reconquista. During the Reconquest, some Spanish rulers encouraged diversity, like King Alfonso X, who developed a cosmopolitan court full of Christians, Muslims, and Jews, and translated Arabic and Latin sources. 
Other rulers, though, were more harsh, and there were times of severe anti-Semitism, like the massacre of 1391. After the reconquest and the Alhambra decree, Jews were forced to convert or be expelled. The Muslims who remained in Spain were also forced to convert, and Islam was banned by the Queen. On the other side of France was East Francia. By the early 900s, Henry the Fowler was elected king, the kingdom's first non-Frankish ruler. By the mid-900s, his son, Otto, sat on the throne. Like his father, he was a Saxon, hailing from the northern duchy of Saxony. This continued a shift that would set it apart from West Francia, now known as the Kingdom of France, and towards becoming the region that would be known as, the Kingdom of Germany. The former Carolingian Empire was divided by this point, with the Kingdom of Italy partitioned off, but Otto set out and conquered northern Italy and became their king. After fending off the Magyar invasions, he was hailed as a hero of Christendom, and was proclaimed Emperor of the Romans in 962. Today, we call this, the Holy Roman Empire. At its greatest extent, this empire would consist of the Kingdom of Germany in the center, the Kingdom of Burgundy to the west, the Kingdom of Bohemia, a Czech kingdom to the east, and the Kingdom of Italy to the south, but each were governed by their own leaders. To the south of the Kingdom of Italy, in the central region of the peninsula, were the Papal States, former Lombard territory formerly given to Rome by Charlemagne. This made the popes much more involved, not just in spiritual, but political matters. Many high-ranked clergy, like bishops and monastery abbots, were often given fiefs by a lord, making them vassals. This soon presented a problem, as church leaders didn't want lords appointing their own nominees and investing them with church powers, a practice called lay investiture. In the 1070s, Pope Gregory VII fought back. He came up with the Gregorian reforms, and affirmed the primacy of the Pope and Papal States in all matters involving the Christian kingdoms and its rulers, including the power to depose an emperor. In essence, he forbade investiture from lay lords. This placed him at odds with the German king, Henry IV. Henry had used lay investiture to his benefit, appointing bishops of his choice as his vassals and using them as administrators in his territories. This would lead to a 50-year conflict between church and state, known as the Investiture Controversy. Henry had even appointed his own antipope to counter Pope Gregory. In 1122, the king's son, a new Holy Roman Emperor, Henry V, signed a written agreement with the new pope. The terms were that the church was to appoint abbots and bishops through canonical elections, and the Pope's representatives were to perform the investiture, symbolized through a ring and staff. The king in turn, was allowed to preside over elections, and arbitrate disputes. In the 11 and 1200s, the Hohenstaufen dynasty, most prominently under Frederick Barbarossa and Frederick II, attempted to exert their power on the Kingdom of Italy and Rome, in order to assemble a true Holy Roman Empire. But Germany was a decentralized state of duchies with their own interests, and the kings could not muster up sufficient armies. The northern Italian cities, backed by the Papal States, banded together, forming the Lombard League, and pushed back the German offensives. By the late 1100s, the northern Italian states won their right to self-government, but remained in the empire, simply paying a tax to the German king. The time and resources used by the Hohenstaufens in Italy only resulted in more weakening of their own dynasty. They had only lost power in Italy, and with little presence in Germany, the local lords were left to their own devices. The Holy Roman Emperors ended up not as rulers of an empire, but rulers of their own estates. Southern Italy was initially less involved with the affairs to the north. Bands of Normans had arrived as mercenaries during a period of warring principalities, and eventually conquered and founded their own states here by the mid-1000s. By the 1130s, Sicily and the southern part of Italy were united by Roger II into a single Norman state. This was the Kingdom of Sicily. Here, the Italo-Normans would build enormous palaces and castles, and secured them with fortifications and keeps. 
the kingdom passed to the German king, through marriage, and then the French, which proved deeply unpopular. After a revolt in 1282, the island of Sicily overthrew the French, but southern Italy remained united, and became known as the Kingdom of Naples. This stayed in the hands of French nobility until the 1440s, when it was united with Sicily under the crown of Aragon. It remained a cosmopolitan and tolerant kingdom, mixing strong influences of Arab, Byzantine and Latin culture. While the High Middle Ages was a time of strong government in both England and France, Germany and Italy would remain decentralized for centuries. Further to the east were the Slavs. Their homeland is still widely debated, but scholars generally agree they emerged in Polesia, near present-day Poland, Belarus, Ukraine, and Russia. During the early Middle Ages, they gradually began expanding and divided into three groups. Those who migrated west became the West Slavs. One of their first formal states was Great Moravia founded in 833, which acted as a balance of power between the Franks to the west and the Bulgarians and Byzantines to the south. When the king of Moravia needed aid in translating texts into Slavic, two brothers, Byzantine missionaries Cyril and Methodius, created and introduced the Glagolitic alphabet, the first Slavic alphabet. It was the basis for the later Cyrillic. By the High Middle Ages, the West Slavs had established the Polish and Bohemian kingdoms. The West Slavs make up Poles, Czechs, and Slovaks. The Western Slavs ended up being Christianized into the Western Church by German missionaries, and similar missions were also sent south into the Kingdom of Hungary, which was set up by the Magyars. These three groups, the Poles, Czechs, and Hungarians, all became entwined more with Latin culture and the Western Church. The Southern Slavs settled in the Balkans and formed their own states, the first of which was Bulgaria, formed by the Slavic tribes and the seminomadic Turkic Bulgars in 681. As the Bulgars became Slavicized, their kingdom played an important role in consolidating the Slavic civilization. The Southern Slavs also included Croats and Serbs, some would migrate further south and become Hellenized as part of the Byzantine Empire, an empire we will cover next episode. The southern Slavs generally all became part of the Eastern Church, except for the Croats. The Eastern Slavs moved east into the territory of present-day Ukraine and Western Russia. But soon after, Vikings from Sweden traveled down the long rivers in search of commerce. As they arrived, they would be called Rus, by the locals. In the 800s, a semi-legendary Varangian, a Viking conqueror from Sweden, named Rurik, was invited to rule in Novorod, which was to be the start of the Rurikid dynasty, and the beginnings of the Russian state monarchs. Oleg, who is said to be Rurik's kinsman, was his successor. He captured the city of Kiev from the Khazars to the south, and settled himself there, establishing the Kievan Rus. His successors greatly expanded this state and it became rich and powerful. Located between the Baltic and Black Sea, with Scandinavia to the north and the Byzantine Empire to the south, the region became a hotbed for trade. The territory came to include the East Slavs, as well as the local Finnic peoples. Through marriage to the Slavs, the Nordic rulers eventually assimilated into Slavic culture. As the Kievan Rus grew, Byzantine missionaries were sent to the Kievan Rus, and in 988, Vladimir the Great converted to the eastern branch of Christianity, along with his state, mixing Byzantine and Russian cultures. The Kievan Rus would later reach its greatest extent under Yaroslav I. After his death, Kievan Rus soon began to struggle and disintegrate into different regional factions, beginning a feudal period where the Grand Prince had little power. Novgorod in the north, broke away and declared independence, and later, the Duchy of Vladimir. Once the Byzantine Empire started to decline, they also lost their main source of commerce. In 1240, the Kievan Rus state finally disintegrated after the Mongols besieged Kiev. The city was plundered, and most of the citizens, slaughtered. One of the Russian princes, Alexander Nevsky, the Prince of Novgorod, was renowned for protecting the western borders from both German and Swedish invaders.
He became Grand Prince, and was not only a fierce warrior, but a skilled diplomat, who acted as an intermediary with the Golden Horde. By simply paying a tax to the invaders, he preserved Russian religion and independence. As Grand Prince, he built churches and created new laws, and Russia was in a period of prosperity. His son would found the Grand Duchy of Moscow, which began as a small outpost in Vladimir, but would eventually expand and lead to a long-lasting Russian state. What truly gave the High Middle Ages its name, was the resurgence of culture in its art and intellectualism. The university structure, a word derived from universitas, or the whole, developed as educational guilds, as a means to produce educated intellectuals. Though different kinds of universities appeared elsewhere in the world prior, the first European university was founded in 1088, at Bologna in Italy. There, Inerius, an Italian jurist, taught the newly rediscovered law code of Justinian, who lived 500 years prior. Students from all over Europe would come here to learn the Roman law, which would become the basis for the laws on the continent for centuries. They first needed to complete the starting curriculum of the liberal arts. The seven liberal arts taught were grammar, logic, rhetoric, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music theory. Because the printing press had yet to be developed, teaching was usually done via a single book, which a teacher would read aloud and then give an explanation. This was called a lecture, and remains a fundamental part of universities today. There were no regular exams however, and students only needed to pass an oral exam when applying for their degree. Their first degree was the Bachelors of Arts, awarded after three or four years, but they could pursue a Master of Arts, with the entire process reaching six years. After attaining a Masters of Arts degree, a student could continue into higher learning, specializing in law, medicine, or theology. Finishing one of these, provided a doctorate degree, which officially allowed them to teach their subjects. Despite law and medicine degrees being important, the most popular doctorate degree was theology. It was viewed as the most pure and intellectual of the sciences in medieval universities. These institutions only increased, and by the end of the Middle Ages, Europe was home to about 80 different universities. Many of the classical Greek works were reintroduced to the West by Jewish and Islamic scholars, and translated by monks at monastic schools. When Western theologians saw many of these texts, they were at odds and even contradicted the Church. One Dominican monk, Thomas Aquinas, was the most influential leader in the reconciliation. This was done through scholasticism, a philosophy which attempted to harmonize the old works of the early empirical scientists and philosophers, namely Aristotle, with the Catholic doctrine. His Summa Theologica was a compendium of all the main theological teachings of the Catholic Church, and presented the reasoning for all points of Christian theology. He is considered one of the Church's greatest theologians and philosophers, and his synthesis of faith and reason became the new standard. At the start of the High Middle Ages, architecture was based on a style characterized by semicircular arches. This was called the Romanesque style. This kind of architecture was found all over Europe. Though many castles were built during this period, the style, which took influence from the ancient Roman and Greek, was mainly used in churches. Basilicas, known for flat wooden roofs prone to fire, were instead made with a long stone barrel vault. Though they were safer and more aesthetically pleasing, they were quite heavy, so needed massive pillars and thick stone walls to hold it up. This meant less space for windows, and gave Romanesque churches a darker atmosphere, but they are known for their high quality, and many still stand today in more rural areas. But by the 1100s, a newer architectural style emerged in Europe. This style, originating in northern France, evolved from the Romanesque, and came to be known as Gothic. The defining feature was the pointed arch. Instead of barrel vaults, builders used rib vaults along with the pointed arches, resulting in cathedrals that could seemingly soar into the heavens themselves. The flying buttress was another innovation, which spread the weight outwards, instead of straight down. 
This resulted in thinner, more appealing walls, which could be used to place fantastical stained glass windows, a total change from the Romanesque style. Light from these colorful windows was thought to be a symbol of God's light and his divinity. The first full use of Gothic architecture comes from the Abbey at Saint Denis, near Paris, in the mid-1100s. From there, it spread, and was used in construction of the great French cathedrals, like Notre Dame. A cathedral was a special church that held a cathedra, a seat or throne for the local bishop. Building a Gothic cathedral was a community effort, headed by master masons who designed it, and stonemasons and other craftsmen who made the stunning designs a reality. Now that we've gone through the various European regions, we will take a look at a unifying theme between them, that of Christianity. It touched kings, queens, nobles, and commoners, becoming the framework of European culture. In 1054, because of ecclesiastical, theological, and even political differences between the Latin West and Eastern Greek churches, they officially split, into the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches, in what is called the Great Schism. The High Middle Ages saw a surge in Christian belief systems, and the development of numerous religious orders, both monastic and military. The most influential monastic order was the Order of Cistercians, a group in France that branched off from the earlier Benedictine order. While they continued to follow the rules of Saint Benedict, they were much more strict than the Benedictine monks, and more so followed the order's co-founder, Bernard de Clairvaux. Instead of the black cowl, they donned white ones, and only owned a single robe. They spent less time for services, and more for their manual labor working the fields. Within just 100 years, the order had spread all throughout Europe. Women also came to join these religious orders, as nuns. Instead of child-rearing, women in convents were free to pursue their own intellectual pursuits if they so wished. In the early 1200s, St. Francis of Assisi, an Italian mystic and Catholic friar, began publicly preaching about repentance and a return to simplicity for the Church. His movement became the Franciscan Order, and was quite popular, as it touched the ordinary townsperson. Those who joined the Order took a vow of poverty, and traveled far distances in order to preach. Around the same time, a similar order was founded by Spanish priest and mystic, Dominic de Guzman. This was the Dominican Order. They were also required to live a life of poverty and to travel to urban areas to preach, but Dominicans were just as concerned with opposing heresy and any ideas contrary to official church doctrine. To do this, they engaged in a rich scholastic tradition which became the forefront of intellectual life in all Europe. At the end of the medieval period, they would become leading figures in the Spanish Inquisition, but there were medieval inquisitions as well. Both the Dominicans and Franciscans were widely involved with the medieval inquisitions of the 1200s, and the ongoing opposition to heresy that continued for centuries. The religious military orders were societies of Christian knights. They were founded in association with the Crusades, a series of religious wars, primarily in the Levant, but also on the European continent. There was already widespread conflict in Iberia in Al-Andalus, and battles against Muslim armies on the Mediterranean and Sicily, but the Crusades would mark a more organized and collective European effort, initially against another Muslim army that came to occupy territory from Anatolia in the west, to the Hindu Kush in the east. These were, the Seljuk Turks. After the Eastern Roman Empire suffered defeat at the Battle of Manzikert, it weakened their grip on Anatolia, and led to Turkic settlement on the peninsula, and the establishment of the Sultanate of Rum. The Seljuks had also taken the holy city of Jerusalem, so Eastern Roman Emperor, Alexius I, asked Pope Urban II, for assistance. Seeing an opportunity to unite the warring Christian kingdoms of Europe to face a common enemy, Pope Urban called for a holy war, or crusade, at the Council of Clermont in 1095. This was to be a simple pilgrimage, but these pilgrims, came with swords. After the Pope promised remission of sins for anyone who partook in the crusade and died, the fervor reached even the poor, who had very little in this life. 
Peter the Hermit, was a pious man who preached in public on the streets of France. He gathered others like him, the paupers of society, and in 1096, they made their way east, in what has been called the People's Crusade. There had been a comet sighting, meteor shower, and lunar eclipse in the year leading up to the march, so these were probably taken as a sign from God. As the peasants, which numbered in the tens of thousands, moved east, they terrorized the non-Christian populations of the Rhineland, leading to the massacre of thousands of Jewish men, women, and children. Some of Peter the Hermit's band actually reached Constantinople and were given safe passage across to Anatolia. But that's where the poorly armed rabble was subsequently slaughtered by the Turks. Peter the Hermit ironically survived though, as he was visiting Constantinople at the time. This failed people's crusade wasn't backed by any official power, but the first official crusade took place soon after, and was led by trained fighters and noble men of war. Most of the army, numbering around 100,000, was French, but smaller armies from Christian Europe also joined. Along the way, the armies recaptured Nicaea from the Seljuks, and then marched down into the Levant, and captured Jerusalem in 1099. After taking the city, and the mass killing of Jews and Muslims alike, the Crusaders founded states of their own, much to the dismay of the Byzantine Emperor. This crusade was Europe's first major victory abroad, but certainly not the last. As the Crusader states were blocked off on all sides by hostile forces, they traded over the Mediterranean, leading to the Italian cities, like Genoa and Venice, becoming quite rich and powerful as masters of maritime commerce. Decades later, in 1144, the county of Edessa fell, and calls rang out, for a second crusade. This one, was headed by actual kings, with French King Louis VII, husband of Eleanor of Aquitaine, and Conrad III, the German king, leading the charge. An ill-advised attack on Damascus ruined any chances of success, and the crusade ended in defeat. On their way though, crusaders did manage to help in the reconquest effort on the Iberian Peninsula, helping the Portuguese capture Lisbon. After the rise of Saladin and fall of the Kingdom of Jerusalem, Europe felt compelled to undertake a third crusade. This crusade was to be led by three notable kings, so is dubbed the King's Crusade. From England was Henry II, but after his death, his son with Eleanor of Aquitaine took up the mantle. He was King Richard I. Le Coeur de Lyon. Richard the Lionheart. From France, was the bane of the English, Philip II. England and France set aside their rivalry for this crusade. From Germany, with the largest army, was the elderly Holy Roman Emperor, Frederick Barbarossa. They made the trek by land, but Frederick was never to see his destination. In Anatolia, he drowned in a river, and most of his grieving army abandoned the crusade. The French and English armies made their way by sea, and with an impressive fleet, made quick inroads into the Levant. They recaptured Acre and Jaffa, and though they succeeded militarily, they never recaptured Jerusalem, the main goal of the campaign. Once King Philip returned home in 1191, King Richard and Saladin signed a treaty, leaving Jerusalem in Muslim hands but open to free passage for unarmed pilgrims. In return, the Crusaders could keep the coastal strip from Tyre to Jaffa, in effect restoring the Crusader states. Still, neither side was happy with this outcome. Once Saladin died in 1193, and Richard in 1199, Pope Innocent III fanned the flames of Crusade once again, and in 1202, Christian forces would head out to the Holy Land from the ports of Venice. This wasn't a king's crusade like the third, but mostly composed of French nobility. At the suggestion of some Venetian captains as payment for safe travel, the crusade ended up going wayward, and became embroiled in a succession plot in Constantinople. The crusaders eventually sacked the city, and in 1204, set up their own empire in former Byzantine territory, calling it the Latin Empire. The Byzantines only survived as three separate rump states, each claiming to be the empire's true successor. Though the Byzantines reclaimed their cities by 1261, 
the attack not only cemented the rift between the Latin and Orthodox churches, but led to the Eastern Empire's steep decline. The subsequent Crusades are generally regarded as less important. During the Fifth Crusade, Europeans changed their strategy, and instead targeted Egypt first, which was still ruled by Saladin's brother. The Crusaders ultimately failed to reach Cairo though, and a truce was called. The Sixth Crusade was headed solely by King Frederick II of the Holy Roman Empire, without papal involvement. While he lacked the manpower to retake Jerusalem, he succeeded in his quest through diplomacy. Two decades later, the French king, Louis IX, conducted two crusades of his own in response to the Muslim retaking of the Holy City. The Seventh Crusade saw his army meet disaster, and King Louis was taken captive. After he was released, he refused to give up his campaigning, and launched the Eighth Crusade, but shortly after arriving in North Africa, he died of dysentery. After Germany and France, England had their go in 1271, in the Ninth Crusade. This was led by Lord Edward, the Duke of Gascony, and by this time, it wasn't Saladin's Ayyubids who controlled the region, but the Mamluk Sultanate under Baybars. Though both sides saw success, it was the Crusaders who lacked the final blow, and a truce was called. Lord Edward returned home, and eventually became Edward I, King of England, who we mentioned before as Edward Longshanks. During this time, the Mamluks besieged the remaining Crusader states, and they were captured one by one, until 1291, when Acre, the capital of the Kingdom of Jerusalem fell. It was here, that 200 years of Crusader states, came to an end. The Levant was to remain in Mamluk hands for the time being. The Knights Hospitaller, originated from a reform movement in the Benedictine monastic order. They were originally formed to provide medical aid to Christian pilgrims in the Holy Land, but soon became more militaristic after the First Crusade. They eventually came to run most hospitals in the region, and built them all over Europe as well. After the Crusades, the Knights fled to Rhodes, and then Malta, and even partook in the voyages to the New World briefly acquiring four islands in the Caribbean. The Knights Templar was the most famous and influential of the military orders. Known for their distinctive red cross on white mantle, they were founded in 1119, in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount, with the goal of defending Christian pilgrimage to the sacred sites. Though they struggled at first, they had an advocate in Bernard de Clairvaux and became officially approved as a religious order in 1129. Though only 10% were knights, many of their members took to banking, creating a large economic infrastructure that linked the Levant and Europe. Despite their monastic vows, they became the wealthiest of the military orders, owning land and castles throughout the Crusader states. There were many other more minor crusades to the Holy Land, but also many major ones on the continent as well. One of the most prominent of these, were the Northern Crusades. The Northern Crusades were mainly headed by the Teutonic Order, known as the Teutonic Knights. They were originally founded from a German fraternity, active during the Third Crusade in 1191. After the unsuccessful crusade, they turned their attention towards Europe, setting up base in the north after conquering the Old Prussians, a Baltic people with a common link to the Slavs. Further east, were another pagan Baltic people, the Lithuanians. To better defend themselves from the Teutons on one side, and the Eastern Slavs to the other, they coalesced into a state in 1251. In 1386, the Grand Duke of Lithuania, Eugalia, formed a dynastic union with Poland by marrying Queen Jadwiga, and converting his state to Christianity. In 1410, Lithuania and Poland defeated the Teutonic Knights at the Battle of Grunwald, after which the Northern Crusaders went into decline. Though there was tension between the nobility at first, Poland and Lithuania would become inextricably linked at the start of the next age. By the beginning of the 1300s, Europe entered a new era of decline and catastrophe, ushering in the late Middle Ages. Changes in climate, brought colder weather, darkened skies, and frigid rains, from constant storms. 
This was known as the Little Ice Age, and led to widespread famine. The Great Famine of 1315-17, which brought with it extreme increases in crime, mass death, and perhaps even cannibalism, was but the first crisis of this tumultuous period. By the middle of the century, another threat was looming. It would attack through seaports and trade routes, yet showed no sword, and shot no arrow. This was a disease that would turn into the most fatal recorded pandemic in human history. This was called the Black Death, and was responsible for killing up to half of the population in Eurasia and the Mediterranean Basin. This was caused by bubonic plague, which found a host in fleas. The fleas themselves spread from the backs of black rats. Its origins are still disputed, but it most likely entered China via the Mongols, and by the 1330s, it had already spread rapidly, reducing the Chinese population by tens of millions. The safe and efficient trading networks established by the Pax Mongolica helped this disease transmit westwards. Commerce would stop at Constantinople in the west, and by 1347, the city was ravaged. By 1348, it had spread all over the Near East. Egypt's population was so devastated that it did not reach its pre-plague levels for another 600 years. In Europe, the Black Death most likely entered through the east. The Golden Horde hurled disease-infested corpses over the walls during the Siege of Kaffa. This city was a trading center for Genoese merchants, so when these merchants fled, they returned to Italy, bringing the plague with them on their ships. It had spread to southern Italy and France by the end of the year, perhaps the pneumonic version of the plague, which spread through the air. More recently, it has been theorized that the main crux of spread wasn't through rats, but instead through the lice and fleas living on humans. The tight urban centers of France and Italy often neglected personal hygiene, and were known for having filthy streets. Some were even named as such, like Rue Mergier and Ruelle de Pipi. In just four years, the entirety of Europe was affected. A few areas remained little affected though, as they had less trade relations and remained more isolated, like the Basques, a people thought to predate the Indo-European migrations to the continent. In total, Europe might have lost up to 38 million people in just four or five years, half of its population. This brought with it, extreme societal, political, and religious instability. Some, felt the plague was sent by God in order to punish society for its sins. One self-mutilating band, roamed from town to town where the plague hit hardest, flogging themselves with whips, begging their vengeful deity for forgiveness. They were known as the flagellants, and would come to cause chaos wherever they went. Once they started attacking Jews and members of the clergy, the Pope condemned the movement, and it soon fizzled out by 1351. The flagellants weren't the only source of anti-Semitism. It was on the rise all over Europe. In Germany, dozens of major Jewish communities were destroyed, and many fled east to Russia and Poland, where they were given more protections. The plague also caused economic instability. With around half the population snapped out of existence within such a short time, the great medieval industries couldn't adapt, and production fell by more than half. This ended up benefiting the lower classes. With less workers, the value of labor rose dramatically. Food prices also fell as there was less demand. More peasants were able to work their way out of serfdom. Monarchs, however, felt emboldened to impose higher taxes. In England, the king needed to generate more revenue for a military campaign, so imposed a poll tax, a flat tax per individual. Peasants refused to pay this tax, and in 1381, they revolted. Beginning in Essex, the upheaval soon spread, leading to mass executions of government officials, and the sacking of the Tower of London. Though King Richard II suppressed the peasant revolt and had the leaders executed, the poll tax was eventually discontinued. Though the impact of the peasant uprising is still debated, it opened the door to a period of more populist uprisings, where the poor could also be heard. 
the tax system was initially put in place to raise revenues for a military campaign. This was a war that began almost 50 years earlier, in 1337, and pit England and France against each other for over a century. This was the Hundred Years' War and further added to the extreme crisis of the late Middle Ages. The conflict was the culmination of the rivalry between France and England, who had become inextricably linked to France through their Norman and Angevin kings. Once a trio of Capetian kings failed to produce a male heir, there was a succession crisis. King Edward III of England had a legitimate claim to the throne as grandson of a former French king. But in the end, they chose Philip, the Count of Valois, to become King Philip VI in 1328. He was the first king from the House of Valois, a cadet branch of the Capetians. After years of failed negotiations and an escalation of conflict, Philip confiscated the Duchy of Gascony, the only remaining English holding in France. For Edward, this meant war. The fearsome French armies were generally composed of high-ranking and heavily armoured knights and nobles. The English relied more on infantrymen and foot soldiers. Their deadliest weapon was the longbow, most likely adopted from the Welsh. The Hundred Years' War began in 1337, with minor skirmishes and naval battles, but the first major engagement was in 1346 at Cressy, near Flanders. Edward and his eldest son, Edward the Black Prince, scored resounding success against the more numerous French cavalry. After a short pause caused by the Black Death, fighting again resumed in the 1350s, and the English army scored another resounding victory at Poitiers, capturing the new French king, John II, and holding him for ransom. In 1360, both kings signed the Treaty of Bretigny, a seeming end to the war. England would get to keep an expanded territory of Aquitaine free and clear, headed by Edward the Black Prince. There were to be no more complications with lord and vassal relationships with France. In return, the King of England was to renounce his claims to the throne. This period of the war was called the Edwardian Phase. But nine years later, in 1369, France had a new king, Charles V, or Charles the Wise. In just a few years, he worked to retake the territory taken by the English. The French armies dominated this period of the war, which is named after the French king, and lasted until 1389. Charles VI, new king of France, and Richard II, who took over from his grandfather Edward, signed a truce that would last for over 25 years. While England went through Henry IV, and crowned Henry V in 1413, Charles VI was still King of France, but had descended into madness, so became known as Charles the Mad. With cracks in the French nobility, and an ineffectual king, King Henry launched another invasion in 1415. As he was part of the House of Lancaster, a cadet branch of the Plantagenets, this third phase was known as the Lancastrian Phase. His first true test came at Agincourt, where he and his small band of brothers almost perished under the assault of the heavily armoured French knights. But the English longbowmen saved the day, along with an assist from the weather and muddy conditions. Henry was able to return to England, and by 1420, he had returned to capture Normandy and Paris, and was on his way to conquer France itself. His marriage to Charles VI's daughter, Catherine of Valois, cemented an heir that would unify the thrones of England and France. They had one child, Henry VI, but the entire war was about to be turned on its head. Just two years later, in 1422, Henry died of dysentery, a mere two months before Charles the Mad had died, and his son, Henry VI was still an infant, so could not yet rule. His reign was then disputed, and the title fell to Charles VI's only surviving son, Charles the Dauphin, who still controlled southern France. His actual coronation was only possible because of a very special young lady, who claimed to experience divine voices and divine visions, all in service of a divine mission. Beginning a year prior, the Siege of Orléans was France's last gasp, England was at the pinnacle of its power and after a siege of six months and two weeks, central France was to fall. But with the arrival of a French girl, called Joan the Maid, 
French spirit was revitalized, and in just nine days, the French broke the siege. This is generally regarded as a watershed moment in the war, as the French army slowly reconquered the territories taken by the English, crushing them at Pate in 1429, and Formigny in 1450. In 1453, the Battle of Castillon marked the final battle in the One Hundred Years' War, and the loss of all English territories in France, except for Calais. The Maid of Orléans, or Joan of Arc, didn't see the French victory, as she was captured by the Burgundians, allies of the English, and was burned at the stake in 1431, accused of witchcraft and heresy. The verdict has since been nullified, and she remains a saint in the Roman Catholic Church. Charles became known as Charles the Victorious, and would rule France until 1461. His promotion of gunpowder weapons proved decisive in the French victories over the English. Once gunpowder came in from the east, it marked a new age in Europe, as castles were now vulnerable to cannons, and the armor of knights became less protective, and more of a hindrance. The image of the brave knight would begin to decline around this time, as lords and rulers began hiring their own more reliable professional armies, instead of vassal knights. This marked a shift away from the feudal system, that would only continue into the next age. The church, which reached its zenith in the High Middle Ages, began to decline as the period ended. The centralized kingdom of France was more able to challenge papal supremacy. In the early 1300s, King Philip IV flexed his muscle, warring in Aquitaine and Flanders, expelling the Jews, and destroying the Order of the Knights Templar, having members burned at the stake. His most famous struggle though, was with the Pope Boniface VIII. To cement his monarchal powers, Philip had imposed a tax on clergy members, but Boniface insisted that monarchs had no jurisdiction to tax clergy members without papal approval. So Philip did the only thing he could. He kidnapped the Pope. The Pope was kept in France and beaten badly for days. When he was eventually released, his condition worsened, and soon after, he was dead. Philip then orchestrated another papal election, and a Frenchman, Clement V, became the new Pope. Claiming unrest in Rome, Clement moved the papacy to Avignon, in France, and took up residence there. This caused resentment in the Western Church, as popes had always been linked to Rome, through the papacy of Peter. It led to much criticism and a devaluing of the Church. After numerous popes came and went, it was Pope Gregory XI, the seventh and last Avignon Pope, who returned the papacy to Rome in 1377, after 70 years of papal courts in France. But this wasn't the end of the blow to papal prestige. Gregory died the spring after his return, in 1378, and it was time for the election of a new pope. As the majority of cardinals were French, the people of Rome were concerned they would simply vote for another Frenchman who might take the papacy back to Avignon. They wanted a Roman, or at least an Italian. With a lot of coaxing and a lot of threats, the cardinals chose the Archbishop of Bari, a native Italian from the Kingdom of Naples to be Pope Urban VI. But just a few months later, the French cardinals claimed the election was illegitimate, and chose another man from France, Clement VII, to be the real Pope. He moved to Avignon soon after, and suddenly, the Catholic Church had two popes, one in Rome and one at Avignon. This became known as the Western Schism, similar to the Great Schism that tore Catholic and Orthodox Christianity apart. The schism thoroughly divided Europe, as France and its allies remained loyal and recognized the Avignon popes, and England and its allies recognized the Roman popes. This led to a reform movement known as conciliarism, which held that it was not the pope that was supreme, but the whole ecumenical council. At the Council of Constance from 1414 to 1418, in Germany, this was put into practice, and the popes were made to resign or were deposed. The council then elected a new pope in 1417, Martin V, and established that the council, not the pope, had supreme authority over certain matters. This would be the last papal election outside of Italy. This ended the Western Schism, 
but the conciliar movement failed long-term, and popes began to reassert dominance. But the damage was done, and the morality and prestige of the church suffered dearly. Crisis after crisis had struck Europe during the late Middle Ages, but from the ashes, there was a rebirth. In Italy, during the mid-1300s, people sought out new meaning, apart from the church, and found it in the older works of classical Greece and Rome. This rebirth came to be called, the Renaissance. The Italian city-states became more urbanized and more secular. During the recovery period following the instability, Italians became wealthy once again, and chose to spend their wealth on more material or individualistic pursuits. This could be seen with the rise of Renaissance humanism, an intellectual movement focused on the nature and importance of humanity, emerging from the study of the ancient classics. Scholars attended university to study the liberal arts, many of which came to be known as the humanities. Petrarch, a poet and Renaissance scholar, is credited for initiating this humanist movement. He gathered Latin manuscripts from all over, and emphasized their teaching in classical Latin. These humanists were still Christian, but saw themselves as purifying and renewing the faith. During the 1400s, humanists would become more involved with politics and civil affairs. They came to hold prominent positions in the courts and as advisors. Leonardo Bruni is regarded as the most influential humanist historian of the early Renaissance, and was the first recorded historian to divide history into the three segments of ancient, Middle Ages, and modern. He also became one of the first Italian humanists to pursue the study of classical Greece and translated the Greek works of Aristotle. He also wrote the biographies of prominent figures like Petrarch and Dante. Dante Alighieri lived earlier during the Middle Ages and is regarded as one of the most influential Italian writers, and perhaps one of the foremost in the world. His divine comedy and his depictions of heaven, purgatory, and hell have had profound influence on Western literature and Western art. Boccaccio was another proto-Renaissance writer and friend of Petrarch. His most famous works were The Decameron, a collection of short stories, and Concerning Famous Women, biographies of both legendary and historical women, like the goddess Minerva and Cleopatra. Together, Dante, Petrarch, and Boccaccio are regarded as the three crowns, literary masters who laid the foundation of the humanist movement in Florence, and influenced the development of a standardized Italian language. Women of higher rank also partook in the intellectual humanist movement. Isotta Nogarola, one of the first major female humanists, would inspire generations of writers and poets. Laura Serretta wrote about her personal experiences as a critique against misogyny and is considered one of the first protofeminist writers. Closely linked with Renaissance humanist philosophy was Renaissance art. It was based on the art of classical antiquity, but mixed in more current scientific ideas. Human beings were to be the center of focus in this art style, reflecting the more humanist ideals. The founding of the Medici Bank brought untold wealth to Florence, so it became a hotbed for artistic minds. The frescoes of Masaccio, a painter so named for his disheveled appearance, are regarded as some of the first and finest pieces of art from the early Renaissance. New measures for perspective were added, and paintings became more natural and realistic, a style which is aptly called naturalism or realism. Masaccio also brought about a new sense of expression and emotion to art, which can be seen on this fresco of Adam and Eve whose faces convey the extreme grief and shame of being expelled from the Garden of Eden. Onlookers could stare at a painting and feel a sense of depth, like their worlds were intertwined. Filippo Brunelleschi, a Florentine architect and designer, and good friend of Masaccio, was thought to have developed this sense of linear perspective after visits to see the storied ruins in Rome. He became skilled at engineering and is considered a founding father of Renaissance architecture. His most famous work was the building of the dome on the Florence Cathedral. Inspired by what he saw in Rome, he also designed the Church of San Lorenzo in a more classical style, 
with classical columns and more rounded arches, a departure from the Gothic art styles which had come to dominate. One of Masaccio and Brunelleschi's friends, who might have accompanied them to Rome during visits, was a young sculptor named Donato di Nicolo, but he is better known to us as Donatello. He used his knowledge of classical scripture in his art, creating two marvelous sculptures of David, one made of marble for a religious setting, and the other made of bronze, displaying David in the nude. This was the first freestanding piece of nude male sculpture since antiquity. These artists paved the way for what was to come. By around 1500, a short but exceptional period of art began. Artists had learned and built upon their predecessors, leading to the part of the period that is more familiar to most, the High Renaissance. This was dominated by three artistic masters. Regarded as the pinnacle of humanist ideals in Italy, was Leonardo da Vinci, who built the foundations of the High Renaissance. He was a polymath, and excelled not just at painting, but as an engineer, scientist, sculptor, and architect. Da Vinci built on the naturalism and realism of the early Renaissance, to instead portray humans in their ideal forms. To do this, he dissected and studied human cadavers. In his journals, there are also notes and depictions of human emotions, babies in the womb, animals, rock formations, war machines, and even flying machines. Much of his work has been lost, but he is mainly remembered for his paintings. Though the Mona Lisa and Last Supper are the most popular, it was his Silvato Mundi that became the highest selling painting of all time in 2017, selling for 450 million American dollars. One of his younger contemporaries and major rival was the Italian sculptor and painter Michelangelo. He is most well known for his two famous sculptures, Pietà and his version of David, both created before he was 30 years old. He was also responsible for two of the most influential frescoes in Western art. The first, painted from 1508 to 1512, was on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. The fresco depicted nine scenes from the book of Genesis in the Bible, the central piece being the creation of Adam. The muscular figures portray the ideal human form, and is meant to also reflect their inner beauty. His other famous fresco was The Last Judgment, which was just below the ceiling painting, on the altar wall. It portrays the final judgment and return of Christ, with some of the dead rising to the heavens, while others are not quite as lucky. One of Michelangelo's rivals was the young Raphael, who became a prodigy most well known for his Raphael rooms, rooms featuring frescoes that rivaled Michelangelo's best works. One of these rooms, the Room of the Signatura, featured perhaps his most famous work, the School of Athens. The painting displays the harmony between Christian teachings and Greek philosophy, and is the epitome of the classical spirit of the Renaissance. The period of the Renaissance also saw a shift in politics as the modern age approached. With the adoption of portable firearms and private armies, kings and queens were able to create stronger centralized governments and unify their nations, allowing for expansion and discovery. Historians have called these, new monarchs. The Kingdom of France was left reeling after the devastation of the Hundred Years' War, but national pride was never higher. This made it easy for monarchs to garner more power. Charles VII had spent his reign settling civil disputes and expelling the English armies, setting up France to become the foremost power on the continent. King Louis XI, son of Charles VII, was known for his political machinations and devious conspiracies. Once you entered his web, it wasn't long before you were devoured. It was no wonder his nickname was L'Universel Lorraine, Middle French for the Universal Spider. As national pride was high, he reformed the tax system and imposed permanent land and property taxes that gave him a continuous stream of revenue. England, just off their defeat against France, had problems at home for another 30 years, as the cost of the war put a strain on the English economy. Henry V's son, Henry VI, Next in the Lancastrian line, the boy who was almost king of a united England and France, 
proved to be an ineffectual and weak leader, even at home. Challenging the throne, aristocratic factions rose up under the House of York, who like the Lancasters, were a cadet branch of the Plantagenets. Henry was deposed twice, dying under unclear circumstances in 1471, and replaced with Edward IV, who ruled England unopposed for another 12 years before his death in 1483. A seeming victory for the Yorkists. But the war was not yet finished. The heir to the throne was Edward's 12-year-old son, Edward V, but he wouldn't even see coronation. Both he and his nine-year-old younger brother, Richard, Duke of York, mysteriously vanished after lodging at the Tower of London. It is widely accepted that their uncle Richard had them murdered, but there is no concrete evidence. It could have been someone from a rival house, or they could have simply escaped and ran away. Though their uncle Richard, then took the crown as Richard III, the story of the princes in the tower, still remains a mystery. The cloud of fog surrounding Richard's assumption of the throne didn't sit well with many Yorkists, and there was a significant uprising, with many Yorkists rebelling and siding with the Lancasters. Though this was put down, the tides of war shifted. In 1485, the Wars of the Roses finally ended at the Battle of Bosworth, when Henry Tudor, from the Welsh House of Tudor, and the House of Lancaster, with a coalition of English, Welsh, Scottish, and French troops, defeated the Yorkists, and Richard III perished on the battlefield. As both the houses of Lancaster and York now had no legitimate male heirs, both houses became extinct, and the House of Plantagenet, monarchs of England, dating back 300 years earlier to the reign of Henry II and the Angevin kings, finally came to an end. Henry Tudor became King Henry VII and married Elizabeth of the House of York, putting an end to the Civil War and beginning the Tudor period of England's history. Christian Spain was divided into a series of small kingdoms in the north, slowly fighting to regain the Iberian Peninsula from the Muslim armies during the Reconquista. Two of the most powerful of these Christian kingdoms were Castile and Aragon. The marriage of Isabella of Castile and Ferdinand of Aragon in 1469 was the first step in the unification of Spain and in just a few decades, the reconquest was complete and Spain was on the way to creating one of the largest empires the world had ever seen. Further east, the Duchy of Moscow would continue to grow. Under Grand Prince Ivan III, Moscow was extended through conquest as he seized the lands which would one day become a large empire. Ivan was married to Sophia, a Byzantine princess, of the Imperial Paleologos family. As Constantinople was regarded as New Rome, Ivan fashioned Moscow after it, referring to his city as the Third Rome. He adopted the Byzantine double eagle as his kingdom's coat of arms, and in 1480, expelled the remnants of the Golden Horde at the Battle of the Ugre, or Great Stand at the Ugre River, gaining independence and marking the dawn of a new era for what would become, the Russian state. Italy, wouldn't become united until later, but was dominated by five different powers by the end of the medieval period. In the north, Venice remained an independent republic ruled by an elected doge, and dominated the sea lanes. Nearby, the Duchy of Milan, was still officially part of the Holy Roman Empire but became centralized through a series of strong dukes from the Visconti and Sforza families. The Republic of Florence came about when the Florentines formed an independent commune. The Medici family gained governance of the city in 1434 and continued as grand dukes once it was turned into a monarchy by the Pope in 1569. In central and southern Italy remained the Papal States and the Kingdom of Naples. Though they were all strong in their own right, they still held a delicate balance of power between them. But individually, they were no match for the other Western centralized powers, and Italy became the battleground for the Italian wars, which saw France embroiled in conflict with Spain, the Holy Roman Empire, an alliance of Italian states. Once the Italian wars finally ended, France lay defeated, and Spain regained their rule over southern Italy as well as the Duchy of Milan, and cemented themselves as a new dominant power in Europe. 
During the Italian Wars, an influential Italian author and diplomat wrote a political treatise that was so influential that he is considered the father of modern political philosophy and political science. His name was Niccolò Machiavelli, and his greatest work was Il Principe, or The Prince. It dealt with the means of acquiring, maintaining, and expanding political power. It was in stark contrast to the chivalrous and princely ideals of the Middle Ages, and claimed a ruler has the right to lie, deceive, and use violence whenever necessary. That the ends justified the means, and morality was just an obstacle. It was controversial, as some saw it as simply a realistic view of what politics had always been, but others saw it as a guide for new tyrants to learn from. Machiavelli was the first Western thinker to justify this abandonment of morality. In Central Europe, the House of Habsburg, founded during the 11th century, would later come to prominence as Archdukes of Austria, Kings of Germany, and Emperors of the Holy Roman Empire although this title meant very little by this point. Once Spanish monarchs Isabella and Ferdinand died, the Habsburg son of the Holy Roman Emperor was sent to marry their daughter. Their son together, Charles, would establish the beginnings of Habsburg Spain, and it quickly reached its apex under his rule. He not only became Holy Roman Emperor, with holdings in northern Italy, Austria, and the Burgundian Low Countries, but also the vast territories of the Spanish Empire, which consisted of Iberia and southern Italy. During the Italian Wars, his European control gave him access to a large body of forces from all over the continent, including German Landsknecht, Spanish Tercios, Burgundian Knights, and Italian Condottieri. By this time, Charles' empire also consisted of lands abroad, in what would be called the New World. The age of discovery awaits, but that's a story we'll get to in our next mega documentary, so be sure to subscribe. Our final stop on our journey through the medieval world is an empire which had endured since antiquity. The Eastern Roman Empire began as the Eastern Division of the Ancient Roman Empire. When Rome fell in the mid-400s, the Eastern Empire, centered on Constantinople, continued on for another thousand years, with numerous periods of prosperity. The inhabitants of the empire itself, though they still considered themselves Roman, thought Constantinople to be the capital of the world and the holiest city of the Christian kingdoms. During the early 500s, the empire would reach new heights under the Justinian dynasty. It was founded in 518 by Justin I, but it was the next emperor, his nephew Justinian, that had visions of past grandeur. His dream was a Renoatio Imperii Romanorum, a project to restore the Roman Empire. Under Justinian's general, Belisarius, one of the all-time greatest, an invasion was launched west. The first targets were the Vandals. After the Germanic band sacking of Rome, they continued their migrations and settled in North Africa forming a kingdom. Though they outnumbered the Eastern Roman armies, they became complacent and didn't take advantage of a decisive opportunity, which instead let Belisarius choose the time and place of attack and the Vandals were routed. By 534, the Vandal Kingdom fell to the Eastern Romans and the first phase of the project was complete. After being recalled home, Belisarius then sailed to Sicily and the Italian peninsula in 535, which at this time was occupied by the Ostrogothic Kingdom, which we mentioned last episode. This was the start of the Gothic War, which would last almost two decades. The Ostrogoths were in the midst of internal political rifts, so Belisarius faced little resistance on his march towards Rome. He was invited in by the Pope, but when the Ostrogothic king, Vitiges, heard this, he sent perhaps one of the largest armies ever assembled to besiege Rome. It lasted for over a year, but to no avail. His failure in the siege reflected his own failures as king. Belisarius had fortified too well, and the siege was broken. In the end, after many sieges and more bloodshed than Italy could bear, Belisarius marched into the Ostrogoth capital of Ravenna, and deposed Vitiges. 
but the Ostrogoths proved more resilient than expected. Their new king, Totila, forced a counterattack and managed to reconquer most of the Italian peninsula by 552. So Justinian sent in his other great general, an Armenian named Narses, to advance into Italy from the north, with a coalition of troops, including the Lombards. Totila was killed soon after in battle, and by 554, the Ostrogothic kingdom was no more, and the Gothic War had ended. Rome was fittingly back in the empire. Before long, they conquered southern Spain from the Visigoths, and the empire would start to look as it did under the ancient Romans, a true Mediterranean power. Justinian is also credited with a profound influence on Western culture, from his codification of Roman law. The Eastern Empire had access to many legal and political documents from earlier centuries, which Justinian became very familiar with. He hired a jurist, Tribonian, to collect and compile these into a set of edicts, called the Corpus Juris Civilis, or Body of Civil Law. The Corpus Juris Civilis consists of four main parts. The Codex Justinianus, or Code of Justinian, was the first part, published in 529. It contained imperial enactments and laws from the time of ancient Rome to Justinian's reign. The Digest, also called the Pandex, was completed in 533. It was a compilation of jurists' writings and opinions on Roman law. The Institutiones, or Institutes, were also published in 533, provided an introductory textbook on Roman law for students, and was used for centuries after Justinian's death. The Noel Lare Constitutiones, or Novels, were a collection of new laws enacted by Justinian after the publication of the first three parts of the Corpus Juris Civilis. They were later added to the collection after his death to complete the compilation. The corpus played a significant role in preserving and transmitting Roman legal principles and concepts, and it became the foundation of civil law systems in continental Europe. It was the last official work from the Eastern Empire produced in Latin, as Greek soon became favored once again. Though his reign is considered to be one of the Eastern Empire's golden ages, this isn't to say Justinian didn't face any hardships. His first was of a personal nature. Before he was emperor, he became smitten by a young lady named Theodora. She was the daughter of the keeper of bears for the games at Constantinople. When her father died, Theodora followed in her mother's footsteps and became an actress a profession that was associated with prostitution. It wasn't until Emperor Justin changed the laws that his nephew Justinian was able to marry Theodora. When Justinian became emperor in 527, Theodora became his empress, helping to establish churches and monasteries, including a convent for former prostitutes. Soon after, in 532, Justinian and Theodora had to deal with the Nika riots. Nika was the cry that could be heard from the Hippodrome during chariot races, as rival factions urged their teams to victory. This was a titanic amphitheater, capable of holding more than 60,000 spectators. The two main charioteer factions were the Blues and the Greens, and like modern-day sports rivalries, could often get out of hand and even become political. When a member of the Blues and a member of the Greens were arrested for murder and sentenced to execution, both escaped and fled to a church. At the chariot games, with Justinian in attendance, the supporters of the two fugitives banded together, demanding their exoneration, directing their angry and vitriolic chants at the emperor. The crowd soon grew overwhelming, and the games were cancelled. Mobs of people vomited out of the Hippodrome and went on a mad campaign of destruction for the next five days. The royal palace was besieged and the city was in flames. The Hagia Sophia, the city's most prominent church was burned. The mobs chose for themselves a new emperor, and Justinian was ready to flee the capital, but Theodora convinced her husband to stay and fight, and that if they were to meet death, it was a better sentence than living as a fugitive. One of Justinian's loyal generals, Narses, bribed some of the mob and stoked the internal divisions between the Greens and Blues, while Belisarius fled the city to amass the troops needed to crush the revolt. 
After the devastating riots, Justinian rebuilt the city bigger and better than ever, and it remained the largest city in Europe during the medieval period. He built roads, bridges, public baths, schools, monasteries, hospitals, and especially churches. In the capital alone, he built a stunning 34 of these, one of which was a rebuilt version of that which burned during the Nika revolts. This was the Church of the Holy Wisdom, or Hagia Sophia. Justinian commissioned two Greek scientists, Anthemius of Tralles and Isidore of Miletus to design it, and five years later, the project was complete. This Hagia Sophia was much larger than the previous, and instead of the traditional flat-roofed feature on basilicas, this was capped by a large dome filled with mosaics. It would remain the largest piece of Christian architecture for almost 1,000 years. Along with the Royal Palace and Hippodrome, the Hagia Sophia became one of the most magnificent buildings in the city. But Justinian's next hardship came in 542. He was struck down by plague, the same bacterium responsible for the devastating Black Death which would hit Eurasia in the late Middle Ages. Justinian survived his fight with the disease, but this sickness, later called the Plague of Justinian, killed around one in five people in Constantinople. It was first reported in Roman Egypt a year prior, and ended up spreading throughout the Mediterranean Basin and Arabian Peninsula. Though Justinian recovered, the disease had devastating effects on the social and economic systems of the Eastern Empire. The plague, along with the expansion campaigns, left the empire weak, vulnerable, and with dwindling coffers. Theodora died in 548, but Justinian survived her for almost another two decades. Belisarius died in 565, and Justinian just eight months later. It was to be the end of an era. The declining state of the empire couldn't be saved by Justinian's ineffectual successors. Soon after his death, the Lombards, another Germanic group, entered Italy, setting up their own kingdom under Alboin. The Eastern Romans weren't expelled, but kept territory called the Exarchate of Ravenna, which would bring them into constant conflict with the new arrivals. The Visigoths, the Germanic people to the west, recovered Spain by the early 600s. Justinian's vision of a renewed Roman Empire seemingly died with him. It was a turning point, and soon it was the Eastern Romans, who would face external threats, with Sassanid Persia in the east, the Avars along the Danube, and Slavic invasions. The Justinian dynasty continued under three more emperors, before a successful army revolt in 602, which saw the last Justinian emperor, Maurice, murdered along with his sons. The leader of the revolt was Phocas, an officer in the military, who was then proclaimed emperor. He ruled with little success and destabilized the empire even further. He was deemed a usurper, and in 610, was overthrown and executed by Heraclius, son of the Exarch of Africa. This established the Heraclian dynasty, which would rule the empire for over 100 years. During the reign of Heraclius, the empire was under constant threat from the Persians to the east, and the Slavs to the north. By the mid-600s, they had to implement a new system of defense, called the Theme System. This replaced the earlier provincial system set up by Diocletian and Constantine, and was meant to combine both civilian and military offices. Continuing a legacy dating back to the Greeks and Persians, the ancient Romans and Parthians would engage in constant warfare since the days of the Republic. This continued under the Roman Empire, with the Parthian successors, the Sassanids, who grew to be the most powerful of the Iranian empires. Though the Western Empire went into decline, the Eastern Romans and Sassanids continued their stalemate for another two centuries. They were the two most powerful military entities in Eurasia by that point. Though Heraclius was initially successful in recapturing Eastern territories from the Sassanids, it just exhausted both empires' resources. This paved the way for another contender, one which would come to threaten the Eastern Empire even more than the Sassanids. This came from a coalition of newly unified societies from the Arabian Peninsula. For more information on the Arab expansion, you can check out this previous episode. 
Under the Rashidun and Umayyad caliphs, the Arabs launched a swift invasion into the Near East, defeating the Eastern Romans in 636 at the Battle of the Yarmouk, near the Yarmouk River. Though the Romans lost their grain-producing territories in Egypt and their rich tax revenues from the Levant, they were more fortunate than the Sassanid Empire, which collapsed to the Arab armies. In 674, they then moved on to besiege Constantinople itself. The capital of the empire was one of the most well-defended cities of the ancient world, and its impenetrable walls kept the city safe from siege since its founding. Knowing of the city's fabled fortifications, the Arabs instead set up a naval blockade and attacked seasonally until 678. Though their armies came prepared, they could not prepare for one of the empire's secret weapons. As the Arab ships approached, their wooden hulls would burst into flames. The Eastern Roman armies rained down liquid hell on their foes, and used tubes to throw underwater flames onto the enemy. This was a weapon called Greek fire, a compound most likely containing naphtha, quicklime or sulfur. They developed pressurized nozzles to shoot this fire like a flamethrower, and even used it to create incendiary grenades. It remained a closely guarded state secret, but did its job in breaking the siege. There was another siege in 717 to 718, but the results were the same. Again, with the use of Greek fire, the Eastern Romans fended off the attack, resulting in more permanent borders being drawn just south of Anatolia. It was a tough century for the empire, as they had lost their holdings in the Near East, as well as in North Africa. To the north, the Heraklians faced another invasion. This was from a group of Turkic seminomadic warriors called the Bulgars. We mentioned them in our double-length overview of the Middle Ages, so be sure to check it out. The Bulgars had arrived by the 500s, and in the late 600s, the Bulgars and South Slavs defeated the Eastern Roman armies, setting up the Bulgarian Empire in the Balkans. This created further losses for the Eastern Roman Empire, and by the early 700s, the days of Roman glory seemed over. Though the empire was much smaller by the end of the dynasty than the start, the theme system helped them retain their core in Greece and Anatolia, but the Eastern Empire went from a contender to restore the old Roman Empire, to barely holding on to its own survival. Some refer to this next period as the Dark Ages. After a transition that took centuries, the empire was left with a different and more unique culture which historians have called Byzantine or Byzantine. The term Byzantine was a more recent fabrication, derived from the original name for Constantinople, Byzantium, which was founded as a Greek colony by the legendary Byzers a thousand years earlier. Latin declined, and Greek became both the common and official language of the Byzantine Empire. As a deeply Christian empire, much of Byzantine art was steered towards religious endeavors, like the construction of churches, and the statues and mosaics that were to inhabit them. The mix of extreme piety and extreme reverence for their art, actually became a point of contention so stark, that it caused widespread political instability. Religious images and icons had become commonplace, but some viewed this as a form of idolatry, the worship of idols an act strictly forbidden in the church, and one of the most important rules for Christians to follow. By 695, a representation of Jesus was even placed on the backs of newly minted coins. Those who defended the religious images, claimed they were meant as a means of further visual understanding for those who were illiterate. After the Heraklians were deposed in a period of anarchy, the Isaurian dynasty took power in 717, under Leo III. During his reign, he attempted to purify the Christian faith from what he believed was an adoration and worship of icons, especially from Christian monks. In what has become known as the first Byzantine iconoclasm, Leo outlawed the use of icons, causing internal divisions with long-lasting consequences. There was widespread destruction of religious images, and those who were viewed as venerating any icons were persecuted. While the poor, and those living in Anatolia closer to the Arab border, weren't primarily affected, the wealthier citizens of Constantinople, and those living in the Byzantine provinces in southern Italy strongly opposed it. 
The popes in Rome also strongly condemned the move, creating more of a rift between the East and West that would culminate in the 11th century. Though the edict was reversed 70 years later in 787, the iconoclasm controversy fueled future political divisions and instability within the empire. Under the Isaurian dynasty, the Byzantines lost the Exarchate of Ravenna to the Lombards, and then the Franks, who gave the land to the papacy, to form the papal states. The Byzantines reorganized their provinces that remained in the south of the peninsula and on Sicily, but these would be fought over by the Lombards and Arabs. From the 500s to 700s, during the reigns of the Justinian to the Isaurian emperors, the Byzantines viewed themselves as legitimate inheritors of the Christian Roman tradition. Emperors were deemed divinely chosen to rule, and subjects were to show them utmost reverence. The emperor was responsible for daily rituals, which are described in the Book of Ceremonies, outlining the imperial ceremonial protocol at the Byzantine court. Each morning, the royal palace was opened with a processional march. Special ceremonies were also added for promotions, birthdays, and marriages. Unlike the kingdoms in the West, the Byzantine Empire stayed relatively centralized, with the power of the emperor absolute. The nobles and aristocrats were part of the clergy or civil servants, all closely linked to the emperor. The emperor and his government maintained the economy, by regulating agricultural and manufacturing industries, and controlling commerce with a monopoly on the grain and silk trades. This hands-on approach began during the ancient period, as foreign threats brought more need for centralization. This also meant the Byzantines were quite familiar with war and the military. Though a defensive culture first and foremost, they kept their armies armed with the latest weaponry in one hand, and the latest military literature in the other, emphasizing the art of diplomacy. Some of their methods became quite cunning and overly complex, giving us the modern term of Byzantine. But though their stealthy and devious methods led to victories outside the empire, these same palace politics threatened it from within. Despite Western Europe inheriting much of the old Roman Empire and kept many of their institutions, it was the Byzantines who truly held the essence of the imperial state. Not only did they act as a buffer state to the encroaching Islamic armies to the east, but Justinian's codification of the Roman law eventually became widely studied in Western Europe, and became the basis for numerous European legal systems. As the empire included Greek lands, many ancient Greek classical works were also preserved and studied. Most of their literature was focused on legal or military affairs, but as the Byzantines were devoutly religious, they wrote plenty of religious essays and biographies of saints. Procopius was the court historian during the reign of Justinian in the 500s, and accompanied Belisarius during his campaigns abroad. His History of the Wars is our main source for the Byzantine wars with the Persians in the east, and reconquest of the Mediterranean in the west, both the Vandalic War against the Vandals in North Africa, and the Gothic War, with the Ostrogoths in Italy. He modeled his works after Thucydides, the famous ancient Greek historian who is our main source for the Peloponnesian War. Both works even mention calamitous plagues which devastated their cities. Procopius, dealing with the Justinian plague, and Thucydides with the plague of Athens, which hit a cramped Athens a thousand years prior. It's a story you can find in our last mega-documentary. Apart from fostering an intellectual and legal culture, and as a military buffer zone, the Byzantines acted as gateway to the east for Western Europe, as they were the center of trade between the two continents. Though Italy and the Low Countries became trading hubs, products from the east first passed through Constantinople, before sailing across the Mediterranean with the Italian merchants. Traders came to the capital from Egypt, Babylon, the Ruslands, Persia, Italy, and more, making it a wealthy trading hub. Europeans continued their obsession with eastern silks, spices, and jewelry. The Byzantines also had a market that dealt in the buying and selling of humans. These prisoners were often from Slavic communities, giving us the word which has become slave. Though China had had the monopoly on the silk trade, two Christian monks, with the aid of Emperor Justinian, 
smuggled silkworms from Asia, and brought them to the West. This ended China's dominance in the silk market, and the Byzantine Empire began to produce it at workshops in the royal palace itself, and grew fabulously wealthy trading it with the rest of Europe. After the iconoclasm controversy, during the 700s, the Byzantines endured under the Isaurians during a time of decline. Most distressing was the appointment of Charlemagne in year 800, as Emperor of the Romans, and the founding of the Carolingian Empire, the seeming successor to the imperial title of ancient Rome. This didn't sit well with the Byzantines, who viewed themselves as inheritors of the Roman tradition, and still viewed the Germanic societies in the West as utterly barbaric. Iconoclasm returned in 813, and it brought with it further division with the West, and the expansion of systems resembling feudalism, threatening the centralized state. But Empress Theodora, regent of Michael III, of the subsequent Amorian dynasty, finally banned iconoclasm for good in 843. Soon after though, another schism polarized the East and West. This was called the Photian Schism, occurring during the mid-800s. It revolved around the controversial appointment of Photios, as the Patriarch of Constantinople, bypassing the regular ecclesiastical hierarchy. He had no clerical background, and was more suited to be a scholar or statesman, than part of the clergy, let alone the highest church position in the empire. The schism involved religious disputes, jurisdictional conflicts, and political power struggles. It was eventually resolved in 879 with the Fourth Council of Constantinople, which affirmed Photios as the legitimate patriarch and reconciled relations between the Pope in Rome and Patriarch of Constantinople. It was Photios who commissioned brothers Cyril and Methodius to the Slavs in Moravia, and is a central figure in the conversion missions to both the Slavs and Bulgars. Contemporary historians viewed Emperor Michael as the last in a long line of incompetent leaders, and he was even known as Michael the Drunkard. Despite this, his reign brought in a new era of intellectualism, and contributed to a period of high culture during the next dynasty. Keeping in line with his uninformed nature, Michael befriended a poor Macedonian peasant named Basil, who came to impress the emperor with his wrestling abilities. Now in the inner circle, Basil married the emperor's mistress, and began sowing division within the court, murdering Bardas, Michael's uncle and de facto ruler. Soon after, Basil had Michael killed as well. Both his hands were chopped off before he was stabbed through the heart. Basil then took the throne in 867, and so began the Macedonian dynasty. After the slow decline that followed the Justinians, sometimes called the Byzantine Dark Ages, it was time for another golden era. It was time for a renaissance. Once the Macedonian dynasty took power, they stabilized their borders against invaders, and mended diplomatic affairs with the Western Church. Coming from humble beginnings, these emperors were more populist, strengthening the standing of free farmers who were losing land to wealthy aristocrats and oversaw a golden age for both culture and imperial power, called the Macedonian Renaissance. It was mostly exemplified through emperors Leo VI and Constantine VII, who left a mark on Byzantine history through their administrative reforms, literary contributions, and attempts to strengthen the empire internally and externally. The Macedonian Renaissance witnessed a revival of interest in classical Greek literature, philosophy, and science. Byzantine scholars and intellectuals focused on studying and preserving ancient Greek texts, leading to a rediscovery of ancient knowledge, well before Western Europe, and a renewed appreciation for classical works. The Macedonian emperors, particularly Basil I and his successors, supported and patronized the arts, sciences, and education. They established centers of learning, such as the renowned University of Constantinople, where scholars gathered to study and exchange ideas. Emperors and the wealthy elite sponsored the creation of manuscripts, the construction of magnificent churches and palaces, and the commissioning of artwork, promoting a vibrant cultural scene. The period saw remarkable achievements in Byzantine art and architecture. 
artists and architects developed innovative techniques, revitalizing classical motifs and incorporating new elements. Iconography flourished, and the Byzantine Church commissioned elaborate mosaics, frescoes, and iconography for churches and monasteries. Foreign dignitaries would be utterly stunned by the empire's throne room, which featured golden birds that sang from golden trees, and golden lions which thumped their tails and roared. The throne itself could rest on the ground one minute and rise into the air the next. It was also during this dynasty that the Byzantine church christenized the Eastern Slavs and the Kievan Rus, one of its most long-lasting accomplishments. During the 900s, the empire was flourishing once again. After its more cultured and scholarly phase, it was time for more offensive military campaigns. These began early in the century, and culminated with the most successful military emperor of them all. His name was Basil II. He conquered the old Bulgarian Empire, and annexed their land, creating the theme of Bulgaria. According to legend, out of 15,000 Bulgarian prisoners, he had 99 out of every 100 soldiers blinded, while the last one was allowed to keep a single eye, to allow them to lead their armies home. When Samuel, the emperor of the Bulgarians, saw what was left of his once unstoppable army, he reportedly had a heart attack, and died. With the help of previous emperors, Basil, commonly known as the Bulgar Slayer, controlled an empire from southern Italy in the west, to Armenia and Syria in the east, with full control of Cyprus and Crete in the Adriatic. The empire was in full revival, and by the time of Basil's death in 1025, it was as large as it had ever been since the times of Justinian. Although the empire under the Macedonians was still much smaller than under Justinian, culture was constantly being exported throughout its territories, making it more of an integrated Byzantine state than Justinian's overextended empire. Soon after Basil's death, the empire went into decline. As his successors didn't wield the same centralized control, aristocrats and military generals began forming alliances with wealthy landowners, at the expense of the peasant classes. This shift made the upper classes more powerful, but as the Byzantine armies relied on peasant soldiers, there were less recruits, and less manpower. To amend this, generals recruited mercenaries instead. One of their most famous mercenary units began as a group of Vikings and wielded the Danish battleaxe, by this point feared throughout Europe. 6,000 warriors were initially sent to battle by Vladimir, Prince of Kiev, in order to fend off a rebellion. These invaluable units became known as the Varangian Guard, or Men of the Pledge, and managed to secure a place as Basil's personal bodyguards, similar to the Praetorian Guard in ancient Rome. One Viking mercenary, Harald Sigurdsson, was exiled from Norway, and spent 15 years working for the Kievan Rus and eventually as a chief in the Varangian Guard. He later returned to Norway and became king in 1046, leading to his epithet of Harald the Hard Ruler, or Harald Hardrada, the same who fought the last Anglo-Saxon king for the throne of England in 1066. Harald's death at Stamford Bridge has been seen by some historians as the final breath of the tumultuous Viking Age. The growing rift between the Eastern and Western churches came to a head in 1054. The Patriarch of Constantinople refused the assertion that the papacy of Rome was the head of the entire Christian Church. Pope Leo IX and Patriarch Michael Cerulianus then excommunicated each other, creating a schism between the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches, a schism that had been brewing for centuries. Both are Chalcedonian forms of the faith and have the most adherents worldwide, but non-Chalcedonian denominations split earlier like the Oriental Orthodox Church, consisting of some of the most ancient denominations, like the Coptic, Armenian, and Ethiopian churches. Though there weren't many effects at the time, it seemingly marked an end to the Byzantine days of glory. Though Western Europe was also Christian, they grew to be as much of a threat as those to the East. In the East, highly organized Turkic migrations occurred. The most ambitious of these were nomadic armies from Central Asia, a group called the Seljuk Turks. 
They swept west, capturing Baghdad in 1055, and then moved into Anatolia, the domain of the Byzantine Empire. By this time, the Macedonian dynasty had ended, and the new Ducas dynasty was full of betrayal and palace intrigue. What happened next then, was no surprise. The new emperor, Romanos IV, led his armies out to stop the Seljuk encroachment in Anatolia, and met them, at what would be called the Battle of Manzikert. But this was less of a fight and more of a fiasco. Half of the Byzantine army deserted, and the emperor was defeated and taken prisoner. It marked only the second time in Roman history that the emperor was taken prisoner by a foreign army. The first was Emperor Valerian, who was captured by the Persians at the Battle of Edessa in 260. With this defeat, most of Anatolia was lost, and Turkic migrants settled there, forming their own state in 1077. The Bulgars and Serbs also made gains in the Balkans, and the Normans ended all Byzantine rule in Italy for good. It took decades for order to be restored in the court, as the new emperor, Alexius I, of the Komnenos dynasty, attempted to restore and revitalize his faltering state. He made reforms in the military, and turned the disorganized Byzantine army into a new force called the Komnenian army. To stabilize his borders, Alexios asked the Western powers for aid against the Turks. He was hoping for soldiers to help him fend off the Seljuks, but what he got instead was the Crusades, a campaign to take back the Holy Land. To reach the Levant, the heavily armed Crusaders would have to march through Byzantine territory. This terrified the Emperor, as the Crusaders might turn and attempt to depose him. So Alexios asked them for an oath of loyalty, and made them promise that any lands they conquered in the east would become territories of the Byzantine Empire. But after their successful campaign, they set up their own Crusader states, leaving the Byzantines with yet another nearby threat. Alexios is credited for beginning what is known as the Komnenian Restoration, the military, financial, and territorial recovery of the empire. Alexios stopped the Turks in the east, and had successful campaigns in the Balkans against the Bulgars and Serbs, while keeping invading Normans at bay. The 1100s saw more exchange with Western Europe. During the reign of Manuel, tens of thousands of foreign mercenaries, Venetians, and other Italian traders took up residence in Constantinople. But there was still a brewing resentment between the Western Europeans, who were perhaps jealous and resentful of the opulence of the city, while the Byzantines saw the Western Europeans as unsophisticated and ill-tempered. After the Venetians attacked the Genoese, their merchant rivals in the city, Manuel arrested and expelled the Venetians in 1171, seizing their ships and property, pitting Venice and the empire against one another. Despite this, with parts of Anatolia and most of the Balkans reconquered, the empire was once again the most powerful state in the Mediterranean. Once Manuel died, his estranged cousin marched on Constantinople, deposing the new infant emperor and his unpopular empress regent, and became Emperor Andronikos I. What followed was the massacre of tens of thousands of Latins living in the city, including Genoese and Pisan merchants from Italy. The few that survived either fled or were sold into slavery. Though the Komnenos dynasty showed favor to the aristocratic classes, Andronikos wished to exterminate it, leading to several revolts. One family, the Angelos, were involved in one of these failed uprisings. Isaac Angelos was to be arrested by the foremost noble in Andronico's court. But instead of arresting Isaac, he was killed by him. After taking refuge at the Hagia Sophia, Isaac appealed to the people and started even greater riots. When Andronico's came back to his city, he found the people had crowned Isaac as new emperor. Andronikos attempted to flee, but was captured. From there, he spent three days in the stuff of nightmares. He had his right hand cut off, one of his eyes gouged out, boiling water thrown on his face, and his teeth and hair forcibly removed. He was the last emperor from the male line of the Komnenoi dynasty. Though the Angelos were now in power under Isaac, things wouldn't look any better. 
Once Saladin died after the Third Crusade, Pope Innocent took advantage and set the Fourth Crusade into motion. To reach the Holy Land, the Venetians were to grant the Crusaders safe passage over the seas. The price of travel far exceeded what the Crusaders were willing to pay though, so the Venetian captains cut them a deal. They were to help them recapture the important port city of Zara, on the Adriatic coast, part of the Kingdom of Hungary. After the successful siege and sacking of the city, they spent the winter of 1202 there. Meanwhile, in Constantinople, Isaac and his son Alexios IV were deposed and placed in prison. But Alexios escaped and pleaded with the Crusaders for aid in regaining the crown. In exchange, they would receive silver and troops to aid them on their mission to the Holy Land. The deal was struck and the Crusaders sailed to Constantinople, restoring Isaac as emperor, with Alexius IV becoming his co-emperor. It was soon clear, however, that the Byzantines couldn't possibly pay the exorbitant amount promised to the Western armies. Relations deteriorated, and in 1204, they stormed the city, looting and stealing all the valuables that remained. Clergymen who accompanied the Crusaders took as many religious artifacts and relics as they could find. The empire could have ceased to exist at this point, as the Angelos dynasty was officially deposed. The Crusaders made it their own state, the Latin Empire, with Count Baldwin of Flanders as emperor. The Venetians benefited as well, as they acquired Crete, and secured for themselves the main trade route from Constantinople, to Italy and the rest of Europe. Sentiment in the West at the time, was that the Church was unified once again, two centuries after the Great Schism. But instead of thriving, the Latins only adopted the same problems the Byzantines had been dealing with. The Bulgarian attacks continued from the north, and fighting erupted internally. Furthermore, the empire was now surrounded by three Byzantine successor states, the Despotate of Epirus, the Empire of Trebizond, and the Empire of Nicaea. In 1259, Michael Paleologus, a Greek military leader, took power in Nicaea and marched on Constantinople. By 1261, he had reconquered the city from the Latins, and became the first emperor of the Paleologos dynasty. They would rule for two centuries, and be the last Byzantine dynasty. Though the empire was restored, it was a shell of its previous glory, and consisted of only a small portion of Anatolia and Greece. This would only continue to shrink. The loss of territory made them vulnerable from all sides. To the north, the Bulgarians had formed a second empire amid the turmoil at the end of the Komnenos dynasty in 1185, and the Venetians and remnants of the Latin Empire proved they couldn't be trusted. To the east were the Turks in Anatolia, who by this point had become vassals of the Mongols. Soon, numerous smaller principalities, or Beyliks, emerged. One of these, under Osman I, passively declared their independence by minting coins with their own king's face. The transliteration of Osman came to be known as Ottoman. Though they weren't the most powerful Beylik at the start, they spread quickly throughout the 1300s, taking both Turkic and Byzantine territory. Instead of countless attacks on Constantinople, they head into the Balkans, defeating the Bulgarians and move towards Serbia where they met them in 1389 at the Battle of Kosovo. Though the Serbians had far fewer numbers, it is said a Serbian knight, Miloš Obilić, killed Sultan Murad, stopping the advance. Both sides suffered heavily though, and the Ottomans were able to raise another army quickly, and annex Serbia. By the 1400s, the Byzantine Empire was little more than the city of Constantinople, and was surrounded on all sides by the Ottomans. In 1451, the Ottomans had a new sultan, not even 20 years old. His name was Mehmed II. Two years later, in 1453, Mehmed and his army of at least 80,000 approached the walls of Constantinople. The famous walls had been state-of-the-art fortifications for 1,000 years, first with the walls built by Constantine in the 300s, and then the double line of Theodosian walls built during the 400s. Inside the city, Emperor Constantine XI, of the Paleologos dynasty, 
cobbled together a force of just 10,000 soldiers, while 30,000 armed civilians awaited the enemy. The walls had been impregnable, but Mehmed had a secret weapon. A year earlier, in 1252, a Hungarian engineer with a mysterious past, named Orban, approached Emperor Constantine to sell him his services, but the emperor couldn't pay. Orban then approached the Turks, claiming he had a weapon that could blast the walls of Babylon itself. He was hired, and built Mehmed a gigantic cannon, called Basilic, or the Basilica. Its barrel was between 24 to 26 feet long, and it was capable of firing cannonballs of 1,200 pounds, well over 500 kilograms. Basilic was so heavy, it needed to be pulled to the battle by 60 oxen and over 400 men. The only drawback was that it could only be used a few times per day because of reload and cooling times. Mehmed had other smaller cannons and bombards, but Basilic was one of a kind. In early April, the terrifying first shot was fired. With many times more men, and a fleet surrounding the city to the north, all that stood between the Ottomans and victory, were the great walls of Constantinople. Fifty-three days later, the walls were finally breached, and the Ottoman army charged for a final assault and swarmed the city. The brave Emperor Constantine was said to have immediately charged at the incoming army, and was the first to perish. The rest of the city soon fell, and there was a period of looting and other atrocities, where churches were burned and families separated. Many Byzantine soldiers were killed and thousands of inhabitants sold into slavery. Mehmed then marched into the city, rode to the Hagia Sophia, and ordered it to be converted into a mosque. This was to be the new capital of the Ottoman Empire. And the Byzantines, the Eastern Roman Empire, successors to the empire founded 1,500 years earlier, collapsed. Orban's fate remains a mystery, but it's believed the engineer was killed during the siege, when one of his own cannons exploded. Since the fall of the Western Empire, Constantinople had been besieged over 20 times, and was only penetrated twice. Once was by the Crusaders in 1204. The other was May 29, 1453. The remaining smaller Greek states were conquered by the early 1460s, and the Roman Empire's political era was finally laid to rest. Its legacy would continue to live on though, through other civilizations. For many, this is a story of great joy, for others, great sadness. For everyone, it remains history. The medieval age had finally come to an end, and it was gunpowder that killed it. But it did make the next age a lot more interesting.